makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, camels are the favorite cigarette of people in all walks of life. Among them are singing stars, actors, announcers, people whose voices are their fortunes, people whose cigarette must be mild. Make the camel 30-day test and see how mild a cigarette can be. Puff after puff, pack after pack. See why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we make homicide pay for a hundred a day. Oh, that's pretty terrible. Oh, you should catch me on a bad day. Nothing. Am I going to see you tonight? Not if you keep turning out the lights. Who turns out the lights? Oh, well, what difference does it make? It's fun. I'll expect you at eight and you'll be here. Honey, honey, of course. How's business? Oh, about as dull as 50 miles of dirt road. We'll have dinner home. Bless your little pointed head. And your empty pocketbook. Uh-oh. What? Mr. Diamond? Uh, yes, sir. Come right in, will you? Uh, pull up an old bank book and have a seat. Thank you, Client? Well, keep a good thought, honey. You may be gorging yourself at 21. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> I'd uh, like to hire you, Mr. Diamond. Well, I'd love every minute of it. I charge 100 a day in expenses. All right. He reached for his wallet. While he was counting his money, I was looking at him. This was the biggest man I'd ever seen. I was getting a nosebleed just trying to see over the second button on his vest. He had a pair of shoulders that looked like the mayor should lay a cornerstone for them. And the muscles under his coat stood out like smuggled shot puts. My name is Collins. I'm B.E. Rollins, private secretary. Oh, is that the B.E. Rollins? Yes, he's a very wealthy man. Well, there's an understatement. He wants to retain you to find his brother, Martin. He does, huh? Would you mind coming with me? Mr. Rollins would like to see you in person. Well, tell me a little more about Rollins' brother. I'd rather let Mr. Rollins do that himself. I'd rather hear some of it from you first. I don't want to see Rollins if I'm going to turn down the job. Very well. Mr. Rollins' brother Martin was released from prison five days ago. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, he sent a letter threatening Mr. Rollins' life. Oh, and your boss wants me to find his brother before he makes good the threat. Is that it? That's it, exactly. Well, why doesn't he call the police? Show them the letter and get the protection he needs. It'll certainly be a lot cheaper than hiring me. Mr. Rollins doesn't want any more bad publicity. There was enough of it when Martin was sent to prison. And why did Martin get sent to prison? He embezzled $100,000 from the company funds. Did Rollins try to save him? He was guilty. Mr. Rollins prosecuted him to the full extent of the law. Was the money ever recovered? No. Goodbye, Mr. Collins. You won't take the job? Oh, now you've guessed. But why? Mr. Rollins is prepared to pay you handsomely. Well, I don't doubt it at all, but it's too pat. Martin's killing mad because his brother sent him to prison. Rollins receives a threatening letter, but won't call in the police. Yet he wants Martin found. Why? I told you. He doesn't want any more bad publicity. So I take the job and maybe find Martin. Then B.E. Rollins is a potential killer in the house. What you going to do? Try and keep his mind off of things by letting him shrink heads in the basement? Remember, Mr. Diamond, they are still brothers. So were Cain and Abel. You mean you think Mr. Rollins intends to kill his brother and that's why he wants you to find him? Well, that's a little crude, but it's certainly a possibility. That's utterly absurd. Uh, maybe so, but no one would blame him. You better try Hearthstone of the Death Squad. Now you're being ridiculous. Mr. Rollins is a highly respectable businessman. His reputation is spotless. Well, then this looks like too good a time for him to start getting dirty. Goodbye, Mr. Collins. 
He got up, started to say something, but changed his mind. He turned and walked to the door, ducking his head as he went out. Someday he was going to forget the duck and take the whole wall along with him. Ten minutes later, I got a phone call. Yeah? Is a man named Collins in your office? Well, he was. He just left. Did you take the job? Well, who's this? If you didn't take the job, you're fortunate. If you did, you'd better catch up on your insurance payments. Oh, I think so, huh? I think so. This is a family matter, so leave it that way or you're liable to get yourself killed. Look, would the Sherlock and me show if I deduced your name was Martin Rollins? Hello? Hello? When I brushed Collins out of my office with a quick no, I wouldn't have taken the job he'd offered me for a share in Manhattan Island. But when somebody starts threatening me, it's like telling a five-year-old kid to stay away from the cookie jar. The quickest way to get me to do something is to tell me not to and try pushing me around. I looked up the Rollins address, and in 20 minutes, my cab pulled up in front of a big old English house that looked like the summer training camp for the U.S. Mint. Yes? Why, Mr. Diamond. Uh, tell Mr. Rollins I want to see him, will you? Come in. I'm happy you've changed your mind. Just tell him I want to see him. He's in the garden. This way, please. We went through the big house and out through the glass doors into the garden. B.E. Rollins was sitting in a chair, feeding the birds. He was reaching his late 60s with the sour look of a man who didn't want to. As he threw the breadcrumbs out on the gravel walk, a big diamond on his little finger flashed in the afternoon sun. Mr. Rollins? Huh? Oh, Collins. <coughs> Who's that with you? The detective you sent for, Mr. Rollins. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, pull up that chair and sit down, young man. Oh, thank you. Just feeding the little birds. Here, yeah, birdie, birdie. <clears throat> Been doing it for some time. Oh, swell. Well, what are you standing around for, Collins? I want to talk to this detective in private. Yes, sir. If you need me, I'll be in the library. I won't need you. Here, you feed the birds for a while. Makes you feel good. Oh, sure. Here, yeah, birdie. Birdie? That's fine. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> what's your name, young man? Diamond. Uh, Richard Diamond. Oh, hey, got a load of that little fella. He's grabbing enough crumbs to stuff a pheasant. Mm, he's the greedy one. Always does that. Reminds me of some people I know. <laughs> yes. Well, Mr. Diamond, I suppose Collins told you why I wanted to see you? Yeah, and I can't say I wanted the job at first. So Collins tells me. What changed your mind? A phone call. I think it was from your brother, Martin. He told me not to work for you. And you don't like being intimidated. Mm. Good. I think we'll get along, young man. Tell me, uh, have you got the letter he sent you? Have it right here. Read it. I'll take over with the birds for a while. Oh, thanks, sir. Mm. My dear brother, I spent five years hating you, but I learned a trade. I used it drawing blueprints for your shroud. Signed, Martin. Well, this will never get the Pulitzer Prize. Martin always did go in for the dramatic. Well, do you think you can find him? Was this the first you've heard from him since he went to prison? Yes. I will admit the letter has me worried. Aside from the dramatic, Martin has always been a hothead. Since boyhood, he's envied my get up and go. We never got along. It was even too much for my mother. She died very young. Mm, probably overworked from knitting straitjackets. Don't be flippant, young man. Well, will you take the job? A hundred dollars a day and all hospital expenses. Fine, fine. See, Collins, he'll take care of the fee. Now, uh, uh, tell me one more thing. Can you think of anyone who might know where your brother is? Only one, and I'm not sure if he's even still in New York. She was going with Martin when he was caught. I only met her once, but I will say, if nothing else, my brother showed good taste. Huh. Yes, indeed. Well, that's nice. What was her name? Carter. Virginia Carter. Lived someplace in the village, I think, but that was five years ago. All right, thank you. Now, uh, what about your secretary, Collins? Can you trust him? Collins is above reproach. He's been with me for 15 years. Knows everything about me. Almost a member of the family. Does he know anything more about Martin? No more than I do. Now I'm getting tired. And I want to finish feeding my birds. Good day, young man. Here, birdie. Birdie! I left the old man sitting with his friends. He'd have one good deed to take along with him anyway. I went back to the glass doors and a butler showed me the way to the library. But the cupboard was bare. Collins wasn't around. Collins! Collins! 
The shot had come from the direction of the garden, and I went back out in a hurry. Mr. Diamond! Mr. Diamond, over here! What's wrong, Collins? It's Mr. Rollins. He's dead. B.E. Rollins was sitting in the chair with a bullet hole just over the heart. His head was resting on his chest, and he still held the breadcrumbs in his hand. He seemed to be smiling like he knew he was going to be able to feed the birds for a long time now. Martin did it. He did? I saw the whole thing. I thought you were supposed to be in the library. Well, I started out of the library and came around the other way. As I rounded the corner of the house, I saw Martin standing behind that tree. I started to yell, but he fired and climbed over the wall. Mr. Rollins was dead when I reached him. That's called homicide. <laughs> Before we continue with Richard Diamond, private detective, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That's what noted throat specialists reported in a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days. That's how mild camels are. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and enjoy the rich, full flavor of camels' costly tobaccos. And see for yourself how mild camels are pack after pack. See how well camels get along with your throat week after week. Yes, that's the sensible test of cigarette mildness. For only by steady smoking can you judge the day-in, day-out mildness of a cigarette. Start your own camel 30-day test today and see how mild, how flavorful... How thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. You'll find out why people say, once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30 day test, then you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick. Powell. Hello, Rick. Hi, you all. Well, the great private detective. What do you want the police force to do for you now? Get rid of one of their stupid sergeants. Now, I don't oh, like it. Is. it. Okay. Okay, yeah. This is Mr. Collins, Walt. Lieutenant Levinson, Mr. Collins. Hello, Mr. Collins. How do you do, Lieutenant? Uh, the body's in the garden. B. Rollins, huh? Yeah, big time. Rollins Investments. That's right, Lieutenant. Any idea who killed him? But Mr. Collins here says it was Rollins' brother. That's right, Lieutenant. I saw Martin shoot Mr. Rollins. There he is. Gee, on such a nice day, too. Isn't Otis a dream? Oh, though? such a one. Well, right over the heart. Otis, you go... What are you doing, Rick? It was a letter from his brother. A letter? Sure, I read it myself. I... Holy Ike, it's gone. We searched the whole garden for the incriminating letter and came up with a big fat zero. Then I remembered something that the old man had told me about Martin. Something about a girl named Virginia Carter. I questioned Collins, but he didn't know her. So I put the old mind to work and became my usual shrewd self. I went back in the library, grabbed a phone book, and found the only Virginia Carter listed. It was a wild, long shot. But I grabbed a cab, and 40 minutes later, I was standing in front of her door. When she opened it, I got the quickest scalding in history. Hello. Oh, I bet you have a hard time finding something to wear in July. Do you like it? It's French silk. Love it, love it. What's on your mind? Now, uh, 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 Virginia Carter? Mm-hmm. Now, if you'll stop panting long enough, maybe you'd like to tell me what you want. Well, I'd like to know about Martin Rollins. Oh, I have not seen him in years. Maybe you've got a picture of him? I've got lots of pictures. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is one of Martin someplace. Well, let's uh, look through the whole flock. I've got lots of time. Before I let you in, you better tell me your name. I don't want you to steal anything from me. Baby, if anybody stole something from you, they get their fingers burned off of the elbows. Mm-hmm. You can come in. 
She opened the door and walked ahead of me like she'd just oiled her sacroiliac. She led me into the living room and sat down. The shades were drawn. I had a hard time finding the couch. Right here. Oh, wow. Well, how do, uh, how do we look at the pictures with the magic lantern? I thought maybe you wanted to relax for a minute. Well, uh, put something in a glass. I'll cool down. I don't drink. I never keep this stuff around. Mm. Well, that doesn't leave you much of a field. Or what do you major in? Cigarettes. Have a camel? Oh, yes, any time. I haven't got a match. Well, just hold on to it. It'll light up. I think i better get the pictures. I'll be right back. Just make yourself comfortable. Mm-hmm. hoop de doo hoop de doo you can start with this. If mutton isn't in this pile, I've got lots more. You're not in a hurry, are you? No, not a bit. Good. This might run into overtime. There was one trouble with the setup. Looking at the pictures with her sitting close was like trying to read a mail order catalog in front of a blast furnace. She handed me one picture at a time, describing each guy in the photographs. I've seen draft boards with smaller clientels. Several times she stopped and looked at one of the pictures like Diamond Jim eyeing a ten-course meal, then passed the guy to me. After two dozen photographs, I started thinking she was the reason for the rise in the vitamin market... And I was just going to mention an old snapshot I had of myself when she thumped one of the collection with a polished fingernail. Martin Rollins, here he is. Well, he figured to show up sooner or later. How long ago was this taken? Well, I could not say exactly, but I'd guess about six years. Mm -hmm. well, you should keep a file. How'd you get along with Martin? All right, I guess. He had money and he showed me a good time. What else do you know about him? He has a brother with a checking account at Fort Knox. Hmm. Any unusual habits? Yes, but they wouldn't help you find him. Oh, yes, he used to play a saxophone. A hobby? No, not exactly. He played around town with several other small bands. He was a nut on jazz. Did he make money at it? <laughs> I guess so. Well, thanks, baby. I'll stop around again sometime and take a look at your parlor. I'll spin a nice soft web. Mind if I take Martin with me? Mm, not if you bring back a picture of yourself. Maybe I'll just bring my camera. You can take it. Good. That's why I keep the room so dark. I like to develop things. I hated to leave, but my hair was on fire. She'd given me one lead. Martin was a musician of a sort, and sometimes he made money at it. I started to cross the street to catch another cab, and I was halfway there when I heard the car. That was an old trick. You drive by fast, open your door, and if anyone is in the way, he winds up with a face full of automobile. I picked myself up and thought about chasing him, but he was so far down the street, I couldn't even get the license number. I grabbed a bug-eyed cabbie and had him take me to local 802 of the Musicians' Union. I went in, and a little short guy with a twitch looked up at me from behind a big desk. Is something I can do for you, Pop? Hmm. Bad twitch. Yeah, too much bop. Tell me, uh, do you know a Martin Rollins plays the sax? Has he got a card? He makes money. Then if he ain't, he better have. Well, see if he does, will you? I'm an old friend. I like to get in touch with him. You look like a cop. And I've got a shiny little badge. Oh, uh, well, wait a minute. I'll, I'll see what I can find. Cop, huh? Now look what you've done. you got me twitching more than ever. Between twitches, he found what I was looking for. Martin had just renewed his card... It didn't show a home address, but his mail was being sent to one of the swing joints on 52nd Street. I said thanks and left him in the middle of another twitch. I walked out on the sidewalk, looked at the long gray shadows stretching out from the tall buildings. One of them moved and ducked around a corner. I was being followed. Fingers, can I bother you for a minute? No, but you can talk to me. Move in, lean on the piano. Good. You know a Martin Rollins? Well, sure, he blows here. Which one is he? He's off tonight, got a phone call and took off. You know where he lives? 
Yeah. Well, here's five. Come down and remember the address. What do you want them for? Here's another five. What difference does it make? Solid. It's got a little pad on 5th Street, 59 East. Now, don't put me on, Dad. You got troubles? I'm going to ask him. Oh, crazy. I like his style. And when you got time, drop back and listen to the band. I don't think I could stand the altitude. <laughs> crazy guy. I went out fast, and ten minutes later, I was standing in front of Martin Rollins' apartment. I tried my knuckles and waited. I tried again and put my ear to the door. I didn't hear it at first because it was so faint. A light scraping sound like rope over wood. I tried the door. I had been right on both counts. It was a rope and it was rubbing on wood. Brother Martin was making the sound effects, but he was doing it the hard way. He was on the other end of the rope, hanging by his neck. He was turning slowly like a weather vane in a soft breeze. A chair was tipped over at his feet, so I picked it up and sat down to think. I started to get up when something in my stomach jumped up and kicked my mind to high gear. I looked up at the dead man and what I saw through the suicide theory right out of the window. Sitting in the chair, my head was just on a level with his shoe tops. If he had used the chair to stand on, he would have still needed a ladder just to tie the rope to a beam. I've seen a couple of guys who hang themselves, but never one who jumped four feet in the air to do it. I shoved the chair under him just to make sure. He cleared it by a good foot. I started to think of all the people who had been connected with the case, and the phone rang. I knew Martin would have trouble answering, so I helped him out. Hello? Hello, Martin. Well, uh, he's tied up right now. Who is this? Well, hello, honey. Still collecting pictures? Uh, oh. Hello? Hello? Hmm. Antisocial. Mr. Diamond, did you bring your camera? We'll play spend the bottle some other time. How did you know my name? What? You gave it to me this afternoon. You're a bad liar, baby. And look out, I'm coming in. Now, wait a minute. I'm expecting someone. Well, if it's who I think it is, you better hide all the rope in the house. Now, move it out of the way. Oh, you heard from Collins yet? I don't know what you're talking about. Now, get out of here. Collins, Rollins' secretary, just killed Martin Rollins. He stretched his neck out so far, he started looking like an ad in National Geographic. What? Yes. He strangled him first, then stood on a chair and hung the body to a rafter. How do you know Collins did it? Because he forgot he's a foot taller than most guys. He gave Martin a boost and left him hanging too high. What's that got to do with me? Well, I think Collins knew I'd come to you. I think he promised you the moon if you fingered Martin Rollins. He wanted to get Martin, but he wanted someone else to do it for him. He knew old man Rollins would remember you and tell me. You crazy. Oh, well, we'll see. How much did Collins promise you? He didn't promise me a thing. You don't think he's going to let you go on breathing when he finds out the law is after him? You're the only hole in his story. Wait a minute. He just left Martin waiting for oxygen. He's probably on his way here right now. He didn't say anything about killing Martin. I want to get out of this mess. Now, that's better. Tell me everything you can. Well, he met me about three months ago at a party. We started to see each other. One day he told me he was in some kind of trouble and asked me to help, and I said I would. He told me that he had been in a deal with Martin and that Martin had gone to prison for it. So Martin had come back and wanted his share, is that yeah. it? Yes. He promised me 50... <laughs> it all happened in the time it takes you to change your mind. He must have come in through the kitchen and started shooting. She went down like a diver with a bends and died on her face. He was trying for me when I jumped to one side and knocked over the only light burning in the room. He came close, but the flash of his gun gave me his position, and I threw enough lead to start a pipeline. He stumbled back into the kitchen, but he was dragging it. I heard him drop, and I moved in after him. The moonlight slanted down through one of the windows and splashed out on the hard floor. He was lying in it, on his back, like he wanted to get that far anyway. Don't try again, Collins. 
I still feel like shooting. Forget it. No reason to kill you now. Before you close your eyes, tell me something. Better make it quick. Why didn't you go out and get Martin Rollins yourself? Why hire me to find him? I didn't want anyone to know I was looking. You were the alibi. With Rollins dead and Martin a suicide, you'd swear Martin killed the old man. Because Rollins showed me the letter? You forged it? Yes. Yes, I shot Rollins and took the letter. And you planted that phony call to my office. Yes. Well, you nearly got away with it, Collins. You just forgot how tall you were when you hanged Martin. I thought sure Martin was the one who was trying to run me down. I'm a rotten driver. <laughs> how bad is it? You must have been a good cop. I caught all three. It should be raining out. Too nice a night to die. Not a cloud in the sky. Must be nice to look at. No. No, no. Keep standing up. You'll never see it from down here. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? The brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this recent nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Camel's costly tobaccos are properly aged and expertly blended for your smoking enjoyment. Make the sensible cigarette test. Not just a puff, not just a sniff. Smoke Camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as a tribute to the men and women who have served our country, the makers of Camel cigarettes send gift cigarettes each week to hospitalized servicemen and veterans. This week, the Camels go to veterans' hospitals, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and Des Moines, Iowa, U.S. Air Force Hospital, Bowling Air Force Base, Washington, D.C., U.S. Naval Hospital, Memphis, Tennessee. Now, until next week, enjoy Camels. I always do. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg as Virginia and Ted Osborne as Rollins. Tom Tully was Collins. Arthur Q. Bryan is Lieutenant Levinson and Wilms Herbert Otis. Men, pack your pipes with Prince Albert. The rich flavor and natural fragrance will tell you why P.A. is America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Prince Albert's Choice Tobacco is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite and its crimp cut to smoke cool and even. Get Prince Albert. It's the national joy smoke. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. How 
How mild can a cigarette be? Martha Tilton knows. Ezio Pinza knows. Vaughn Monroe knows. Yes, so many stars whose voices are their fortunes know it's camels for mildness. They choose camels because they know that camels get along with their throats. Make the 30-day camel mildness test and see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Back here behind the socks. Careful the clothesline. I thought you were a detective. Oh, it's been a rumor for some time. Do you always do laundry in the office? Only on Fridays, honey. Uh, have a seat, Miss... Uh... Caspery. Well, I'll be right with you, Miss Caspery, as soon as I ring out these... Uh... <laughs> as soon as I ring them out. Go right ahead. Ah. Ah, there, there. Mm -hmm. All right, Miss Caspery, what can I do for you? It's Mrs. Mm -hmm. Well, now, what's it all about? My husband's going to kill me. Just frisky, or has he got a reason? I, I found out he's been stealing from his partner, and when I faced him with it, he threatened me. Has he done anything more than threaten? Last night he went out and said he'd be gone for most of the evening. I, I went to bed, and about an hour later, I thought I heard somebody start upstairs. I got frightened and put pillows in my bed to make it look like I was sleeping. Was it your husband? I, I hid in my dressing room and watched, and then the door opened. It was too dark to tell, but I'm sure it was Phil. He came in and had a knife, and... He jabbed the pillow several times before he realized it, it wasn't a real body. Couldn't he see? What do you mean? Well, there's some things a guy remembers. Even if you slept in a diving suit, you'd have a hard time hiding them. I like lots of covers. Mm, yeah. Now, you said Phil. Is uh, your husband Phil Caspery, the gambler? Yes, he and Max Bruno are in business together. Yeah, I know. The rooftop club. An iron claw with a cover charge. <sighs> This morning, Phil said he was going away on a business trip, but I don't believe him. I'm afraid he's going to try killing me again. I want you to come around about eight and protect me. Here's a hundred dollars. That should cover it. Well, thanks, thanks. We might be up late. Maybe I should bring a good book. Oh, you'll strain your eyes. I like dark rooms. She got up then and walked slowly across the room like a big cat that had just finished eating its keeper. She stopped at the door and smiled a promise. I thought how Samson must have looked with a crew cut. <coughs> Around one, I stopped in at the corner of 51st and Broadway for a bite of lunch. I killed part of the afternoon at the newspaper morgue, looking up the past files of one Phil Caspery. No convictions, but a bundle of arrests. The partnership with Max Bruno had earned some big type from time to time, and it seemed that Mr. Caspery's partner, Max, was quite a favorite with the local authorities. They'd nailed him twice. The first time, Uncle Sam sent him away for missing too many March 15ths. The second was when I remembered. A rookie cop caught him with a gun. The parole board said shame and sent him up for the rest of the stretch. I went back to the apartment, dressed, and by 8 o'clock, I was ringing Mrs. Caspery's doorbell. <coughs> the skin of my back crawled up and sat on my head. Whoever was dying was doing it the hard way. <coughs> the door was locked, so I gave it the benefit of one of my shoulders. <coughs> it was one of those heavy panel jobs with a will of its own, but finally the hinges got tired and gave up. I stumbled into the living room and came up with my 38. The screams had stopped, and I knew the only reason she had given up yelling was because she'd given up living. She was sprawled on the bed, but she didn't look anything like she had that afternoon. The killer had made sure of that. He'd used a knife. And now, she just didn't look like anything. I took a quick look around, found no one, so headed for the phone on the nightstand to call homicide. 
He must have been standing behind the door. When I turned, he gave it to me. Oh! He used something heavy enough to split a block of cement. It caught me across the nose, and I went down like an express elevator. While I was thinking the floor looked silly, trying to be a funnel, he nailed me again. Mm. Oh, and this time he pushed back the ceiling and let the night in. It's easy to relax after a good beating. You just bleed a little and grow weak. When someone tries to shake you out of it, it's like trying to sober a drunk that got mulled on cleaning fluid. Come on, Rick. Let's go. Snap out of it. Oh. Come on, kid. You're a mess. Oh, I'm stuck in the confetti. Oh, oh yeah. We have a party or something? Yeah, it looks that way. Wake up. You're still running around with the squirrels. Oh, oh my. Take a look at that, uh, that bed, Walt. If I appear untidy, it makes up for things. We cleaned it off. Now try and sit up. The ambulance will be here in a minute. Oh, well, get me a bat, will you? If I can find the guy who crowned me, I'll give you another customer. We got him outside, but I can't say I blame him. And who you got? Caspery. He says you knocked off his wife. Uh, what? He called us. Said he came home, found the body, and found you tiptoeing through the corpses. Yeah. Well, maybe he told you his wife came to see me today and gave out with a hundred bucks to protect her from him. No, as a matter of fact, he didn't. Well, then don't stand there on your swollen bunion, Walt. He's got me in line for a murder rap, and I don't like it. I don't blame you. Otis, bring in Mr. Caspery. Yeah, Lieutenant. Get in there, Caspery. Okay, Sergeant. Okay, take it easy. Here he is, Lieutenant. Caspery, Diamond here says he'll trade you a seat in the electric chair for his pushed-in face. I don't get it. Well, stick around, Phil. It'll catch up with you. Hold it a minute, Rick. I've had my face turned into an ad for taffy machines. I've got a right to glow. Look, why the chit-chat, Lieutenant? You got your killer? That's what Diamond thinks. He says you fit the job. He's a dirty liar. Says your wife retained him to protect her from you. For why? She found out you were robbing your partner. You made one try for her, but you missed. You graduated, Diamond. Now you're a filthy liar. <laughs> All right, Rick, lay off. Okay, but I'd like to play some more. I want some answers. Then why don't you ask his partner? You know him, Max Bruno. All right. Let's all go see Max Bruno. A prowl car on Park Avenue is as conspicuous as an outside shower at a girls' camp. A crowd of people watch Sergeant Otis herd us into the back seat. Even if you aren't guilty, you feel like you've got the Chrysler building tucked away under your coat. I waved goodbye to a good-looking blonde with a poodle, and we took off for Bruno's office. It was an old building on 6th Avenue... And a gunneth named Tony Garcia with a big bulge under his arm met us at the door. What is this, a convention? Hello, Tony. Tell Bruno I want to see him. The whole party or just you, Lieutenant? I'm enough. Sure. What's the matter, Casper? You look sick. You get tagged for speeding? You can tell, Max, it looks like he built the frame just the right size. I don't think you know what you're talking about. Oh, stop playing Alice in Wonderland. We want to see Bruno. Now find out if he's in. We know how to turn a doorknob. Look out. Okay. Well, what is this? They wouldn't wait for an introduction. Hello, Max. What do you want, Levinson? A couple of questions. You in some kind of trouble, Caspery? What do you think? Well, what are you getting rough with me for? Oh, are you dirty double Shut cross? up. Well, what's eating you, Diamond? Well, that's a good one. Now, look. You look, Max. And you keep your mouth shut, Caspery. Not when I'm being framed. I'm going to yell my head off. Framed? Don't know nothing about it, huh, Max? I don't know what you're talking about. What is this? You framed me with that killing. Killing? Don't come on with that bitch. You know what I'm talking about. Take Caspery in the hall, Otis. Yes, sir. Come on, Caspery. I'll get you for this, Max. So help me. Come I'm... on, you. Won't somebody tell me what's going on Nothing here? Liar, I swear to you, if it's the last thing I do, I'll get What's happened to him? Max, you don't know? How am I supposed to know? Guess? Somebody just killed his wife. Tony. Yeah, boss? Wait in the hall. Yeah, boss. Caspery knocked off his wife, huh? Well, he didn't say it was Caspery. Look, Caspery's my partner. At least he was. You split? Yeah, a couple of days ago. Why? I've been checking for a couple of weeks. Caspery's been holding out on the take. How'd you find out? His wife called me and told me. Oh, really? I wonder why a wife would incriminate her husband like that. Yeah, she was scared, scared stiff. She found out what he was doing, and he told her he'd kill her. So she didn't know what to do. She called me. You knew her pretty well, huh? Not too well. She figured I could give her protection. 
I told her to see you, Diamond. Well, now, that was uh, very nice of you, but... What did you do about Casper when you found out he was robbing you? Told him to get out, have the money back by tomorrow morning. You tell him his wife tipped you about him? Are you crazy? Of course not. Said I'd been checking on him for a long time, that the books didn't tally. And what did he say? He said he didn't do it. What'd you expect him to say? Well, uh, are your books short? 200000 worth. Okay, Max, we'll be talking to you. Wife's dead, huh? About as dead as she can get. See you around. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so he told you how I've been robbing the till. Yeah, he did. Well, uh, let's go. What's the matter, Casper? You give it up? I'm framed. That's it. Let's go. Oh, by the way, what did you do with the murder weapon? Don't be surprised if you wake up some morning and find it sticking in your back. Get him out of here, Otis. Come on, you. Come on. <laughs> well, well, Levinson did it again. Suspect in custody. What do you do for an encore? Sleep. You want me to drop you off an emergency? You could use a new face. No, I'll grab a cab and go to the apartment and clean up. Got to see Helen later. Okay, but stay off the streets. Somebody's liable to think you're dead and bury you. Oh, that's a good one. Night. Good night. Hey, cabby. Yeah? Where to, Mac? Holy yike. What's the matter? Oh, don't scare me like that. I got a nervous stomach. Where well, they could sell your face for 60 cents a pound. Okay, so good housekeeping shuns me. 553 East 51st and step on it. What are you rolling the window down for? I want to see if it's still bleeding up. Thirty-five cents. Here you are. Thanks. Let's take a ride instead. Huh? Don't move. Hey, what's going on? I told you we're going to take a ride. With a gun in my back I don't recognize, but you should have worn your other head, Tony. Move. Okay, okay. What's the matter? Doesn't Max give you enough to eat? <coughs> That's because I don't think you're funny. All right, all right. You're Tony Garcia and you make people bleed. Right, boy. All the... Now get in the car. You're bending the suit. Get in. You drive. Okay, but I'm a better pedestrian. Where to? Washington Bridge. I don't swim any better than I drive. You won't have to. You're out for high diving. Get going. Come on, come on. Hurry it up. I thought we were going to a funeral. That's a good one. What's it all about, Tony? Don't get nosy. Enjoy the ride. It's a new car. We rode like that. Tony sitting half-turned with a big 45 in his fist, pointing right at my stomach. I drove south across town, trying to figure it out. Max Bruno's killer getting ready for a job. Why? Why me? What did I know that could get Max Bruno in trouble? Turn here. I turned and the Washington Bridge wasn't far away. I could see it stretched out across the river like a long coffin lined with bright candles. I eased down on the accelerator and by the time we reached the bridge, I was doing a good 60. Slow down. We were near the toll gate. I took my foot off the accelerator and then jammed down on the brakes as hard as I could. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, private detective, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. You know, smoking is a day-in, day-out pleasure. We like each cigarette to taste as good as the one before. And we like the cigarette we smoke to be mild, to get along with our throats for a good long time. So it's good sense to test a cigarette over a period of time, 
Not just a puff of this cigarette or a sniff of that. Yes, make the sensible cigarette test, the thorough test. Smoke only camels for 30 days as you normally smoke, and you'll see how rich and flavorful camels are pack after pack. You'll see how mild camels are week after week. In a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That's real proof of cigarette mildness. Make your own camel 30-day test, the sensible test, and see for yourself why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. We had hit the bridge railing and stopped cold. The steering wheel had caught me in the stomach. I opened my mouth to make my lungs work. It was like sucking air through a bent straw. I didn't know how long I sat there before I finally made it, but a slow, dripping sound made me remember Tony and look over. He was halfway through the windshield, and the dripping wasn't a broken radiator. His life was running out all over the hood. I got out of the car before the guards got to it. I had to have time to figure the whole thing out, and I didn't want to hang around for a lot of long explanations. I walked until I lost the crowd that was collecting. I took in long breaths of fresh air until my head cleared, then spotted an empty cab heading back to town, flagged it, gave the cabbie the address of the rooftop club. I needed answers, and the best person to give them to me was Max Bruno. Hey, boy, boy, paper. Yes, sir. Gee, what happened to your face? I shaved with a rake. Yeah? Gee, that's pretty funny. Holy. What's the matter? This picture. That's the dame was knocked off tonight. Caspery dame. Oh, so that's it. Huh? Here's a buck, thanks. Wow. Take my advice, mister. See your analyst. You'll get rid of them bells. <laughs> Homicide, Lieutenant Levinson. Walt, did you get to 415 at the George Washington Bridge? Yeah, about ten minutes ago. Tony Garcia ran into the bridge railing. Some other guy with him. How'd you hear about it, Rick? Well, I was the other guy. What? Yeah, Tony was going to show me the bottom of the river. Are you nuts? Not at all, no. And have you seen the evening papers? No. Well, there's a picture of Mrs. Casperi on the front page. So what? Well, so this. The girl in the picture isn't the same girl who came into my office this afternoon. Well, who was she? I don't know. Now, wait a minute, Well, Rick. well, no, no, no. Don't you get it? That's why Tony was supposed to gun me tonight. No, I don't get it. Oh, Walt, somebody wanted to frame Phil Casperi. They sent a girl to my office posing as Mrs. Casperi. So I'd swear she suspected that Phil was going to kill her. When I found the wife dead, she was cut up so bad I couldn't tell the difference. Well, then why kill you? To prevent what's just happened. Get me out of the way before I saw the evening papers. Then Max Bruno was lying about Caspery taking the money. Sure. There had to be a motive, so he cooked up the story about Mrs. Caspery calling him and telling him about Phil and the money. Then Bruno's our man. Oh, Walt, you're such a good boy. I knew you'd get it. Check your hat, sir. Maybe I'd better throw it in the door first. Uh, give me a pack of camels. Yes, sir. Who's running the place for Mr. Bruno? Mr. Caspery, but he isn't in yet. Well, it depends on what you're talking about. How's the floor show? It's all right if you've got an imagination. Hmm. 
You know, you better keep moving. You'll catch cold in that get-up. Oh, well, don't let it fool you. The bustle's real, your hot water bottle. I went in and sat at the bar. The dance floor was in the other room, but you could see it through the long glass windows. I was sitting there trying to figure my next move when the floor show started. The usual line of cuties came out. The hat check girl was wrong. You didn't need an imagination. They were wearing just enough to make a bathing suit look like a sleeping bag. They tripped over each other getting off, and the lights went dim, and a white spot circled the piano. She came out in a green satin evening gown. I've seen grapes with looser skins. I didn't know what time it was. She knew what time it was. She was pretty good, too. But she was better this afternoon in my office when she told me she was Mrs. Caspery. I got up and went back to the hat check girl with a warm bustle. Maybe you need a shot. Even the old ones stick around for the last show. Honey, where can I find that singer's dressing room? I thought you looked healthy. Uh-uh, Mr. Bruno wouldn't like it. Well, maybe we don't let Mr. Bruno in on it. Oh, ten bucks. You'll have to shove bamboo under my nails before I talk. She told me how to find the singer's dressing room. I thanked her and gave her a pat on the... You know, it was a hot water bottle. I walked by the bar again and listened while she poured it on. I've heard singers with better voices, but this one had the difference. She went into the last few bars, and I headed for her dressing room. I wanted to get there before she did. And unless that green satin gown was a breakaway, she didn't figure for an encore. I got in and sat down to wait. It was a quick minute before she showed up. Down, do oh, da, da, shut up, you're flat. <gasps> oh, you get out of here. Go on, get out. Now, relax, baby. I got something to say. You want to listen or do you want to get shoved around? You just try it. I'll get some of Max's boys to let the air out of your muscles. Open your mouth and you'll be tripping on your teeth. I... Get away from that door and sit down. Not until you get your eyes full of fingernails. Hey, you little... <gasps> now, get this. I don't like marking up dames' complexions, but you're making it easy. Who sent you up to my office? Was it Max? Why don't you ask him? He's good at answers. Well, so was his boy, Tony. He got dead trying to figure it out. Maybe you'd like to guess. Uh, wait a minute, Diamond. One scream from me and everybody in the joint will be in here on your back. Honey, honey, if you open your mouth, I'll shove your foot in it. Uh, if, if I tell you... Do I get squared with the law? You're an accessory before the fact. I can only give you a head start. Just give me long enough to find a healthy climate. Now, you're killing time. Come on. I want to know who built you up to fit Mrs. Caspery. Was it Max Bruno? All right. It was Max. Phil found out he was holding out in the gambling take. So he dissolves the partnership by killing Mrs. Caspery, making Phil the patsy. Neat, huh? Yeah. Like a sack full of brains. Go on. Answer it. Who is it? Open up, baby. It's me. Max, look out. Diamond's in here. Sorry, baby, but twice makes you a punching bag. I didn't want to hit her, but it was the only way to keep her tongue in. She dropped like a wet wash in an earthquake, and I jumped to the door. Max was halfway down the hall. He had a gun in his hand, and he used it. The slug tore up the wall by my ear, and before I could try my luck, he was around the corner. I thought about the hole his Luger had made, and I wondered why I was still chasing him. I turned the corner and found myself in the bandstand. Max turned fast and tried again. I was across the crowded dance floor and the panic busted loose. What's going on here? I shoved aside a drunk who thought it was the 4th of July and went to the bar like I needed the exercise. That man's got a gun! Max was nearly to the front door when he turned around for another shot at me. He didn't see the little hat check girl standing behind him with her arms full of coats. He backed right into her, and they both went down together. Max stumbled up, tangled, and on a sordid wardrobe. He squeezed first, but he was wearing too many coats. Then he missed again. I didn't miss. 
Max doubled up like a tired ice bag and got himself a face full of carpet. He was pretty dead. The hat check girl looked at me for a minute, then leaned over to Max. She said something that endeared her to me forever. Check your gun, Mr. Bruno. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? That question was asked of doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country. In repeated surveys, the brand named most is Camel. Yes, according to these surveys, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Camels' costly tobaccos are properly aged and expertly blended for your smoking enjoyment. Make the sensible cigarette test, the 30-day Camel test, and see how enjoyable a cigarette can be. See for yourself why people say, once a Camel smoker, always a Camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. You know, it's a pleasure for me to make this weekly announcement, ladies and gentlemen, because each week the makers of camels send gift cigarettes to a most deserving group of people, servicemen and veterans who are hospitalized. This week's camels go to veterans' hospitals Fargo, North Dakota, and Alexandria, Louisiana. U.S. Air Force Hospital, Randolph Air Force Base, Texas. U.S. Naval Hospital, San Diego, California. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell, was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Wilms Herbert. Men, whether you buy the handy pocket tin or the big one-pound tin of Prince Albert, you're in for real smoking joy. P.A.'s Choice Tobacco has a rich taste and delightful natural aroma. It's specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. And it's crimp cut for smooth, even, cool smoking. Get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI, follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. One single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels 
That's what noted throat specialists reported in a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test, the sensible, thorough cigarette test, and see why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, put up or shut up? Hi. Oh, hi, Helen. You busy? Oh, like a hibernating bear. No business? I've seen more action in a bankrupt turtle farm. (laughs) Oh, things can't be that bad. I'm even getting an echo in here. Rick. Really? Listen. Hello? Hello? See? Rick, was that really an echo? Now, wait a minute. Hey, my girl wants to know if you're really an echo. I beg your pardon. Oh, honey, I'll call you back. This echo has a man with it. Bye. Bye. Can I help you, sir? I am looking for Mr. Richard Diamond. Why? Now, that's an extremely unique question. I want to sell him ten tons of pig iron. Well, I'm very sorry, but I made a New Year's resolution that I wouldn't build another battleship until I paid up my bill at the automat. (laughs) My name is Barr, David Barr. Now, if you'll stop talking like a television comedian, I would like to discuss a business arrangement. Well, my name is Diamond, Richard Diamond. And if you're rolling in money, I'd be very happy to discuss any arrangement you could dream up. How much do you charge, Mr. Diamond? Well, that depends. Anything short of a felony, a hundred a day in expenses. How earthy. Well, it keeps my ribs from showing. Have you ever heard of me, Mr. Diamond? Well, I have a feeling this may lose me a quick sale, but very frankly, Mr. Barr... No matter, I can see by your clothes that your wardrobe must be fashioned exclusively by popular mechanics. No. Well, okay, we've kicked it around. It's been fun, but I'm beginning to get winded. What do you want to see me for, Mr. Barr? I uh, want you to guard my store. Store? Yes, I have the most fashionable men's haberdashery and tailoring business on Madison Avenue. And you want it guarded? Perhaps I should give you some background concerning the disgusting incidents that led me to your, uh, uh... Office. <laughs> for the lack of a more sordid description, yes, office. Mm, I'm sure the whole background must be very disgusting. Two nights ago, my shop was vandalized. Mm, somebody broke in and swiped something. Yes, yes. To be exact, one blue serge suit... One suit? One, one. I reported the incident to the police, and they summed it up with the same brilliant observation as you. To quote the sergeant, somebody broke in and swiped something. Now, uh, uh, look, Mr. Barr, don't tell me you want me to find that blue suit. No, this was not the end of the trouble, Mr. Diamond. Somebody lifted a hand-painted tie, maybe? Uh, Naturally, my employees were questioned, and the following day the police returned to their little precinct, satisfied that somebody had merely... Busted in and swiped something. Yes, yes, yes. Well, the following night, my shop was again the object of vicious vandalizing. This time, the party, or parties responsible, took every foot of blue serge material in the shop. Oh, now, wait a minute. First, somebody breaks in and takes one blue serge suit. The next night, all the blue serge material in the store is stolen. What's the matter? Did you run out of suits? All my suits are custom-tailored, Mr. Diamond. Oh. My stock of finished merchandise is generally sparse. We complete only two or three suits a day. The missing blue serge was hanging with two other suits. The property, of course, of one of my best customers. And the thief didn't touch the other two suits? No, no. And on the following night, the night of the second burglary, a gray flannel was left untouched. Mm. The suit and the cloth stolen were both blue serge. Uh, Correct. Naturally, I had to order another stock of the same material. It's in the shop now, and I should not be able to sleep a wink unless I was certain that it was safe. And you want me to sit up with the blue serge? (laughs) Exactly. I am considerably interested in finding the motive behind these unusual robberies. Oh, well, this is certainly a first in my life. I've sat up with a lot of things, but never 15 yards of blue surge. The illustrious Mr. Barr handed me a $100 retainer, ran a white glove over the top of my desk like an inspecting general, made an observation on the pursuit of happiness, and went out of my office faster than a bad molar at a dentist convention. We had agreed to meet at his shop at 6 o'clock that evening. So I pasted the $100 bill to my end step, put the end step up on the desk, crossed the other end step over it, 
leaned back and dozed off, secure in the knowledge that money would never go to my head. Yeah? Mr. Diamond, this is Mr. Barr. Oh, yeah. Well, it isn't, isn't six, is it? It's 4.35. Mr. Diamond, am I correct in assuming that the moment you grabbed that $100, you became a member of my employ? Well, you're correct. 100 bucks worth. Then please come immediately to number six, Park Avenue. Something's happened, and I feel a complete breakdown coming on. <laughs> Oh, come in, come in. Oh, what's happened? Oh, if this keeps up, I may be living on dream pills. I've been eating them like peanuts. Well, maybe if you gave me a hint. I, I have been robbed. Well, didn't we go through this thing in here, my... Here, here, I've been robbed here in my apartment. What? I came home, took a bath, went in to get dressed, opened my wardrobe, and to my complete horror, found three. My only three blue serge suits were missing. Oh, no. A potent reaction. Oh, no. Now, why didn't I think of that? I can't imagine. It's certainly simple enough. We'll spend a whole day insulting each other after you solve this mystery. So for now, strain yourself and try looking like a detective with a $100 retainer in his pocket. Well, it's not in my pocket. But if we go into that, I'll leave myself wide open. Show me your wardrobe. Mr. Barr's apartment was as overdone as he was. I stepped down into the living room and found myself wading through a carpet that called for a dog sled to negotiate it. The smell of incense made me keep looking back over my shoulder for the dancing girls. He led the way into a bedroom that George Washington wouldn't have slept in without an armed guard and opened his wardrobe. Two dozen $300 suits stretched from one end of the closet to the other. And there was enough material in that wardrobe to drive a frustrated moth into a complete fit. They were hanging, hanging right here in this space. You sure they couldn't be at the cleaners? They were here this morning. Oh, what's that on the bed? That's a blue serge suit. Mr. Diamond, that is the suit I was wearing when I came into your office. No, oh, well, I was so busy looking at your money, I... Well, well, what is to be done? Well, I got to admit it's sure a strange one. You are constantly coming up with the most astute observations. Oh, well, wait till I get around to your personality. <laughs> You'd really be a likable fellow, Diamond, if I could bring myself to look at you. Oh, I'm not so bad. Think of what you must go through shaving every morning. Oh, really, Diamond? What do you think is behind this ridiculous situation? Now, very honestly, I don't know. Except the obvious. Somebody wants your blue serge suits and all the blue serge material you've got. That blue serge on the bed is the last one I've got. Do you think this could be some kind of a practical joke? Not very. It could get somebody ten years. Well, have you got any ideas at all? Yes, I have. Take that last blue surge and hide it. I'll sit in your store tonight and see that the new material you ordered doesn't get lifted. You take the suit, Mr. Diamond. You're being paid to protect it. Okay. And remember, it's new. Brand new. It would cost you $300 to duplicate it. So for the sake of your home and kiddies, don't stuff your big shoulders into it. He gave me the key to his store and told me how to shut off the burglar alarm. He gave me the phone number where I could reach him that evening in case something happened, draped the blue suit over my arm and hurried me out of the room like he was getting rid of a plague victim. I grabbed a cab and ten minutes later I was unlocking the door to my apartment. I started to toss Mr. Barr's suit on the bed, but thought better of it so I went to the closet, opened the door and reached for a hanger. <laughs> Now, unlike Mr. Byers' wardrobe, I generally sport a variety of items. A couple of sport coats, a few old Letterman sweaters to fill up the space, four pair of slacks, and usually, mind you, I say usually, two suits. One of which I was wearing at the moment. The other was a blue serge. Was was right, because where my blue serge suit once was, it wasn't. That did it. First, Barr loses everything in sight that happens to be blue serge, then I come home and find that one of the two suits I had to my name had been swiped. I burned. Barr could get dozens of suits and use them for bath mats when he got tired of wearing them. Me? I was going to have to sew sleeves on the bath mats. I called Barr at home, but he'd left. I thought about calling with the number he had given me, but decided against it. I sat down to try and figure it out. But a half a dozen camels later, I was still facing a big, fat zero. One thing was sure, I had Mr. Barr's last blue serge suit, and nobody was going to get it away from me. 
Big shoulders or not, I put it on and headed for Barr's shop on Madison Avenue. I never made it. Hold it. Hey, hey what is this? I didn't... Well, I'm only considering it because he's got a gun in my back. Walked under that sedan by the curb. Oh, I get, uh, get car sick. You heard him. Oh, fellas, I haven't been well. Doctor recommends lots of walking. Told me to stay away from cars. No! Oh, now look. You heard him. Yeah, I heard him. Would I be nosy if I asked... Yeah, you would be very nosy. How about you, friend? You heard him. Get in the back. Look, can I interest you boys in a deal? My secret decoder and my ray gun, if you'll only... <laughs> they were both big boys, and they both had big guns. One of them slugged me with one of the big guns, and my head swelled up to match the whole ugly situation. I went down and out faster than a left fielder trying to steal home with a Charlie horse, and they rolled me into the car. We drove for a long time... Me, lying on the floor of the back seat, trying to bring myself back to a conscious way of thinking. Finally, I snapped out of it. And they let me sit up and take a look around. We were on a lonely stretch of road, and although the car was green, not black, and didn't look anything like a hearse, I had a gloomy feeling that we were heading for a funeral. Get out. Now, look. You heard him. Okay, okay. Look, fellas, the least you can do is tell me... Get out of that suit. Get out of the suit? You heard him. Take it off. Take it off quick. Well, I... Well, uh, okay. Would you Would you mind turning your backs? You want to get belted again? No, no, no. I'll, I'll take it off. Take the coat, Hans. Yeah, Hans. Here. Now the pants. Come on, come on. Oh, all right, all right. But it's cold. I'm getting goosebumps. Hand him the pants. <clears throat> Now you are, Hunts. Well, so you're the guys who've been after the blue serge suits. Walk them off the road, Hunts. Yeah, what if a car came by, me and my hand-painted shorts? Get them off far enough so they won't find him right away. Hmm? Move! Oh, now look. You heard him. Yeah, I sure did. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, here's an important question. How mild can a cigarette be? There's one sensible way to find out. It's not just a sniff, not just a puff, but steady smoking. For only then can you find out how well a cigarette agrees with your throat day in and day out. In a coast-to-coast test, hundreds of people smoked only camels for 30 days. Each week, their throats were examined by noted throat specialists who reported... Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own 30-day camel test. Enjoy the rich, full flavor of camels' costly tobaccos for 30 days and find out just how mild a cigarette can be, how mild camels are, pack after pack, week after week. It's the sensible, thorough test, a test that will pay off in years of smoking enjoyment. You'll discover why so many people say... Once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I kept walking with Hunts right behind me, his big gun pointed to the middle of my back. I could stand losing my clothes, but I'd grown to enjoy my life. So I decided I'd have to get that gun away from Hunts somehow. We were 50 yards from the road when I tried it. Give me that gun! Come on, give it to me! I guess you didn't hear what I said. Hunts had tried his best to put a hole in me, but like most guys who think they've got a sure thing, he forgot a small item called luck. In this case, all of it on my side. I left him lying on his face in the moonlight and headed back for the car. 
But the other Gunsel evidently saw my white shorts bounding over the landscape and decided it was time to leave. I tried a shot at him and then went back to find Hunts and borrow a pair of pants. Sometimes when things happen that fast, a guy gets careless. Now, I'd figured Hunts, being wounded, would be in the same spot I left him. But when I got back to the spot, the one-sentence killer was nowhere in sight. Somewhere in the distance, I heard a branch snap, so I knew that Hunts was on his way back home. I was getting too cold in my undies to start chasing him, so I went back to the road and walked until I spotted a house. Any other time, I would have considered carefully before walking up to a front door, attired only in my underwear. Thank goodness they weren't blue serge. I figured I could say I was a cross-country runner with a bad sense of direction. I rang the doorbell and waited. Yes? Could I use your phone? Ah! Oh, shut up, Walt. Boy, did you look silly when they dragged you in here. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know. Otis thought it was a burlesque raid and asked me for a date. Would you mind telling me what you were doing running around like that? Well, that woman's husband was chasing me. What did you think I was doing? Well, you can't blame the old man for chasing you. You scared his wife right out of her wig. Mm. Now, why don't you tell me what this is all about? Because I don't know. Well, how'd you lose your clothes? Uh, let me make a phone call and I'll tell you all about it. I put in a call to David Barr and asked him to meet me at the store. Then I briefed Walt on everything up to date. Walt said... Are you nuts? And I left before I had to lie. I went back to my apartment, climbed back into the only suit I had left, and 20 minutes later, I was standing in David Barr's shop on Madison Avenue. I explained the events of the last couple of hours, and Mr. Barr said... Disgusting. Ah, uh, you bet. I, I just can't understand uh, it. Move over. Don't you have any theories at all? Well, vague ones. That blue suit that you gave me. Tell me about it. The material was originally ordered for a customer who failed to show up, so I had it made up for me. Where did you get your cloth? Black and Winterfield. Although I'm certain you've never enjoyed the benefit of their merchandise, you must have heard of them. What customer was the material ordered for originally? Oh, not one of my steady customers. Uh, he left a deposit. Well, what was his name? Kingsley. Leonard Kingsley. A small man with a preposterous stomach. I had to order four yards. Oh, well, that's Mr. Kingsley. He's never called or gotten in touch with you? No, no, no. So needing another blue suit, I use the material for myself. If he comes in, I can always order more material. Didn't you take his measurements? Uh, he was in a hurry. He picked out the surge from the book, gave me a deposit, and told me he'd be back that afternoon for the measurements. Uh, that was over a month ago. What are you driving at, Diamond? How do I know? I'm just fishing. The whole thing has got something to do with blue surge material and that blue suit. You're getting disgustingly repetitious. I suppose you're going to tell me this Kingsley sent two hired killers to steal my goods because he thought it was easier than coming in for a fitting. I don't know. Where's your phone? On the desk. It's the only thing in the whole shop that looks anything like a phone. Honestly. I got more of a description of Leonard Kingsley and put in a call to Walt at the precinct. I gave him the information, asked him to run a check. Then I said goodnight to Mr. Barr and settled back in a chair to guard the store. I'd been sleeping about an hour when Walt called back. What do you know about this Leonard Kingsley, Diamond? Oh, now, there's a brilliant question. Why do you think I called you up? I don't know anything. I want to find out. Well, where did you hear about him? From my client. That bar guy you told me about? That's right. This Leonard Kingsley came into his store, ordered a suit, never came back. That was because he couldn't. Come back? Yeah. About a month ago, this Leonard Kingsley was killed in a car accident. Stepped off the curb and a car hit him. You sure it was an accident? Yep. Woman hit him. There was an inquest. Witnesses say it was all Kingsley's fault. All right, all right. What's the rest? Rest? Oh, stop with a little red riding hood. Something's up. Well, this is confidential, Rick. Well, it'll stay that way. The FBI have got a share in this thing. What? It seems that when a check was run to find Kingsley's home and relatives, all of the credentials he had on him turned out to be phonies, particularly his passport. What did the feds find out? Kingsley was from one of the Iron Curtain countries. Espionage. <laughs> Oh, 
All right, all right. Well, Paul Revere with a shoulder holster. I want some answers, Mr. Barr. How many customers can you remember who came into your shop and ordered only one suit in the last year? Mm, half a dozen. How many never came back after they got the one suit? Well, what's the matter? That's peculiar. Everyone I can remember, and they're comparatively easy because most of my customers are steady. Go on, go on. What about these single customers? Every one of them ordered a blue surge. And you got all the material from Black and Winterfield? Yes. The whole thing was beginning to make sense. What better way of getting information out of the country than in the material of a suit? I dragged Barr down to the store again, got the names of all his single customers who had ordered blue serge suits. Then I went over to the 5th Precinct and had Walt make a check on them. Two hours later, the U.S. Customs Department sent in an interesting teletype. Rick, every one of those guys have left the country and hasn't returned. And 8 to 5, the FBI can find out plenty. Now, well, give them the information. Let's go over to Black and Winterfield. I want to take a look at that store. See if I can find out how anyone can hide any kind of information in three and a half yards of blue surge. There it is. Dark. Yep, come on. What do you think you're going to do? Well, we're going in that store and take a look around. You can't do that. Not without a warrant. All right, Fatty, just so you won't disgrace that lovely badge, I'll go in first, and you can come in and arrest me for breaking and entering. Now, Rick, you wait a minute. Walt, they know I got away. We can't wait. I... Hey. What's the matter? What are you looking at? That car in the alley. What about it? Looks like the one those two killers took me for a ride in. Come on. Well? Huh? Looks like it. Wait a minute, I took a shot at it, and maybe I can... Wait, I'll light a match. Uh-huh. Yes, sir, here it is. Nice little bullet hole. Well, I'll be... I think one of my little headhunters is in that building. Still want to get a warrant? Let's go. How are we going to get in? Oh, you'll figure something out. You're really a second-story man at heart. Rick, wait a minute. What is it? Look at this. Isn't that blood? Hmm. Huh. Looks like both of them are here. Leads right in the door. Locked. Let's go around back. We ducked around back and spent the next ten minutes jimmying the window. And Walt couldn't have been more professional if he'd done time in Sing Sing. He jimmed it without a sound and knew just how to disconnect the alarm. We squeezed through and dropped to the floor. We were in a basement, and from somewhere in another part of the building, we could hear a radio playing softly. We went up the steps to the first floor and stopped to listen. The radio was to our left, down a long corridor. We stayed against the wall and edged our way toward a door at the end of the hall. A thin strip of light showed at the crack, and we moved up and listened, holding our breath. How are you feeling, Hunks? Well, uh, try and take it easy. And the boss is coming with the doc. They're both in there. Let's take them. Hold it. Music making you feel better, huh? No. No, Gabe. Well, you want something better, maybe? Artie Shaw pick you up, maybe? No. Turn it off. Okay. Now, don't you worry. I'll get that shamus for shooting you. And the boss will be real happy when he sees we got the suit. Okay, let's take them, Walt. Look out behind you, Rick. <laughs> It happened so fast there wasn't any time to think. Suddenly there were two men standing behind us in the hall. By the time the smoke cleared, both of them were down, and Walt and I were shaking like a hula dancer with a hot foot. Then, before we could catch our breath, Gabe came running out. I'll get him, Rick! No, no, I'll get him. You go in and take care of the wounded one. Walt went in after Hunts, and I took off after the other. I caught him just as he dove through the front door. Hold it! Okay! Okay! I'm bleeding! I'm bleeding! All right, all right, let's have it. I'm bleeding. Get a doctor. 
The ambulance is on the way. Now, tell us about it. What do you want to know? We want to know about the suits and about the material. And who the guys are in the hall. One of them's the doctor for Hansia. The other one's the boss. He runs the store. You were getting information out of the country and the Blue Surge material. Yeah. What kind of information? All kinds. Defense plans, radar locations, that kind of stuff. Done all in code numbers. How did they do it? Stuff was invisible, like just drew it on the Blue Surge. When the guy got out of the country, he'd take the suit and dip it in something. Then the right and come out. And when Kingsley got hit by the car, you found out he didn't have the suit? The boss did. How about it, Hans? How do you feel? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, why did you swipe my suit? We was tailing bar. So I'm going to your office. Figured maybe he'd give you the suit. Well, there it is, Rick. How about it, Hans? Your partner telling the truth? Uh, <laughs> you heard him. <laughs> Dick Powell will return in just a minute. What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? Again, a study has been made. Again, this question was asked of doctors all over the country and in every branch of medicine. The brand named most was Camel. Yes, again and again, surveys show that more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Friends, smoke Camels for 30 days and you'll see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. And say, how about giving a carton of camels for Valentine's Day? Makes a swell gift. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camel and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, each week for many years, the makers of camels have been sending gift cigarettes to hospitalized servicemen and veterans in this country. Now, gift camels are also being sent to hospitals overseas. This week's shipping list includes U.S. Naval Hospital, Yokosuka, Japan. Camels are also on their way to Veterans Hospital, Coatesville, Pennsylvania, and Fort Howard, Maryland. U.S. Air Force Hospital, Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas. Now... Until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can soon be seen in his new RKO picture, Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. P.A. stands for two things, Pipe Appeal and Prince Albert. They go hand in hand, for Prince Albert's choice tobacco has a rich flavor and a delightful natural aroma. P.A. is crimped cut for smooth, even burning, and it's specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. Makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? Again, that question has been asked of doctors in all parts of the country, doctors in every branch of medicine, and again, the brand name most is Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette.
here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. It was a cold afternoon in New York. There were six inches of snow in the streets and twice that much in the fire escape outside my window. I looked down at Broadway and watched the miserable pedestrians edging their way over the slippery, ice-covered sidewalks and thought about burning some of my furniture. It was just the day for anything unpleasant. And when the door to my office opened, I turned around to look at one of the most unpleasant sights I'd ever been faced with. Standing in the door was something that looked human. And I used the term human only because I stuck around long enough to find out for sure. He was about six feet and well-dressed in a dark gray overcoat. But his face raised goosebumps from my argyles to my haircut. It was as dark gray as his overcoat, his whole face, his eyes, his lips, and when he spoke, even his tongue. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? I want you to find a man, and I want you to find him in the next five hours. He didn't sit down. He just stood there facing me like a bad dream. I pushed the chair back and got up, as though I had to be standing to protect myself from what was coming. The man I want you to find is named Carnes. He's a science teacher at State College. Is he missing? Would I want him located if he wasn't? Would I have asked you if I'd known the answer to that? How much is your fee, Mr. Diamond? When I know what I'm getting into, a hundred a day in expenses. Yes, five hundred. Find Lewis Carnes in five hours and you get another five hundred. Does it matter if you know what you're getting into? I never go waiting if there's quicksand around. Not even for a thousand dollars? I never like to count money when I'm suffocating. You only have to find Lewis Carnes. I guarantee you'll live through it. And after I find him? You can spend your thousand and forget about it. Why do you want him found? I owe him a debt. I want to pay him. And why do I have to find him in the next five hours? Because that's how long I've got to live. <laughs> Interesting situation? You bet. And that thousand made it about as interesting a situation as I'd ever gotten into. I couldn't take my eyes off of him, standing there as gray as an early morning ghost. I wanted to ask him about his color, but in a business like mine, if a client comes in riding a purple llama, you greet him like everybody rides purple llamas and keep your mouth shut. He handed me the $500 and a card with his business address on it. Roger Vegas, 64 West 110th, studio of modern photography. He backed up two steps, smiled a slow, dead smile, turned and walked out of the office like he was going to look at his own grave. I sat back down and thought about it for a while. And the little voice in the back of my head kept whispering... Don't do it, Diamond. Don't do it, Diamond. Don't do it, Diamond. Oh, shut up. You'll be sorry. What about the thousand dollars? It'll buy you a nice funeral. Eh, uh, peasant. If it ain't Richard Diamond, the overstuffed flatfoot. Well, if it ain't Sergeant Otis, the overstuffed flathead. Oh. No. Someday you'll be sorry. Well, everybody is sooner or later. Think of what your poor mother must have gone through. That ain't funny. I bet your father didn't think so either. Oh. Oh, Rick. Still picking on him? Oh, he'll be picked on until somebody plucks off that other head. What's up? Uh, Walter wants some information. If I can... History on a fellow named Roger Vegas. Here's his card. Also, a Mr. Lewis Carnes, science professor at State College. Well, I'll try. What's it all about? Roger Vegas wants me to find this Lewis Carnes. Wants to pay back a debt. What's unusual about that? I don't know. Oh, but you should see Roger Vegas. 
He'd scare you right into a dozen more ulcers. I doubt it. No room for any more. Well, the ones you've got would hide. You should see this guy, Walt. His face, his, his, his hands are dark gray. What about the rest of them? Now, wouldn't you know it if I got to ask him to take his clothes off? Very funny. What do you mean, he's gray? Well, that's just what he is. Even his eyes. Not just the pupil, but the whole eye. The whole eye? Yep. If he raised his collar, he could stick out his tongue, put a tie pin on it, and wear it with a dark blue suit. His tongue, too? Even his fingernails, his gums. I suppose his hair is plaid. Okay, okay. But if you ever run into this guy in a dark alley, get set to faint. Well, I'll see what I can find out about him. I've got to have the information pretty fast. I've only got four and a half hours to find Lewis Carnes. How come? Because Roger Vegas has only got that long to live. Rick. That's what he told me. A guy with a gray face comes into your office, wants you to find another guy, and tells you you've got to find him in the next four and a half hours because he's going to die. Who's going to die? The guy with the gray face. You didn't say that. You said got to find the guy in the next four and a half hours because he's going to die. Oh, well, you know what I meant. No, no. Vegas gave me five hours. You said four and a half. Well, that was a half an hour ago. Oh, swell. Oh, I'm wasting my time. I've got to find him. The man with the gray face? No, the science professor. Walt, you're getting pretty confused. I'll see you later, huh? I left the 5th precinct, grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later I was walking across the campus of State College. Being Saturday, the big school was quiet and impressive as it stretched out over the dozen acres of snow-covered grounds. I located the administration building and found one lonely student working in the main office. Uh, ahem. <clears throat> yes? Oh. oh. Good afternoon. Looks like it might be. Can I do something for you? Well, uh, yes. I'm, I'm looking for Professor Carnes. Professor Carnes? Mm-hmm. He's uh, in the science department, isn't he? The professor hasn't been on campus since last Thursday. The faculty's been rather worried. You don't know where I could find him? No, but I'm through here in half an hour. I could help you look. <laughs> I bet you could. You know where the professor lives? It's on file. Well, why don't you be a good little freshman? And junior. A junior, and get me his address from that file. Because it's more fun not being a good little junior. And the college has certain rules. Well, then be a bad little junior and break the rules. I'm off in half an hour. Might be able to then. I've got to find a science professor, dear. And until I do, I'm afraid I'll have to pass the extension course in biology. And if you find the professor? Uh, we'll talk about it. I'm in here every afternoon. Hmm. College hasn't changed a bit since my days. Just jumped into second gear. The cute little junior walked her sweater and saddle shoes over to a long file and came back with Professor Kahn's home address. I thanked her, promised she could wear my gold badge if she passed lunch hour and took my cab back to town. At the professor's house, I met his sister, an elderly lady named Drusilla, who reminded me of my math teacher at PS 14. I haven't seen my brother since Friday morning, Mr. Diamond. And you have no idea where I can find him? No. Why do you want to find him? Well, I, uh, I'm a private detective, Miss Carnes. I, I was hired by a man named Vegas. Oh. oh, you know him? I most certainly do. Did he hire you to find my brother? That's right. He's not a good man, Mr. Diamond. I believe he's the reason my brother disappeared. Maybe you better tell me about it. My brother married a girl many years younger than himself, and unfortunately, it was not a good marriage. Did this Vegas person mention my brother's wife? No, he just told me he wanted to find the professor in order to pay him a debt. A debt? That's what he said. Watch out for that man, Mr. Diamond. He broke up my brother's marriage. Well, uh, maybe I'd better talk to your brother's wife. That would be impossible. My brother's wife killed herself. Oh, well, that's uh, too bad. My brother and I believe she killed herself because of that man, Vegas. My brother found out they were seeing each other. When he begged her to stop, she said that it was impossible and refused to give a reason. A week later, she killed herself. Have you ever seen Mr. Vegas? No, I have not. Why? Well, I was just wondering why any woman would go for a man like him. Unless she liked ghosts. <laughs> I left Drusilla Carnes and looked at my watch. 
It was three o'clock, and I had only two hours left to find the professor and earn my thousand dollars. On the way to the nearest phone booth, I thought about the case and wondered if the thousand dollars would be worth it in the long run. I watched part of my last five bucks drop in the phone and decided it was. Lieutenant Levinson, homicide. Diamond, Walt. I want to know about a suicide. Otis won't do it. Uh, Professor Carnes' wife. I thought so. I checked for you in Vegas and the professor. The professor's wife jumped off a building five days ago. What did you find out about Vegas and the professor? Not much. At the inquest, the professor accused Vegas of breaking up his home and driving his wife to suicide. Neither man's got a record. Vegas is a professional photographer, and the professor has been teaching at State College for the past 11 years. I talked with some of the men at the inquest, and they remembered Vegas. They all say his skin looked pretty healthy at the time. Do me a favor, Walt. Check with the coroner and find out what would turn a man's skin that color. Sure. Got any leads on the professor yet? No, but he got a hunch. I just left his sister's, and uh, she doesn't seem at all worried about her brother's disappearance. So? So if she isn't worried, there's a good chance she knows he's all right. And if she knows he's all right, she might know where he is. Oh, no wonder they made you a Lieutenant Walt. You keep thinking like that, and someday you might even take over for Sergeant Otis. Bye. I left the phone booth and walked back toward Drusilla Kahn's house. I staked myself out across the street in a corner gas station and warmed my blue little ears inside while I waited for the good Drusilla to contact her brother. I was just guessing, but it worked. Ten minutes later, Drusilla, dressed in a heavy fur coat that looked like it should be out on the river building a dam, walked out of her house and hailed a cab. I hailed one, too, and followed. Fifteen minutes later, I was back on the campus of State College. I watched her get out, walk around back of one of the buildings, knock on a door. She waited until someone opened it, and then she disappeared inside. I tried the door, but it was locked again. So I toured the building. The front door was locked, too. I set to work trying to pick the lock. I broke a Boy Scout knife half a dozen fingernails, and several bobby pins that for some strange reason had found their way into my coat pocket. So I did the next best thing. I went back to the door that Drusilla had entered earlier and waited. Five frozen minutes later, the door opened and I stood there facing Drusilla while her look melted every icicle within ten feet. Standing directly behind her was a small man his breath showing clearly against the cold air, coming in short gasps. Drusilla. It's all right, Lewis. What do you want, Mr. Diamond? Nothing now, Miss Carnes. I have found it. Is that the man, Drusilla? Yes. He's a detective. Vegas hired him. It's all right, Drusilla. If Vegas wants to find me, I'm tired of hiding. Tell Vegas that I'll be waiting here, young man. Lewis, you know what he'll do. It's all right. Vegas knows he's only got a few hours left. Has that strange color of his skin got something to do with it? Yes. Have you seen him since the inquest, Professor? No. Well, that's funny. How did you know about his skin and that he only has a few hours left to live? Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here is an important question. What do you look for in a cigarette? Well, most people say flavor and mildness. Those are two things you'll find in camels. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor. The flavor of costly tobaccos, properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this conclusive evidence of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test... Hundreds of people smoked only camels for 30 days. Each week, noted throat specialists examined the throats of these smokers and reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Yes, that's proof of mildness based on day-in, day-out smoking, not just a sniff or a puff. Make your own 30-day camel mildness test, the sensible test, the thorough test. You'll enjoy Camel's rich, full flavor from first puff to last. You'll see just how mild Camel's are. And you'll know why more people smoke Camel's than any other cigarette. 
How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, I'd found the professor, and the thousand dollars was close to being mine. All I had to do was notify Vegas and collect. Even the professor guaranteed to help by staying and waiting for Vegas. But something was wrong. Standing there in the snow, looking at the timid professor, something began to smell to high heaven. I turned and walked away. Even if the professor was going to run, what was I supposed to do? carry him piggyback until I located my dying client. The thousand was important, but there was a lot more that had to be solved in a hurry. I went back to town and over to the photography shop run by Roger Vegas. Yeah, um, just something I... What's the matter? Huh? Oh, uh, nothing. Nothing. Uh, can I do something for you? I'm looking for Roger Vegas. Oh, he ain't in. And I seen you someplace. You might have. I move around. Where can I find Vegas? He ain't here. I know he ain't. Where can I find him? Home, I guess. Home. That would be somewhere in New York, huh? I, uh, I supposed to give out the address of who wants him. I do, and I ain't supposed to give out the name. Uh, you're pretty sharp. Sharp guy, huh? Tell him to call Richard Diamond. Rich? Richard Diamond. My family thought it up. Okay. You know me now? No. No, I was mistaken. Well, I'm surprised. I sent you to Sing Sing ten years ago. The professor's hiding in the school? That's right, Walt. In the basement of the science building. I just left Roger Vegas' photography shop, and guess who was working there? Who? George Youngwell. Youngwell? The guy you sent up on that blackmail rap. Ten years ago. Well, I knew he was out, but I haven't heard anything about him in a couple of years. Well, he's working for Vegas. Must be keeping his nose clean. Oh, I've seen cleaner noses on pigs. Somebody want me? No. What is it, you melon head? Well, gee, don't yell at me like that. I got something more on Roger Vegas. Well, do you want to hand it to me, or would you just like to stand there and throw it? Oh. Gee, I wish you'd stay away from Diamond. Every time you see him, you get meaner and meaner. Come on, come on. What do you got? Here. Ain't nothing much. Robbery detail come up with it. Huh. That photography shop was broken into this morning, Rick. Oh, it was? Yeah, burglary got some prints on the windows. Belongs to some guy named Carnes. Carnes? Yeah. Says here, checked prints with State License Bureau. Prints belong to one Lewis Carnes, professor of science at State College. I'll see you later. Rick. Yeah? I nearly forgot. I checked with the coroner, told him about the color of Vegas' skin. He said that it could only be caused by a strong dose of silver salts. Silver salts? Poisoning known as Perinia. P-Y-R-I-N-N-I-A. Silver salts. Uh-huh. They used that in a photography shop. The coroner said a man would have to drink about 30 grains for a fatal dosage. That's quite a bit. Hmm. Can you tell you how long he'd live? Yeah, anywhere from six to eight hours, according to the dosage. First, the victim turns gray, then green. About what time was that photography shop broken into, Walt? Oh, sometime before nine this morning, before they opened up. Mm, Thanks. Where are you going? Going to talk to George Youngwell and then find out if my gray client has turned green yet. Hello, George. I told him, Diamond. I told him you wanted to see him. He said he was going over to your office. Oh, thanks. Look, what are you looking at me like that for? I'm going straight now. Swell. I got a good job, see? Legit. I don't want no trouble. I don't blame you. Okay. Mr. Vegas has gone over to your place. Why don't you go meet him, huh? Plenty of time. Look, he's in a hurry. He's got a big trouble, and he's got to take care of it in a hurry. Yeah, I know. He's got about an hour. Well, go on, go on. He, he paid you, didn't he? What do you do around here, George? Now, listen. Listen, you. I know my rights. I'm clean. 
I don't know what you're trying to prove, but I don't buy none of it. Now, get out of here or I'll call a straight cop. You know why Vegas is going to die in an hour, George? Yeah. No, no, I don't. If I did, I don't have to tell you nothing. Nothing, see? Maybe you know why he wants to find the professor. No. Maybe you knew the professor's wife. No. Maybe you know why she got killed. No, no, no. Get out of here, Diamond. Get out. I'm clean. I'm legit now. Yeah, like a tub of mud. What do you mean? I want you to tell me about Vegas. What about him? What about him? He owns the shop, that's all. He makes pictures. What else does he do? Nothing, nothing that I know of. What else he does, I don't know about. He... What are you doing? Get away from me. I want to know all about it, George. I think I know most of it. I want to know the rest. No, I don't know. No, get away. I'm not a cop anymore, remember? I don't have to play the rules. You can't scare me. You won't get rough. You ain't a cop. It's right to lock you up if you get rough. Get away. I want to know why the professor's wife got killed. I don't know. I swear. I don't know. She she jumped. She jumped off the building. I thought you said you didn't know. Get away. No, please. Please. I could figure everything but the wife. If she jumps, she had to have a reason. When I saw you, George, I got the idea. Please, please. Blackmail, maybe, George. I'm legit, I told you. I'm working Blackmail here. Blackmail with pictures, maybe? No, no. The dirtiest racket in the business. Diamond, no. You're going to tell me, George, I wish you were dead. I'm not telling you anything. Blackmail's the dirtiest racket I can think of. No, please, please, please. If Vegas finds a professor, he'll kill him. I've got an hour to stop a murder. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. Okay, we were blackmailing the wife. Phony pictures? Yeah. How many others? How many others? A lot of them. Lots. Okay, George. Let's get down to the station. I hate to get in the rut, but I'm going to see that you get another ten years. I hauled George Youngwell down to the precinct and went back to see the professor. He gave me some very interesting information. Interesting enough to make me call Walt and set up a plan. Then I went back to my office. When I walked in, I found Roger Vegas facing me. He turned an ugly shade of green, all but the gun in his hand. Where is he, Diamond? I've got less than an hour. I just left George Youngwell at the 5th Precinct. He's singing like a quartet. I thought that would happen, but I'm not worried. You've got plenty of poison, huh? That's right. You've had it for about seven and a half hours, ever since the professor broke into your store and made you drink the silver sauce. Yes. He was getting even for his wife. I've got about 40 minutes to live. Where is he? Well, if you're short on time, maybe you'd better start looking. No, I don't think so. You're going to show me. No, I don't think so. I can't argue. I guess you won't live through it after all. Oh, uh, no. Wait a minute. Let's not lose our heads. He's uh, at the college. Don't lie to me. He's in the science building, in the basement. You're coming along. It'll take 30 minutes to get there. If you're lying, I've got five minutes left to kill you. I think that's plenty of time. The professor's in this building. Is it open? It should be. Go ahead. Stop. I can't see anything. The lights are out. If you're lying to me, Diamond, if he's not here... He's here. Call him. Okay. Oh, well, Professor. Professor Carnes. Yes? Oh. He's in the back room. Tell him to come in. Will you come in here, Professor? Who is it? It's Diamond. The detective? Get him in here. Yes, Professor. All right. Yes, what is it, Mr. Diamond? I... Hello, Professor. Vegas. Yes. Surprise. No. No, I knew you'd hired this detective. I knew you'd come. Not too late, eh? Huh? All right, Professor. I've got but five minutes, so you're going to die before me. You're a pretty terrible man. Look who's talking. Break into my store, pull a gun on me, make me drink that stuff. You're a killer and you're going to pay for it. I'm not a killer yet. I haven't got the time to talk about it. You won't get away with it. You think you pulled it off just great, don't you? Well, I'm not only going to kill you, but I'm going to tell you something. I want to see how you take it. I got a little additional revenge, Professor. Your wife didn't jump. I pushed her. I don't believe it. She was going to stop paying me. Going to tell you about the pictures I was blackmailing her with. Well, I couldn't have that. So I pushed her off the roof. That's all I wanted to know, Vegas. What do you mean? Walt. <laughs> Very nice, Lieutenant Levinson. Here's his gun. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Get up, Vegas. You cheated me. 
But you've got to take him. He made me drink this stuff. Oh, relax. You're going to be all right. You're crazy. I'm going to die, but he'll be the murderer. It's a little satisfaction anyway. You'll hang, Professor. Tell him, Professor. You lose all the way around, Vegas. What do you mean? It takes 30 grains of silver salt to be fatal. I only gave you 15. No. Oh. In another few hours, you'll return to your natural color. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh. Don't be so unhappy, Vegas. You tried so hard to die, I think the state will do everything they can to see that you make it. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. And among the millions of camel smokers are many stars who know the importance of mildness in a cigarette because their voices are their living. Our own Dick Powell has been a camel smoker for a good long time. Is that right, Dick? Yes, it is, Ed, and I'm smoking one right now. Well, you're in good company. Among other stars who smoke camels are John Wayne, Risa Stevens, Ezio Pinza, Martha Tilton, and so on. Friends, find out for yourself how mild and flavorful a cigarette can be. Make the camel 30-day test, and you'll know why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test, and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. You know, ladies and gentlemen, no one deserves our appreciation more than the hospitalized men and women of our armed forces. As a tribute to them, the Camel people send gift cigarettes each week to servicemen's and veterans' hospitals in this country and also to overseas where our fighting men are hospitalized. This week, Camels go to veterans' hospitals, American Lake, Washington, and Fort Bayard, New Mexico, U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Stoneman, California, U.S. Naval Hospital Ship, Repose. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. <whistles> Dick Powell will soon be seen in the RKO picture, Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. Men, for pipe pleasure, get the National Joy Smoke, Prince Albert. P.A. has a rich flavor and wonderful natural fragrance. It's crimp cut for cool, smooth smoking and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. You'll enjoy Prince Albert, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI, follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. can a cigarette be? One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how mild a cigarette is, how well it agrees with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and you'll see just how mild a cigarette can be. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. (laughs) 
Diamond Detective Agency. Diamond, that's a girl's best friend, you know. Not this girl anymore. Oh, Helen, hi. Hi, you stinker. Hmm? Where were you all day yesterday? Oh, well, you'll never guess what happened. No. Nine o'clock City Hall. They told me I have to renew my license. Cost $200. Go on, I'm listening, but I'm not sympathetic. Ten o'clock, my bank withdrew $2.35, the wad. Well, big oaks from Little Acorns Grove. Exactly, that was the idea. So 11 o'clock, my brokers, pawn that is, deposited typewriter, watch ring, one thirty, Louis Barbershop. A lie, you had a haircut two days ago. And I was trimmed again. Louis' tip on the 7th should have been read backwards. Rick, do you mean you still haven't renewed your license and you lost all the money you raised on your things? Honey, not only that, I lost a lot of faith in Louie. What I need is a good client with $200, and I... Oh. Uh, this might be the one. She's wearing mink. And she's got nice black eyes. Uh, Rick, I'll loan you $200. Tell her to take her eyes somewhere else. Uh, sorry, honey. The eyes have it. Bye. Well, uh, may I help you? Is your name Richard Dunn? I'm thinking of changing it to Richard Zircon, but what can I do for you? Will you work for me, please? Here. Three hundred dollars. Lady, I'll die for you. He was always so nice. Then this morning I met him at the house for coffee and told him what I found out. Suppose you start from the beginning and we'll see what we can do about him. Sit down. I don't know how I could be so stupid. They were just using me. I've made a terrible mistake. Uh, we all make mistakes. I'm in desperate trouble, Mr. Diamond. I... What's wrong with you? You're shivering. From Brooklyn, I felt... It hurts! What is it? What, what? Help me, Mr. Diamond! Please! Please! Help me! She fell into my arms, tearing at her stomach, as if she'd just swallowed hot milk. She was still trying to talk when I let her down to the floor and ran out for some water. When I came back five seconds later, she was unconscious. And in another five seconds, she was dead. Ah, if it ain't Richard Diamond, defective detective. <laughs> and your name, Sonny? Why, it's me, Otis, Sergeant Otis. You know me, Rick. Oh, yes, yes, Sergeant Otis. I didn't recognize you there for a minute. You had an intelligent look on your face. Oh, you think that's funny, don't you? Well, let me tell you something really funny. Well, do. Personnel division tells me if you don't get up 200 bucks by midnight, you're going to be an ex-private detective. One of the reasons why I'm here, Otis, old buddy. Now, on your lunch hour, trot up to personnel and tell them about the color of this. Eww. Where'd you get all the scratch? For my client. But she's dead. Uh, well, go ahead, say it. She's dead. But dead or alive, she hired me and paid me, and I'm still working for her. Here, you can take it upstairs and cover my license fee for me. Oh, all right. Now, try to smile through those tears. There you are. Two hundred. All counted. You won't have to take off your shoes. Okay, I'll take it up for you. Uh, hey, uh, about that dame, Diamond... You, you know, I gotta see you. Otis, Otis, there's smoke coming out of your ears. I told you that would happen if you ever tried to think for yourself. Now, where's Levinson? Lieutenant's across the hall in the medical examiner's office. I'll go get him. Uh, never mind, I'll do it myself. You might lose your way. Oh, you can talk like that. Hello, Rick. Glad you dropped by. Hi, Walt. What did you find out about the girl? Medics just finished with her. It was Zynethal killed her. Xynethol? That's new to me. It's a drug. Petrol base. Been in her stomach about an hour. Judging from the way she acted and talked, it could have been suicide. Hmm. What's her name? Haven't made it yet. Don't know who she is? You need some new talent around here, Walt. Well, there's no identification. Prints haven't lined up with anything yet. Too bad, huh? Real nice-looking kid. I agreed. She was a nice-looking kid kind you wait all year long to ask to the senior prom. Watching her die that morning hadn't been easy. It was like standing helpless in the middle of a sudden blizzard that wipes out the flowers of an early spring. When I got back to my office, I was still wondering who she was and how I could help her. Hi, Ricky boy. I've been waiting for you. Oh, hello, Bridgie. 
Isn't it a little late in the day to be cleaning up my office? Oh, I finished swabbing it down a few minutes ago. I was just waiting to uh, get... Sorry, Bridgie. No canasta this afternoon. Don't feel like it. Well, me neither. Got to take my banjo lesson in half an hour. Waited around to give you this. What, uh... Found this purse lying in your waist basket. One of your girlies must have knocked it off the edge of your desk. Uh, give it to me, will you? Maybe that wasn't the mink coat I seen come in this morning. Hmm. <laughs> It was hers, all right. The faint, sweet odor of her perfume still clung to it. But it wasn't the lipstick, comb, small change, and key that made it so heavy. It was the 32 revolver inside, three bullets recently fired. A driver's license told me her name was Doris Romano, and it gave an address. Nobody was home. The lady next door dropped her mop long enough to wheeze out where Mr. Romano worked. I twisted my way down an iron stairway into a furnace room. Doris Romano's father was taking huge bites out of a coal pile with an outside shovel. I told him his daughter was dead. He slammed the furnace door and threw down the shovel. I knew someday I would hear this. You look like a nice young man. Like my two daughters once a nice young ladies. They went away from me a long time ago, and I'm left here. There is nothing I could do. There is nothing I can do. It's as if they never were. It's better that I go on shoveling until there is no more coal, and I die too. I'm better dead. <laughs> I took Mr. Romano down to the coroner's office and he identified her body. Later, I told Walt about the purse and turned it over to him. Everything but the 32 and the key. Maybe it was the wrong way to play it, but somehow I felt I could still give Doris Romano the help she'd wanted. She said that she had taken a taxi from Brooklyn. So Diamond went to Brooklyn. <laughs> I don't know how many cab stands there are in Brooklyn, but I can tell you where you can find 104 of them. Sorry, but I got a fare. Where, under the floorboards? In there, eating. I'm looking for information. Here. Ah, gumboots, huh? Who's getting cheated? Did you carry a brunette in a mink coat all the way to Manhattan sometime this morning? Maybe. Where'd you pick her up? Brooklyn, house on M Street. What house? How's a little all expense account? Well, here's a fin. Oh, no. That's all there is. Only one to a customer. Okay, I'll tell you about the house, but I won't tell you about the guy. What guy? You sure only one to a customer? Well, let's say we had a change in management. Okay, now tell me about the guy. Uh, tall, dark-haired, blue suit kind. He was sort of chasing her when she climbed into me cab. Looked like a mesh. Hmm. With spring still two months away? Come on, take me to the house. Uh, it's the gray one, 900 block. Find it yourself like I told you. I got a fair. I found the house easy enough. There was a for sale sign on it. The door was locked, so I walked around and back and peeked in the kitchen window. Then I remembered I still had the key that had been in Doris's purse. Ah, it worked. Inside, the order of tar or printer's ink or something along those lines hit me. I was just starting to sniff around when a tall blue suit eased himself in through the kitchen door. He looked at me like I was breathing some air that belonged to him. You could use your GI loan. You ought to buy it. It's a real steal. Oh, thanks. I'm just looking. Well, we charge for that, too. Oh. Well, I, uh, I don't think she'd like it. Your wife? No. Just a girl in a mink coat. Name of Doris Romano. Where'd you get the key to this house? From her. It was in her will. She's dead. I'll get my black suit pressed. I met a cab driver who says he knows you. Said you'd been doing a chase scene with Doris Romano early this morning. Mister, when I chase a girl, I catch her. I suppose you've got a name. Yeah. Yeah, it's Joe Riley. I own this house, or if you're a buyer, okay. If not, cop a heel. Well, I'm not a buyer. Then blow. Oh, I didn't know Lugers came that big. Mm-hmm. And they make holes to match. Yeah, I imagine so. 
All right, Pilgrim, you got a name? For me or you? Mm. School isn't out yet. Just answer. Well, there's Richard Diamond, private detective. She came to my office this morning. What'd she have to say? Nothing. She died of poisoning before she could say anything. And the police? They have her body and identification. Well, goody for them. That all? There's still you. Any cop who wants me can find me listed in the book. I got a permit for this gun and I haven't got a record. You see, Diamond, I could blow your head off for trespassing. But I'm a real nice guy, so just get out and forget you saw me. Well, that won't be hard. Half an hour later, I picked up the evening paper, and the lead story stuck out like a white derby on an undertaker. It was about an unidentified man pulled out of the river that afternoon. The coroner had picked three 32 slugs out of him. What is it, Rick? Well, uh, about this guy they pulled out of the river. Anything on him? Why? No, oh, just curiosity. That's uh, a terrible thing. Not just three 32 slugs, but they'd been filed down the center. Dum-dums? Dum-dums. Tore the poor guy all apart. Everybody in the department's plenty sore. You want to see the body? Uh, some of the time. I know what it would look like. As I left Walt's office, I felt like I was standing on a trap door and the warden had just smiled at the hangman. But I had to take Doris Romano's 32 out of my pocket and look at it. The three remaining bullets were all filed right down the center. Dum-dums. Everybody had a right to be sore, especially me. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. That's right. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. You'll find the reason in two words. Flavor and mildness. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor. The flavor of costly tobaccos, properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Singing stars know the importance of mildness in a cigarette, and that's why so many of them smoke camels. Ezio Pinza, Nadine Connor, Patrice Munsell, Mario Lanza, are a few of the operatic stars who choose camels every time. Friends, make the sensible cigarette test. Make your own camel 30-day test and see how mild, how flavorful, how enjoyable a cigarette can be. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. It was hard to picture my angel-faced client pumping dumb, dumb bullets into some guy and tossing him in the drink, but that's the way it looked. I had no choice but to turn the gun and bullets over to Lieutenant Walt Levinson for investigation. And the aftermath was something only a hurricane would understand. He acted like an historian who'd caught George Washington telling a lie. Well, I guess this kind of proves who knows what who was talking about, doesn't it, Rick? All right, so who's on first? Want me to tell you what's on second? I don't want you to tell me anything because I know everything now. You know, they could use you in some very high official circles. Go ahead, make jokes. I didn't know I had. A man is found in the river with dum-dum bullets in him. She's carrying the gun that did it. Her fingerprints were on it. And then she commits suicide. Remorse. Ah, oh, baloney. Why did she come to my office to die? Why, when she didn't even know me, was I the last person on the earth she chose to see if she committed suicide? Dames in love want to make a big show. Publicity. Go out with a three-column spread. Then why didn't she drop down on the city desk of the graphic? They'd have printed the story in real blood. Hers. 
You were a lot closer than the graphic. Now, Walt, Walt, I'm going to explain this to you patiently. Mm -hmm. I've seen women of every kind, hard, soft, sweet, warm, cheap, treacherous, mean. But I've never known a woman to lie in your arms dying, look up at you with the most innocent black eyes in the world and ask you to help her after she had just come fresh from killing a man. Psychology, I don't know. But evidence, I do. If she went to all that trouble to get rid of the body, why didn't she get rid of the gun, too? Well, I don't know. Oh, Walt, this is the sweetest double cross since the three-way stretch. Somebody planted that gun on her. Now, if you can keep it out of the papers, somebody's going to wonder why the gun wasn't found and come looking for it. Will you give that theory a try? And I suppose you'll be waiting for them with a butterfly net. I'll be waiting for them with a picture of that girl's black eyes in the back of my head. What do you say? Well... Thanks, Walt. Personnel told me that the gun had been purchased by American Trust and Loan Company in 1941 and permitted to a bank messenger named Dale F. Bronson. The address was an apartment on 63rd Street. When I saw all the expensive cars out in front, I was thinking I should have been a bank messenger. When she answered the door, I knew it. Pure gold. Well, hello. Tall, aren't you? Well, I do my best. Somehow I knew you'd belong to one of those cars out in front. Which one? Longest low convertible. What can I do for you? Oh, well, I'll rephrase the answer. I'd like to talk inside. It's terribly early for me to receive strangers. Oh, well, I sent my hourglass to the Sahara for checkup. Besides, my watch is broken. Come on in. I'll see if I can fix it. I'm great with a Swiss movement. Hmm, it shows. Are you Mrs. Bronson? Yes, and my name's Kitty. Kitty? Oh, nice. That's too bad I have to say this, but I'd like to see your husband. Preferably before he sees me and draws the right conclusion. He's not here. Expect him? You're going to love this. No. Where is he? He's in a place where nothing matters anymore. Cemetery. Sorry. Don't be. He stuck his neck out and tried to be a hero one day. Somebody shot him and stole the money he was carrying. You don't seem to miss him much. I'm still wearing black. Right color, Kitty, but wrong cut. It's a new philosophy I've worked out. I understand he worked for the American Trust and Lawn. They uh, bought him a gun. Don't tell me you're here to talk about guns. Who sent you? Field and stream? Well, this is a sort of a collector's item. Recognize him? No, should I? It belonged to your husband. You say it was my husband's? I suppose it was. I don't know for sure. We only stayed together a year. He had a lot of things. After he was killed, what happened to those things? I don't know. He moved in with his mother. She probably disposed of them. I'd like to talk to his mother. Where could I find her? <laughs> this just isn't your night. She's in the cemetery. Next to him. Heart failure. Well, I'll wash up, get my pay, and go home. Just who are you? Richard Diamond. You can call me Richard Diamond. Detective? Fridays. Arrest me. Mm -mm. Not until you commit a felony. This is only a misdemeanor. You're a sergeant? Five-star general. Run my own outfit. Come here. Hmm. My application for the auxiliary. Pass. Uh, uh, fail. If we ever open a recreation center, I'll let you know. <coughs> Outside, where things were milder, I lit up a camel and tried to think of something smart. Then I began looking around for a cab. And that was my first mistake. Two bulky forms slid in behind me, and we walked Indian file for a few steps. When we reached the alley, I turned around to see who it might be. Ooh! That was my second mistake. I didn't have time to make any more. All right, Rennie. Drag him down this alley. Now, prop him up against the wall. I hope we don't chip none of these bricks with his head. <laughs> hey, Diamond... I know it's hard for you to see right now, but can you hear me? You've got a lot of punch in that delivery. Do you get it? <clears throat> if I didn't get it before, I, I just got it then. Yeah, I just got one thing to say. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. I 
went out of business about two punches later. At an ice age later, a yellow cat with one bad eye began licking my face. I guess he thought I was something left over from Toot Shores. When I dissolved back in, I was lying on a soft, white bed in police emergency hospital. Lieutenant Walt Levinson was leaning over me. He looked sad and puzzled, like he was trying to pick a lock with a wet hair. Rick. Rick, it's me. Oh, I, I can hear you, Walt. You've got a mouthful of firecrackers. One of the radio cars found you lying in an alley. What happened? Oh, that's a bright question. Will I even rate a little sympathy? Why should you? Nine times out of ten, you ask for it. And get it. Now, look, Walt, there's, a, there's an irritated tone in your voice that isn't on the scale. Ask somebody to get me my pants, will you? You can't walk out of here in your condition. I got work to do. My client still has a bad name. Yeah, it's even worse now. You know, besides being overconfident, you're overconfident. Rick, Rick, that body with the dum-dum's been identified. His name's Sam Gulliver, treasury agent. Treasury agent? Yeah, he'd been after your client for a couple of months for passing bad money. Looks like he moved in to make the pinch and she shot him. Bad money? Bad money? Oh, Walt, uh, what time is it? Quarter of twelve. Why? Hmm. Well, I guess I'm 15 minutes away from being out of business. I used her daughter to renew my license fee. Well, I'd pay it for you myself if you could tell me who she'd been working with. Well, dig, Walt. I know a gray house in Brooklyn that just reeks of printer's ink. And I know a guy named Joe Riley who's probably got some skin knuckles. Oh? Well, do I get my pants now? I filled Walt in with some of the details on our way over there. He took it pretty hard. But the thought of talking to a live suspect thrilled him. I knew it would. We slipped down the alley and back of the place and cut our lights. The house was dark and quiet. No one stopped us when we let ourselves in the basement door. The smell of printer's ink was still strong. Throw the flash over there against that wall, Rick. Hey. A whole basement full of evidence. Plates, prints, machinery. You hit it, Rick. Now all we need is Riley. Just above us, the whole world began to explode. I took the stairs three at a time, walked right behind me. We ran to the front of the house, and from the window we saw a long, low convertible that looked familiar, streaking from the curb. I was making a lunge through the doorway when I tripped over a former acquaintance. Hi, hi, you nosy. How's tricks? Riley. You, you must be made out of rubber. I thought I bounced you for at least 20 hours so that we could get... Uh, uh, I'll get an ambulance, Rick. Uh, no hurry, Walt. He wouldn't know the difference. I better get a pickup out on that car we just saw pull away. Uh, I bet I find it before you do. Huh? You got a corpse here, Walt. Let me have my fun. I used the cab to get back over to 63rd Street. The same kind of expensive cars were still parked out in front. Only one of them, a long, low convertible, had a very hot radiator. Oh, it's you. Tell me how tall I am, Kitty. Well, I'd love to, but not right now. I was kind of hoping we could have a drink. Got any hemlock? I said later. I'm really tired. I said now. You... Well, you are eager. What do you want? A poor dumb kid who knew she'd been used asked me to help her this morning, just before she dropped dead, and I'm helping her. I just happen to be fresh out of medals. You shot Joe Riley less than half an hour ago. Uh, now, don't uh... reach for it, lady. I'd like a good excuse. Let me go. Doris Romano didn't know she was passing bad money for you and your boyfriend, Riley. When the agent tried to make the arrest, either you or Riley shot him. And then Doris knew the whole setup. And you knew she was scared. Joe Riley poisoned her. I didn't do it. I didn't want him to do it, and he was dumb enough to think it was clever to plant the gun in her purse. But you didn't kill Riley for being so dumb. You had a better reason, Kitty. I talked to a coal shoveler in a basement this morning. He was bitter about both his daughters going wrong. One of them was Doris. The other was you. Those black eyes give you away right now. All right. Look, I have a lot of money. Real money. Good money. Enough for two of us. We could do anything, go anywhere. Be a chance to stop gumshoeing around and be somebody. And Ricky, you know how I am. 
I can be nice. Awful nice. That's what scares me, Kitty. Now listen to me. They'll send me to prison. I'll grow old and ugly there. If you're lucky. Oh, Rick, please. Please let me go. I'll give you all the money. I'll do anything. Please. Please help me. You know, lady, for a minute you sounded just like your sister. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. In a repeated nationwide survey, doctors in every branch of medicine have been asked this question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Friends, try Camels and see why so many people say, once a Camel smoker, always a Camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, any way that we can help make the lives of our hospitalized servicemen and veterans happier is always gratifying. The way the Camel cigarette people have been doing it is with gift cigarettes sent to service hospitals around the country and overseas. This week, the Camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Roanoke, Virginia, and Northport, New York. U.S. Air Force Hospital, Alaskan Air Command. U.S. Naval Hospital, St. Albans, New York. The Camel people have now sent more than 194 million cigarettes to service men, service women, and veterans. Now, until next week, enjoy Camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen in the RKO picture, Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by John Michael Hayes and E. Jack Newman with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. Men, pack your pipes with Prince Albert, the national joy smoke. P.A.'s choice tobacco is rich and flavorful with a fine natural aroma. It's crimp cut for smooth, even burning, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Get Prince Albert, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Make your own camel 30-day test, the one sensible, thorough cigarette test. You'll enjoy the rich, full flavor of camels' costly tobaccos. You'll see just how mild a cigarette can be day after day, pack after pack. And you'll know why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, the ham and mayhem. It's mayhem. Not if it ruins a gag. Hi, Helen. Hi. What are you doing? Oh, trying to spot a client. I've done everything to get somebody up here. Set traps. Hung out of the window by my toes. Nothing. Oh, is it that bad, Rick? Has been for a week. 
Can I come over tonight and cry on your shoulder? I'd love it. Better wear a bathing suit. Are you going to cry that much? No, but the bathing suit will sure make me feel a lot better. You idiot. Yeah, I can't help it. I try so hard. Are you really coming over? If I cry long enough, I'll work up a heck of an appetite. I'll have Francis fix you a good dinner. I'll pay you back for the first client I get. We'll eat out? No, I'll have Francis fix you dinner. <laughs> what time will you be over? Uh, Mr. Diamond? Rick? Shh. I think I've spotted one. Client? I'm afraid to ask. It might scare him away. Are you Richard Diamond, the private detective? Are you interested in hiring him? I certainly am. Rick? We just made a score, baby. I'll see you tonight. Oh, wonderful. Bye. Well, uh, come in, sir. Come in. No sense in standing in a draft. Might catch pneumonia before we get around to my fee. Uh, my name is John Alistair. Well, sit down, Mr. Alistair. Pull up a wallet, a uh, uh, chair. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, what can I do for you? Uh, quite a lot, I hope. Two days ago, I made arrangements for my own assassination. Huh? It's really very simple. Well, so am I sometimes. Maybe you better be a little bit more specific. Well, I was bankrupt, in danger of going to prison. Uh, I have a family, a wife and two children. And an insurance policy. That's right. Mm. If I was to be killed, my family would be well taken care of. You said you were in danger of going to prison. Why? Well, I'll be perfectly honest. I embezzled money from my firm. Oh, embezzlement. Well, you can get a lot of years for that. Yes. So I decided to do away with myself, leaving instructions for my wife to replace the stolen funds. She could live quite comfortably on the rest. I knew suicide would revoke the insurance policy, so I went to the only underworld character I knew, a, a man named Gimpy. A long time ago, he'd been my bootlegger. Oh, yeah, I know. I nearly poisoned me once. I told Gimpy I wanted to hire a man to kill me, a professional assassin. Gimpy said it could be done, and I gave him $200. I told Gimpy to take care of the arrangements and not to tell me anything about the man who was going to kill me. I didn't want to know a thing. How it would be done or when. Well, what do you want me for? Well, something has happened. My wife's brother arrived last week from South America, a very wealthy man, and advanced me enough money to pay back the firm and make a fresh start. Well, then go tell Gimpy to call the gunman off. Have you read the morning papers, Mr. Diamond? No. Here, yeah, front page. Gimpy was shot to death last night. Oh, oh. Kind of tough, then, to tell Gimpy to call it off, hmm? I want you to find whoever Gimpy hired and stop him from killing me. Find a man with the only clue to his identity lying dead in the morgue? He could be one of 50 professional killers wandering the streets. One of 50 who would make it tough to be found, even if you just wanted the time of the day. Who can you find him? I don't know. I can try. You must find him before he kills me. Well, I'll try my best. In the meantime, you stay here and lock yourself in. In this office? Yep, right here. Don't even let your wife know where you are. All right, if, if you think it's necessary. Oh, I think it is. And, uh, <clears throat> by the way, I, I charge a hundred a day in expenses. I guess his brother-in-law had given him enough money for a high-priced private detective because he handed me a hundred dollars and agreed to lock my door and not answer it for anyone but me. I left the office and headed for the Skid Row Bistro where Gimpy had died on the dirty floor. It was called the Black and Red, and the bartender was wearing an apron that looked like he'd been making hash on it. Yeah, Gimpy got killed here. Right over there, the clean spot near the bar. He bled a little. You know who gunned him? What am I answering your questions for? Because I'm asking him. That ain't enough. I got a fetish for living. Hmm. I'm a, I'm a private cop. Well, that's the worst thing you could have said. You better buy a beer or take a walk, huh? Oh, I'll buy. You don't even have to change the ten bucks. You think I'd tell you something for a lousy ten fish? Yeah. Well, you're wrong. I don't know nothing. You were in here, weren't you? Yeah. On my stomach behind the bar. You saw it start, didn't you? You want me to tell you as much as I know? Unless you want to play another tune. We could dance. Ten bucks for what I know? You don't think it's worth it, huh? Nah. But I seen the ten and it made me greedy. Okay. Here. Live a little. Thanks. Well, Gimpy was standing over there drinking a beer. These two guys come in, and one of them walks up to him. What did they look like? Two guys, big guys, hats, coats with the collars stained up, the whole bit. Looked like just what they was. This one guy started arguing with Gimpy about some money. You hear the conversation? Yeah, something about wanting all the 200. Well, Gimpy gets a little nasty. He was like that, you know, a nasty little guy. Well, the guy gets tired of arguing and pulls a gun. Gimpy tries to climb the bar, and he must have been halfway over when a guy cut him in two. By then, I was flat on my face waiting for mine. But these two guys took off, and I called the cops. Wait the ten. 
You don't remember what either one of the guys looked like? Nah, I was mine to my help. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, hey. Yeah? Uh, I don't know whether it means nothing, but the guy who killed Gimpy was wearing a small red flower in his buttonhole. A red flower like a rosebud. I remember it. <laughs> Funny a guy like that should be wearing a pretty flower. Oh, what do you want? Why, Sergeant Otis, you've been taking your ugly pills again. Can't you ever do anything without the department's help? I thought you were supposed to be a big, smart private detective. Well, we all make mistakes. I thought you were supposed to be a gorilla. Oh, you did, huh? Yeah, but gorillas get bigger. Oh. Hello, Up. Hello, Rick. What can I do for you? I got a little problem. Your department handled that killing over in the Black and Red Saloon? Skid Row? Yeah. Yeah, a small-time guy named Gimpy got himself blown up. Mm-hmm. Any line on the killer? No, we questioned the bartender who runs the place. He was lying on his face. Couldn't give much of a description. But checking up on Gimpy's friends and associates. The killer wore a small red flower in his buttonhole. Maybe a rose. How do you know? Bartender told me. Thought maybe you knew about it. Well, he didn't tell me. What are you interested in Gimpy for? Uh, he contacted the killer. I've got to find the killer, and I don't know who he is. You think maybe this guy with the flower is your boy? Well, he might be. Bartender said he was arguing with Gimpy about $200. Well, no, he didn't tell me that either. Just said they were arguing. You should have slipped him ten bucks. What do you have to find him for? Client. You got a client who wants you to find a killer? Yeah, and that's all I'm going to tell you. Now, give me what you got on Gimpy and his friends. I don't know why I should. Oh, stop pouting, fatty. I can't tell you anymore. Besides, if I find this killer, you solve the Gimpy killing, don't you? Well, yeah. Well, then let's have it. Okay. Gimpy didn't have many friends. The only sure one we've come up with is a woman named Belle DeCanto. Runs a small dancing school. Have you talked to her? Yeah, but she knows less than the bartender. Here's the address. Walt gave me Belle DeCanto's address and I went over. It was an old two-story building on the east side with a rickety flight of stairs leading up to the dance studio. Belle DeCanto was sitting at the piano. I stood there smoking a camel watched one of her young pupils perform a pretty sloppy set of turns. All right, Jeannie, that was fine. Over to the bar. Okay. Hey. Huh? Well, somebody. Oh, what can I do for you? I want to talk to you, Belle. Twenty bucks for ten lessons. I just want to talk. Why don't you take the lessons, mister? Gives you grace and balance. I look a little silly in tights, dear. Go do your exercises, Jeannie. Okay. But I still think you'd look great in tights, mister. We could do Swan Lake and things. I bet we could. Talk him into it, Belle. He's real cute. What do you want to talk about? Gimpy. You a cop? Private cop. I entertained the whole 5th precinct all morning. I'm looking for the guy who killed Gimpy. I told the cops all I know. I don't know who killed Gimpy. Back straight, honey. Okay. I can't help you, mister. You know a man who wears a red flower in his buttonhole? Huh? Do you know a man who wears a red... I'm busy, mister. I got a lesson. Look, Belle... I don't know nothing. Now beat it. Maybe if I bought a course of lessons. I'm full out. Now get out of here. I told you to keep your back straight. Okay, okay. I'm keeping it. Belle. You gonna get out of here or do I call the law? Oh, Belle, what you throwing him out for? You shut up and keep your back straight. Listen, I'm paying good money around here. Get out now, mister. Okay. What you climbing on me for, huh? So what are you yelling? You'll get up there and do your better or bust this cane over your skull. You'll do what? I told your old lady I'd teach you how to dance, and I will if I have to cripple you trying. You don't yell at me like that. Bye, you lovely people. Bye, honey. You don't yell at me. I paid my money. Who do you think you are? Who? Get up on that bar! Drop dead! <laughs> It was pretty obvious my mention of the man with the red flower had set off Belle DeCanto's charming temper. And it was even more obvious that to Belle, the man with the red flower spelled some kind of trouble. The third and most obvious point was that I wouldn't get anything out of Belle even if I dropped her in a pit full of enraged mice. I started down the steps of the dance studio heading for the street, and I stopped cold. Something on the third step. 
set off little bells in the space in my head reserved for danger. There, on the third step, was a small red rose, and it hadn't been there when I went in. I stopped and thought about it. Maybe the man I wanted was in the building. I looked around. Only one other door besides the studio, and that led to Bell's apartment above. I went up there and looked around. Nothing. Then I got a pretty scary thought. Maybe the man with the red rose had tailed me, waited around listening at the door. If he'd found me, maybe he'd found my client. I spent the next 20 minutes making myself hard to follow, and when I was satisfied no one was tailing me, went back to my office. Alistair. Mr. Alistair. Who is it? It's Diamond. Open up. Uh, how do I know it's Diamond? Well, you are being cautious. You gave me a hundred dollar retainer. I told you to lock yourself in my office and not to answer to anybody but me. Did you find out anything? Uh, close it and lock it. Is something wrong? The man who killed Gimpy was wearing a red flower in his buttonhole. I met an old biddy who runs a dancing school, and when I mentioned the flower, she froze up like a clam in a barrel of glue. <laughs> Who is this man with the flower? I don't know, but before he killed Gimpy, he argued with him about some money. Two hundred dollars. Well, that's the amount I paid Gimpy to hire the assassin. Yeah. I think the man with the flower is probably your killer. And when I left the dance studio, I found this. A red rose? Uh-huh. I think maybe he's tailing me. He knows I came to see you. I don't know. I think he's found out I'm looking for him. Maybe figures I'm trying to catch him for killing Gimpy. Anyway, you're not the only one in the spot now. But what'll we do? If he's looking for me, there's no sense in letting him find you, too. You gotta get out of here. But where? Well, an out of the way hotel I know. Manager's a friend of mine. But what if this killer finds you? That's a good question. I hustled John Alistair out on the fire escape, and we climbed down to the floor below, just in case our boy with the red rose was waiting outside my office. We climbed into the seventh floor hall, made our way to the service elevator, and down to the alley. A half an hour later, I'd deposited Alistair in room number 11 of the Bunker Hill Hotel in charge of the manager, a one-time safecracker named Herman Clip. I'd done a lot of favors for Herman, and he assured me Alistair would be safe and that no one would be allowed to see him unless his name was Diamond and he had the bluest eyes in the private detective business. It was six o'clock by the time I left the hotel, and I kept to the side streets in case the man with the red rose might be close. It was certainly one way of finding him, letting him find me. But I wanted to be ready for it, and I didn't want to be around my client when it happened. I went back to my apartment on 51st Street. Hello, chum. I've been waiting for you. Oh, uh, that's nice. Lonesome? Eh, for a while. You had that nice big gun to keep you company. Sure, sure. Hmm. You forgot to wear your rose. You got the wrong boy, Diamond. Drago's busy. Drago? Name won't do you any good. I'm going to kill you. Drago's the boy with the red rose? Turn on the radio. You were the guy with him in the bar when he killed Gimpy. Yeah, that's right. Turn on the radio. Okay, okay. Look, uh, tell Drago he doesn't have to kill John Alistair. Alistair says to call it off. The radio, the radio. Oh, sure. Will you tell him? See, I tell him, but I don't think he's going to do any good. You see, he knows Alistair talked to you. We know you've been trying to find him, and we don't want anybody who can pin Gimpy's killing on us. I didn't tell Alistair anything. Sure, sure. Well, you got him hidden out, huh? Eh? We find out. Drago shouldn't have knocked off Gimpy like that, but he, he gets excited. Like running out of the bar before he knocked off the bartender. If we had knocked off the bartender right then, he couldn't have told you nothing. What about the bartender? He's in the river. Turn the radio up. I turned the radio up slowly, my mind working triple time. The guy behind me wanted the music to cover the noise, like a funeral march with a one-gun salute. I heard him get up behind me. All right, turn around. It had to be quick. I turned and gave him the radio right in the face. <laughs> I had twisted his gun right into his stomach. 
He looked up at me like a kid who was going to bust out crying because somebody had dumped over his blocks. Then he slid down on his face and died without a sound. I put in a fast call to Walt, told him to check his files for a killer named Drago. I told him what had happened and about the bartender who was probably floating on the river. Then I took off for Bel DeCanto's dance studio. The man I'd just killed had said Drago wasn't going to leave anyone around who might pen the gimpy killing on him. And Drago had left his red rose on the steps outside of Bell's studio. When I got there, the big dance hall was dark. So I went up another flight to Bell's apartment. Well, here goes. Bell was there all right, and Drago had been there. He hadn't left a rose, but he left a bullet instead. It was somewhere in Bell DeCanto's heart. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here is an important question. How mild can a cigarette be? One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how well a cigarette agrees with your throat. Only camels offer you this day in, day out smoking proof. In a coast-to-coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation. Due to smoking camels. Make your own camel 30-day test, the one sensible, thorough cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and let your taste tell you how rich and flavorful camels are, puff after puff, pack after pack. Let your throat tell you how mild camels are, how well camels get along with your throat as a steady smoke. You'll see why people say, once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Well, here's all the information, Rick. The only man we got on file named Drago is a well-known hood named Tommy Drago. Mm -hmm. Seven arrests, two convictions, assault, and armed robbery. Can you find him all? Well, I put out an APB. Maybe we'll pick him up. You find the bartender? They're dragging the river now. Mm -hmm. The guy in your apartment has been identified as Julio Bassadi, arrested once with Drago, supposed to work together. Yeah. Why did Drago kill Bell DeCanto? Well, probably thought I'd told her something. Now we got to get this boy. He's killed three people in two days. And he wants to add two more to his list. Me and my client. Where is your client? Oh, he's staked out in the Bunker Hill Hotel. He's safe. Well, we better pick him up and give him protection. He doesn't want the police brought in. But you can stake out a couple of men near the hotel in case Drago shows up. Right. Look, uh, Walt, if this Drago likes red roses, he must buy them someplace. Yeah? Well, have some men check all the flower shops. Have them circulate the description. <laughs> The rest of the day and into the evening, the entire precinct turned out to look for Drago. Each man had a photograph, and they toured every flower store in the city, showing the photograph and asking questions. Walt and I even took one section, wore out a lot of pavement and several good inches of shoe leather, trying to find someone who might have been selling the roses to Drago. By six o'clock, we were back in the precinct, discouraged, and as Walt said... Oh, I'm beat. Yeah. You want some coffee? Yeah, yeah, might as well. We took in 12 shops. Here. Thanks. Looks like the guy grows his own. Well, maybe he does. Swell, I'll put out a general to pick up every window box and flower pot in the city. We're bound to catch him in 10 or 12 years. Yeah, what do you want, Spikehead? Spikehead? Just thought it up. Oh. Well, did you just want to see if the buzzer works? Uh, no, I got an address on that guy Diamond shot. Julio Bassati? Yeah. Well, do you want us to hold a seance while you give it to us by telepathy? Oh, uh, 456 River Street, apartment 7. 
and you sure are getting grouchy. Walt and I piled into the squad car and took off for 456 River Street. There was a chance that the man who wore the roses might live with his partner, Giulio Bessardi. We found the manager, he led us into the apartment, and after 15 minutes of pretty extensive house wrecking, both Walt and I came to the same conclusion. Giulio Bessardi lived alone and liked it. We hit the street pretty discouraged. Well, come on. Hey, uh, hey, Walt. What is it? Look, that old lady down the street. Well, what about her? She's selling flowers. Oh, now well, I let's go. That's flowers. Twenty cents a bunch. Flowers, gentlemen. Uh, do you have some red roses? I uh, yes. Single red roses that I could wear in my lapel? Yes, 25 cents. Have you ever seen this man? What man? Here. Yes, Mr. Drago. I sell him a red rose every evening, fresh. You know where we can find him? Well, what do you want him for? Police. Has Mr. Drago done something? He's wanted for murder. Oh, no, how terrible. He seemed like such a nice man, so generous, he dressed so nicely. He's killed three people. Three people? Do you know where he lives? Three people? Yes, he lives in the next block. I don't know the number. I'll have to show you. Here, I'll take all the flowers you've got. The old flower woman showed us the building, and again we dragged another manager out to let us into Drago's apartment. This time we went in low, ready to shoot if Drago happened to be home. He wasn't. And once again, we tore another place apart. Find anything? No, not yet. Get a load of this closet. Drago really dresses. Hey, Walt. Yeah? You find something? Ah, look at this telephone pad. What about it? The writing. Read it. Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill Hotel. That's where my client is. Drago's found him. Walt, well, go check for the men you got staked out and see if they spotted Drago going in. I'll go in and see if my client's all right. Right. Herman. Herman. Oh. Rick. Over here, Walt. Herman is out cold. Herman? Yeah, the manager. Oh, he looks pretty bad. Yeah, he's really out. Drago? Your men see anybody? No, but he could have slipped in. Now, let's get up to my client. Well, come on. I'm looking for the key. What room? Eleven. Well, it's gone. I had my client locked in. Come on. Second floor. Here it is. Alistair. Alistair, it's Diamond. Diamond! Diamond, get me out of here! He's been here, he's got a key! Where is he? He tried to get in, but I have the chain lock on. Then he tried to break it down. I pushed the furniture in front of the door. Get me out, please! Just take it easy, we'll try and break it down. The furniture's still there. Well, get it out of the way. Yes, yes. I don't know where he went. Is there a fire escape? Fire escape? Yes. Yes. There's an escape right outside my window. Good heavens, Diamond! Just keep moving the furniture. But... The fire escape! Just move the furniture! Well, yeah. you stay here. I'm going out on the fire escape. It figured. If Drago couldn't get past the furniture, he'd get in another way. I ran to the end of the hall and out on the escape. I turned the corner of the building and started for my client's room. He's on the escape! He's coming down! I can hear him! Get me out! Get me out! At first I thought my client had heard just me. But then I saw him climbing down from the floor above, a gun in his hand, the polished barrel shining in the moonlight. As he reached the window, Alistair went crazy. He's outside the window! No! No, no, please! I leaned against the building and steadied my arm just as he broke the window. No, no! No, no! You killed him! 
You killed him, you killed him. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. Yes. What must have done? Shot him right through his red rose. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. Across the nation, doctors in every branch of medicine have been asked this question. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Again, the brand named most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Yes, and Camels are the favorite cigarette of many stars whose throats are their fortune. Reza Stevens, Mario Lanza, Martha Tilton are a few of the singing stars who choose camels for mildness. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this week we add a new name to the list of recipients of gift camels for hospitalized servicemen and veterans. It's the Military Air Transport Service, United States Air Force, which evacuates virtually all overseas wounded servicemen. Camels are also on the way to Veterans Hospitals, Lake City, Florida, and Nashville, Tennessee. U.S. Naval Hospital Ship Haven. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen starring in the RKO film Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. PA stands for two things, Pipe Appeal and Prince Albert. They go hand in hand. For Prince Albert's choice tobacco has a rich flavor and a delightful natural aroma. PA is crimp cut for smooth, even burning and it's specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Get Prince Albert, the national joy smoke, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI. Follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. Other cigarette has Camel's rich, full flavor, the flavor of Camel's costly tobaccos. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only Camel's for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking Camel's. Make a note. Think of your throat. Try Camel's. transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Now, in my business, I run into a lot of people, make a few friends, and a lot of enemies. I remember a few weeks ago when one of those friends walked all the way over from 31st Street to tell me about his trouble and leave me a share of it. His name is Angelino Giuseppe, and he runs a butcher shop. Little guy with a big, broad stomach and a smile to match. I met him when I was on the force. He used to stop in and buy some cold cuts or a pound of bacon. I liked his smile, and I always hung around for one of his bad jokes. 
But when he came into my office that afternoon, pushing his big stomach in front of him, I spotted trouble right away. The smile was gone. Well, well, Angelino. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Haven't seen you in a long time. Come stay. Uh, sto male, sto male. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Now, well, what's the trouble? The pig's knuckles got arthritis? Pig's knuckles. <laughs> That's better now. That's more like my answer. Uh, you always are kidding. You, you make it easy to smile. Yeah. Assetti. Uh, grazie. Grazie. All right, Angie, let's have it. What's wrong? Well, I'm going to ask you to do something. My, I can't pay you. Hmm? Uh, we'll talk about it later. Uh, you, you can take it out in a trade. That'll run into a lot of ham hocks, Angelino. Well, I want to pay you. Hmm. Well, I can always throw a barbecue. Now tell me about it. Well, you see, it's like this. I come to you as a sort of a representative from all the other butcher shops, uh, the, the independent ones. I see. I ain't the only one that's worried. So all the butchers got together last night and decided to do something about it. All of the uh, independent butcher shops? That's right. Hmm. Every week, a couple of guys come around and collect. Now, if we don't pay, we get our shops bust up, and if that ain't enough, we get our head to bust up too. Hmm. Look, you see, I still got three stitches right here on the top of my head. Hmm. Oh, I see. Well, that's a nice job. Doctor must have used a loom. <laughs> well, I got this last week when these two guys came for the money. Mm -hmm. I couldn't pay, so one of them hit me with a black jack. Oh. It's too bad. What about the law, Angelino? That'd give you the right kind of protection. Well, we discussed that at the meeting, uh, but we decided it was too dangerous. We've been warned. If we go to the police, we get hurt too bad. Mm -hmm. Well, we all got families, Mr. Diamond. We can't take the chance. Now, have the two men who beat you up been back? No, but they will be. Okay, let's go. Well, we're going someplace. Yep, we are going someplace. You don't know it, Angie, but you just hired yourself a new assistant. I have? You certainly have. Come on, I want you to show me how to carve a lox. Well, that's what happens when your reputation gets around the butcher shops. I'd been telling Angelino what a great detective I was for the past ten years, but I should have known he'd never take my word for it, so I had to prove it. We went out, grabbed a cab, and 15 minutes later, I was standing behind the butcher shop counter. Angelino handed me a white apron. I, I, I don't get it. Why you want to be a butcher? Angie, you want me to get a line on these guys who do the collecting, don't you? Why, well, sure. Well, I can only think of two ways. I could watch them and not look suspicious. Make like a butcher, or crawl in with the ground round. <laughs> crawl in. Think of what would happen if someone looked down for the price of ground round and caught it staring back at them? <laughs> it's going to start. That's so funny. <laughs> oh, now, come on, Angie. It wasn't that funny. Well, a big... Oh, oh, oh. Customer. Huh? Nothing like learning firsthand. Let me handle the sale. Well, you think you can? Sure, sure, sure. Here she comes. Oh, uh, good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Oh, good morning, Mr. Angelino. Well, business must be good. I see you have a new butcher. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, the, this uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Hangtooth. Uh, Mr. Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Good morning, Mrs. Hennessy. Is something I can do for you? Oh, uh, yes. How much is uh, the lamb shoulder today? Which one? What? Uh, look, m maybe you better let me... Uh, uh, relax, Angie. I'll make it. Which shoulder would you like, Mrs. Hennessy? Is there a difference, young man? Oh, yes. You see, this lamb here is really a ram. A ram? That's right. Hurt his shoulder playing against the Cardinals last season. We're also selling his shoulder pads at 21 cents a pound. Mr. Angelino. You'll find him hanging in the back with the spare ribs. Now, uh, Mrs. Hennessy, if you can tell me which shoulder you want, I'll wrap it up and send it off tackle between the liver and the... Well, I never... Of course you haven't. That's the trouble with you people. Here's a nice little ram that played his heart out. And... Oh, by the way, the heart is special today, 11 cents a pound. Angie. She's a gone, huh? Like laundry in a tornado. Well, why do you want to do that for, Mr. Diamond? She was one of my best customers. I wanted to get her out of here. I wanted to get her out in a hurry. Just as she came in, I spotted two guys heading this way. When they saw her, they backed off. Look, they're standing across the street right now. Where? Where? Right over there. You see them? In front of the drugstore. Front of the... Aha! Yeah, yeah. That's them. It is? 
They're the ones that hit me. They're the ones that come around collecting. Oh, well, they're coming again. You better duck. I'll take care of it. Well, listen, please, you be careful. They're pretty rough monkeys. Now, go on, Angie, and beat it. They're almost here. All right, all right. I'll, I'll be in the back. Okay. A mile, a mile, a mile can a cigarette be. Make the camel 30-day test and you... Well, good morning, gentlemen. What can I do for you? Hey, where's Angelino? Oh, well, he's out buying some old buffalo. I'm the new assistant. Buffalo? Shut up. Well, tell me, new assistant. When will he be back? Well, it's hard to say, gentlemen. These uh, buffalo are in Wyoming. Oh, yeah? Carl, I think this guy's trying to be funny. You, my friend, wend yourself a lamb chop. How do you have it, with or without the bloomers? Hey, you know, some red, I think you're right. Hey, what's your name, laughing boy? Hangtooth. Hangtooth? Oh, I'm going to have more fun with that. Blows everybody. Well, look, Hangtooth, you know who we are? How many guesses? You won't need even one. We're in a hurry. We're collectors. Oh, well, we put all the scraps out and back in a can. You can't miss it. I don't like you. Well, I have a friend. Maybe we could double date. Look, let's stop the clowning. If Angelina didn't tell you about us, it's going to be too bad for you. We're for some money. We get every week 25 bucks. Yeah, last week Angelino didn't have it, so he accidentally hit his head. We figured that all that blood would make him remember it this week. Well, I'm a sorry friend, but Angie didn't say anything about it. Tell me, what does he pay you boys for? Oh, little things. Protection, mostly. You see, if he'd paid us last week, he wouldn't have hit his head. Hmm. You know something? I know a big, fat cop who would just love to hear all about this protection Angie's paying you for. You do, huh? Yeah, I do, huh? Well, look, seeing as how you're a new boy around here, maybe we ought to tell you first. Why don't you do that? Yeah, let's go in the back. I like it here. I listen better. Oh, you do, huh? Is that all you guys can say? Now get out from behind that counter. I want to explain the thing to you. Yeah. Go on, Red. Explain it to Mr. Hagtooth. Hangtooth. Uh, you'll have to pardon him. He don't hear so well. How's your hearing, Hangtooth? Depends on what I'm listening to. Well, listen to this real good. Seeing as how you're working for Angelino, you're gonna need protection, too. So let's have the 25 bucks. I want to know what I'm buying. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Want to get rough, uh, hang tooth? Hey, you're liable to kill him. Yeah. Uh, let him alone. Hey, we better get out of here. Yeah. We'll come back for Angelino later. Well, you really can't blame brave little old me for going to sleep at that point. One, I could have handled. But in that cramped space behind the counter, with both of them coming from different directions... I had to give it up sooner or later, and I did for about 20 minutes. When I finally snapped out of it, I looked up and saw three heads staring down at me. Two herring with Angelino in the middle. Hey, Mr. Diamond, you, you're right. Oh, lovely. Here, l let me help you get up. Mm. <clears throat> Swell. Now, uh, look for my eyes, will you, Angie? I didn't know what to do. I guess I should have called the police. Oh, find time to tell me. Mm. Ah, let me sit down. My, when I thought about calling the police, I also thought about my family. Those two men might beat up my family just like this. Yeah, I, uh, I guess you're right. Mr. Diamond, please, you better forget about this. It's uh, too dangerous. When they come back, I'll pay them the money and nobody gets hurt. Look, Angie, I can understand why you're scared. Those two headhunters aren't kidding, but you can't let them get away with it. I can and I will. I ain't taking no more chances. First they bust up my shop, and then they bust up me, and now you. No thanks. I got enough. Okay, Angie, but not me. What are you going to do? Well, I got a sore face and a nasty disposition. I won't get back to normal until I find those two guys and tie their necks in a bow. I left Angelino's shop and headed for the 5th Precinct Police Station. I wanted to look up two sure bets for the police gallery. One named Carl and the other Red. 
two guys who went around scaring poor little businessmen like Angelino. By the time I reached the station, the aches from the beating were making me very unhappy. And when I walked into the squad room, I spotted something that didn't make things any better. Yeah, what are you... Holy cow, diamond. Well, Sergeant Otis, I'm glad you noticed. Means I put myself together all right. What happened to you? Uh, don't be silly. I always bleed just before lunch. Well, how did it happen? It wasn't easy. Is the lieutenant in? Sure, go ahead. Well, thanks. Say, uh, Otis, when are you going to start shaving in the morning? Why? What's wrong? Your five o'clock shadow is four hours fast. Oh. Hiya, Walt. Wow. What hit you? Well, the bruises show up. I come on in Technicolor. Someone sure did a good job. Yeah. That someone is two guys, Walt. One named Red and the other Carl. Red and Carl. Yeah. I got closest to Red. Name matches the hair. Busted nose. About 190. Very nasty with a sap. And Carl? Dark. Greasy. Well-dressed, if you like the type. Big boy with a scar under his uh, right eye. I gave Walt the complete descriptions and briefed him on what had happened in Angelino's shop. We went down to the mug file and started going through pictures. Twenty minutes and eight dozen charming photographs later, I found what I was looking for. I showed them to Walt, and he said, Now, oh, you know him? Yeah, Carl Tate and Red Dillon. Here's the package. A dozen arrests, half a dozen convictions between them. Hmm, very impressive. A couple of muscle men. What do they go after you for? I've been pulling a protection racket on some of the independent butcher shops. Who do they work for? Uh, he used to work for Jack Arno before he got sent up. I know they're not working this setup alone. It's too big. No, they wouldn't be. Hey, Tiny Easter's in town. Tiny Easter? Oh, used to be Arno's right-hand boy. That's right. Came in about a month ago. I'd love to get something on him. Nobody's ever been able to nail him. Well, it adds up. Easter worked for Arno, and so did Carl Tate and Red Dillon. Well, we can't pick him up just because two of his boys worked you over. He'd just say they weren't his boys. I don't want him picked up. I want Carl and Red. If Easter goes along with the deal, you could have him. What are you going to do? Get cleaned up and pay Mr. Tiny Easter a visit. What's his address? He's got an office on East 48th Street, 804. Thanks, Walt. Tiny's a bad boy. I'll take along my 38 just in case I have to spank him. I left Walt, went back to my office, took a clean shirt out of the closet, and washed up. Locked up again, went down to the street. I grabbed a cab, and 20 minutes later, I was standing in the reception room of Tiny Easter's office. A big guy with a bulge under his arm was trying to be as unreceptive as possible. So you want to see Easter? You have an appointment? No, I haven't got an appointment. Now, tell Easter I'm out here. What's your name? Oh, you're going to get hung up on this. What do you mean? The name's Hangtooth. What? I see. Now, make like an office boy and tell Easter I got a message for him from Carl and Red. You're a pretty fresh guy, aren't you? Yeah, and I'm going to spoil if I have to stand around much longer. You can spoil rotten for all I care. You're not going to see Easter. He's busy. Okay. You know, you get so excited, you'll ruin your stomach someday. Oh, I don't think so. You don't, huh? <coughs> Skeptic. What do you want? I'm collecting scalps. How'd you get by a lefty? Well, he's tied up with a stomach ache, swallowed a fist. Okay, so you got muscles. Also, you got a pushed-in face. Lefty do that? Carl Tate and his blood brother, Red. Oh? What you come to me for? They're working for you, aren't they? You smell like a cop. Name's Hangtooth. I doubt it. And good for you. I'd hate to go through that again. I'm a private cop. Well, now, nah, good for you. I was in a butcher shop when your two boys wandered in and started playing squash with me. I don't like to get pushed around, Eastern. I don't like your racket. I want Carl and Red, and if I get you along with them, the state will hang a medal on me. Looks like you got nothing to lose. Don't look at it any way you like. Now, what about your two playmates? I don't know what you're talking about, Shamus. Never heard of those two guys. I don't think you understand, Tiny. I'm pretty mad. I'm going to find these two guys, and I'm going to do it even if I have to be unpleasant with you. Just what do you mean by unpleasant, Mr. Hangtooth? You break a leg, that's unpleasant. 
Ow! Don't try to pull a gun on me. You busted my hand. Take your foot off. Drop the gun in the drawer. Okay. My hand's busted. Now take the hand out. Empty. Oh. Now let me explain it again. If you go out and shoot 12 people tomorrow, I'm going to be sore about it. But when you start intimidating a bunch of hard-working little guys and their families, I go off like a skyrocket. And then when a couple of your cheap gunsels push me around, I explode. I tell you, I don't know these guys. Oh! Look, Easter, please believe me. I don't know them. You worked with them in Chicago. Ah! I'm telling you the truth, Easter. I'll work you over till you look like an eggplant in a subway. Look, whatever your name is, I got boys. They'll take care of you. Who's going to tell them to do it? I am. With your jaw broken? Oh! Now, where do I find Carl and Red? Oh, you knock all my teeth loose. I got 31 to go. <laughs> I guess you really don't understand. Yes, yes, I understand. Ooh. Now, where are they? You still need some encouragement? No, no, in the warehouse by the 14th Street docks. What warehouse? Rogers and Sons, big sign on the top. You mind if I use your phone? Go ahead. Don't you know it's not polite to listen, Easter? Well, what do you want me to do? Go to sleep. No! Oh! Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. That's right. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Behind camels' great popularity are the two things that mean steady smoking enjoyment. Flavor and mildness. No other cigarette has the rich, full flavor of Camel's costly tobaccos, tobaccos that are properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only Camel's for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking Camel's. Make your own Camel 30-day test. The sensible test, based not on a puff or a sniff, but on day-in, day-out smoking. You'll see how flavorful camels are and how well camels get along with your throat, pack after pack. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I put in a call to Walt and told him what had happened. He said he'd send a couple of men down to pick up Easter and agreed to meet me at the warehouse. It was getting late in the afternoon when my cab pulled up near the river and I got out. The cold breeze was kicking up little patches of white on the water and the light fog was moving in from the Atlantic as I started down toward a big building with a sign on the top that read, Rogers and Sons Importing. The place was boarded up, but a window in the basement showed signs of recent use, so I jimmied it open and dropped down on the dark, cold pavement. I held my breath and listened. The place was as quiet as a tomb. So I moved across the room until I found a flight of stairs and went up to the main floor. I opened the door and listened again. Hey, it sure is getting cold in here. Yeah. How long are we going to have to stay here? Till Easter tells us to leave. Now relax. It was Carl and Red, all right. They were somewhere in the warehouse, so I kept on my toes and moved as quietly as possible toward the voices. You want to play some cards or something? Yeah, it's okay with me. I don't know why we got to hide out like this. Because Easter said to, that's why. We gotta stay cool till he finds out about that guy we worked over this morning. Hagtooth? Yeah. Might have been a cop. So what? We worked cops over before. I'm cold. Look, just steal a card. Uh, yeah. What? He did, huh? Hey. Hey, what's the matter? Boss! Hey! What's the matter? I know, that was Easter. 
The guy we worked over was in his office, tied him up. He got loose, but the guy's headed down here. Hack to? Yeah. Just as Easter was gonna say what to do, sound like he got in a fight. The cops. Yeah. I think we better get out of here. Good afternoon, boy. Huh? Hack to. Hang to. Come back here, Carl. Uh, help me. You shouldn't have pulled a gun, Red. Since when do you butchers carry rods? Since we get pushed around by guys like you. You're the doctor. I'm shot bad. I can't take it back. They'll all be here in a minute. You, you're a lousy butcher. I hope Carl pays you good. I'll see that he gets the chance to try. I left Red lying on his face and ran toward the front of the building. The only way out was that window in the back, and Carl was sure to be hiding somewhere in the dark, hoping to get around me and head for the basement. There were a dozen places to hide in that warehouse, but I had one advantage. He couldn't see me any better than I could see him. I stopped and listened. Come on, Carl. Red's hurt pretty bad, and the law's on the way. You gotta get me before you can get out of here. Carl! Come on, Carl, give it up. You're stuck and you know it. Carl! I had his position pretty well spotted. By his gun flashes, I could tell he was edging his way toward another large pile of packing cases. I moved off to my left, still keeping his approximate position in line with my gun barrel. It was my idea to circle him, but something changed my mind. A metal ladder stretched down from the ceiling and led up to a catwalk overhead. I went up, one rung at a time, half turned to keep Carl in line in case he made a break. After what seemed like hours, I reached the catwalk and started crawling on my hands and knees toward Carl's position. I was nearly over him when I heard the door open. I couldn't answer him, and he was heading right for Carl. I kept looking down, hoping Carl would show himself. Walt got nearer, and I held my breath. Just then, Carl stepped out and aimed his gun at him. I beat him to it. Ah! Ah! Lieutenant, shut up. It's okay, Walt. I got him. Where are you? I'm up here on the... Oh. There, there he is up there. Red. Good grief. Yeah, good grief. Get Otis out of here, will you? <laughs> What's so funny, Lieutenant? If you knew Otis, you could rib Diamond for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah? Walt. <laughs> come on, tell me what it is. Walt? <laughs> okay, okay. Get out of here, Otis. Oh, Lieutenant. You heard him, Otis, now beat it. Yeah, go on, Otis. Oh, chill. No, he won't. Now you beat it. <laughs> it's real funny, isn't it? <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> I just saved your life and you stand down there and you... Oh. <laughs> well, don't look down. Get the fire department. Don't you ever think about these things before you start climbing ladders? Well, it was the only way I could get in a position to shoot. <laughs> I just didn't think. <laughs> For a guy who can't stand high places. Walt... <laughs> Well, it's your own fault. Fault, small. Get me down. I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> it's only about 50 feet to the floor. Walt! Great big boy like you. If you don't get the fire department. Okay. <laughs> oh, you big fat ox. I hate you. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. According to a repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Again, doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country have been asked what cigarette they smoke. Again, the brand name most was camel. Friends, make the sensible cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days, and you'll see why so many people say, once a camel smoker, 
always a camel smoker. And remember, your best buy is camels by the carton. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Take the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, many men who have served valiantly in our armed forces are hospitalized. And as a tribute, the makers of camels send them gift cigarettes to hospitals in the country and overseas. This week's camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Dallas, Texas, and Phoenix, Arizona, U.S. Naval Hospital, Pensacola, Florida, and to all hospitals operated by the European Command of the U.S. Army. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen starring in the RKO film Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, and Arthur Q. Bryan. Men, whether you buy the handy pocket tin or the big one-pound tin of Prince Albert, you're in for real smoking joy. P.A.'s Choice Tobacco has a rich taste and delightful natural aroma. It's specially treated to ensure against tongue bite, and it's crimp cut for smooth, even, cool smoking. Get Prince Albert, the National Joy Smoke, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Again, this question has been asked of doctors in every branch of medicine. And again, the brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Here, transcribed, is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Being a private detective is like ordering stew in a cheap restaurant. You never know what you're getting until it's too late. It was that way the other morning. I was sitting in my office practicing curtain speeches to my creditors when she came in. She was wearing a casual item that must have caused a sharp dip at the mink population. When she reached my desk, she stopped and her perfume kept moving. She probably noticed the glassy look reaching my eyes because she said, does my perfume bother you, Mr. Diamond? Well, no, no, not at all. My fangs always show like this. Mm -hmm. Le joie. It carries a special guarantee. Well, I won't ask for what. Uh, won't you sit down, Miss... Uh... Not Miss, just Yvonne. It's not my real name, but I find it has a better effect on the trade. The trade? Cosmetics. Perfumes, facial creams, mud packs. Mm. I manufacture them. Mm -hmm. Mostly for women, but... I have a lot of male customers. I'll bet you do. Unfortunately, I've just bought a magnum of shaving lotion myself. Oh, 
Don't be silly, Mr. Diamond. I didn't come here to sell you anything. I'm sure you wouldn't have any need for my products. Uh, we'll save that debate for later. Well, I'll be brief. I'm a woman who likes to come to the point. I can see that. How would a $200 fee sound to you? Like a mirage, but beautiful. Well, here you are. 100 now, the rest when you finish the job. Well, far be it for me to hesitate over money, especially that nice, luxurious shade of green. But don't you think oh, that... Of course, you want to know what you have to do. Mm, it would help. It's very simple. This afternoon, the Ile de France docks in New York. On the ship will be a man named Bouchon. One of your customers? Or is this social? Monsieur Bouchon has developed a wonderful new face cream. He's arranged for me to have the exclusive American rights. Well, that's fine. Where do I come in? Your job starts at 7 tonight. All you do is pick up the sample from Monsieur Bouchon at his hotel and bring it to me. Oh, I see. Uh, do you mind if I look at your legs? Well, no. But I thought we were talking business. We are. Mm-hmm. Well, you've got nice legs, Ivan. They take me where I want to go. Uh, what keeps them from taking you to Bouchon's hotel? You mean pick up the sample myself? I was sure you'd ask that. Well, I did. You don't know the cosmetic industry, Mr. Diamond. My competitors would do anything to get hold of that face cream. They know you expect Bouchon? Only one of them. A ruthless man. Mm. Does he have a name or just a disposition? Robert Mockler. He owns the Venus Beauty Enterprises. And you think he might follow you or take the sample away before you can start to manufacture? So you're paying me $200 to protect it. Oh, Mr. Diamond, I'm going to like you. You're so understanding. Oh, $100 bills make me that way. I'll expect you tonight around 7.30. My job's over when I deliver the sample to you, is that it? Yes. But uh, don't make any plans for the rest of the evening. There's a new perfume I want to try out. She gave me her address in the name of Bouchon's hotel. Then she walked to the door with a motion cats spend years trying to learn. I sat there a while, letting my head clear and my temperature sink to a mere galloping fever. I had a bite of lunch, strolled around most of the afternoon doing things people do to kill time in New York. And it was about four when I climbed the stairs and walked down the hall to my apartment. Au clair de la lune, mon ami Poirot, Oh, she was too old for that anyway. Hey, what is this? Hello, Diamond. Why oh, didn't you knock? Or did you think this was an L station? I knocked, nobody answered. I came in. Now you can go out. How much did she pay you? Who? Yvonne. How much did she pay you to get that face cream sample? I'll bet a mud pack to a permanent your name's Mockler. Yeah. Venus Beauty Enterprises. I'll double what she paid you. Hmm, you want that face cream pretty bad, huh? Bring it to me, huh, Diamond? Are you that interested in cosmetics? It's a business. Do I get that sample? No. Be nice, Diamond. So I can be nice. Well, it'll be a strain for both of us. Triple. I'll give you three times what she paid. Mm -mm. And a bonus on the side. Why don't you get it yourself? Think I'd be here if I knew where Bouchon was? That door, Mr. Mockler, leads to the hall. Use it. I ask you to be nice. Once. The second time, I don't ask. You heard me. Ow. Ow, you take your hands off me. I'm just being nice. <coughs> you, you dirty... Get up. And then get out. All right, Diamond. I'm leaving. You take a hint nicely. I won't forget this. I wouldn't want you to. You just lost yourself a chunk of cash, Diamond. I'm not a very good businessman. It's a habit with me. Well, it's too bad. Might have helped pay the bill. What bill? The Undertaker. Funerals run high these days. He stomped to the door, his face twisted with some private rage that had just become public and left. When face cream got to be that important, it was time for Richard Diamond to start investigating the cosmetic business. I took a shower, dressed neatly in my most continental fashion, and taxied off to visit Monsieur Beauchamp. He was staying at a small hotel in the East 70s, one of those places where the doorman is dressed like an admiral in the Swiss Navy. I ignored the doorman and waded through miles of plush carpet until I found Bouchon's suite. I pushed the buzzer, and when the door opened, I was standing in front of the biggest female this side of a ringing brother's tent. You want something, gentlemen? Uh, Monsieur Bouchon, is he in? Who you been, gentlemen? Uh, Richard Diamond. Come in. 
Well, what's the matter? Is my tie on crooked? Please. Well, the way you're looking at me, maybe my nose is shiny. It's better when you've been really Richard Diamond. Because, gentlemen, if you know Ben Richard Diamond, they Ben break your bones. One bone by one bone. You see, gentlemen? I'm afraid I do. But now, if you'll just... Uh... Ah! Monsieur Diamond. Uh, Monsieur Bouchon, I hope. Ah, name of punctuality, Monsieur Diamond. Exactly on time. I kiss you on one cheek. I kiss you on cheek number two. We can stop it right there. Ah, let me regard you. Ah, oui. It is as Yvonne won't say you will be. So young, so handsome, so viril. I feel like a midget next to your watchdog here. Watchdog? Je ne comprends pas. Ah. Ah, oui, Bertha. She is my masseuse. She makes uh, new muscles as the old. And vice versa on occasion, I suppose. Regard her, Monsieur Diamond. Name of a Swedish smug as bold. Is she not magnifique? Yeah, spellbinding. Now, about that sample I'm supposed to pick up. Ah, but of course, of course, Bertha. Police! In the boudoir, Bertha. There is a jar on the bed, next to my chartreuse dressing gown. Bring it. Yeah, gentlemen. I I wish to tell you, Monsieur Diamond, how pleasant it is to be back in your New York once more. What a truly magnifique city she is to visit. But you wouldn't want to live here. Name of a fortune teller, but you are psychic. How did you know I would say that? I've been hanging around the tourist bureau. I do not understand, but I think you are being droll. Ha, ha, ha. You would have a tiny brandy with me. Some uh, logis du mai, n'est-ce pas? Well, thanks, but I've got a date with a room full of perfume. <sighs> The Yvonne. Naturally, the incomparable Yvonne. Well, I suppose I cannot persuade you to stay. Ah, ah, thank you, Bertha. Please. Here, Monsieur Diamond, is the latest Bouchon creation. That's all? Just this jar? Ah, I have worked so hard on this sample. Oui. How I have labored. You will take good care of it, yes? Well, for 200 bucks, I'd tuck it in bed and sing it a lullaby. Ah, oh, but no. No, no. You must not do that. You must make haste and place the sample in the hands of the lovely Yvonne. Any message to go with it? The sample. She will be message enough. Okay, I'll be seeing you. Of a certainty you will, Monsieur Diamond. Of a certainty. I look back on my way out of the suite. Monsieur Bouchon had an atomizer in each hand, spraying the room with cologne. The expression on his face reminded me of the python who had just swallowed his week's supply of rabbit on the hoof. I snowshoed my way down the street and started to look for a taxi. I didn't have to look far. Hey, Mac! Huh? Over here, Mac! You looking for a hack? That's right. Hop in. 53... Sit down and be nice, Mr. Diamond. Or I'll blow your head off. Well, you leave me a limited choice, Mr. Mockley. That's better. Fine work, Willie. Yeah, pretty neat, huh, Mr. Mockley? I'll answer that, Willie. It was neat. Now I'd like to... Uh-uh, Diamond. I thought you were going to be nice. I'll take that gun. Well, you might give me a gold star for trying. We're fixing your gold star right now. My place, Willie. <laughs> It didn't do any good to tell myself I should have known better. I'd been caught by a trick ten times older than I was. I took a quick look at Mockler's profile just to make sure it was still there. It was. I didn't have to look at his gun. It had found a home between my fourth and fifth rib. We finally pulled up in front of an apartment just off Park Avenue. Mockler herded me across a foyer that might have been cheerful in McKinley's day. He pushed me toward the elevator. All right, get in. Would you mind shifting that gun a bit? My floating ribs run aground. Now, be nice, Diamond. Suits you better than being funny. Well, I was just trying to be pleasant. But if you insist, Don't I... talk so loud. My neighbors are refined. All right. Get out. Aren't you making a lot of fuss over nothing? After all, it's only a jar of face cream. You'd be surprised. No kidding. Any drugstore. Shut up. Oh, nice place. It's a place. All right, give me the sample. Well, just for the record, suppose I say no. You say no, you won't have a record. The sample, Diamond. Get it. My coat pocket. That's right. Oh, I, I, thought, I thought you'd try that. Give me that gun. 
Okay, right between your pretty blue eyes. <clears throat> His gun caught me a glancing blow on the forehead and I went down. I couldn't have been out for more than a few seconds because when I came to, Mockler was still in the room. I tried to get up, but my body had a will of its own. At the moment, what it wanted most was to rest comfortably on the rug. Mockler didn't notice me. He was too busy trying to get the top off the jar. When he finally did... <laughs> Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here's an important question. What's the best way to find out about smoking enjoyment? Well, you won't find out much from one puff or one sniff. It takes day in, day out smoking. Make the sensible, thorough cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days. You'll discover how rich and flavorful camels are pack after pack. You'll find how mild camels are, how well they agree with your throat week after week. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. No other cigarette gives you this conclusive proof of mildness. And no other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor, the flavor of costly tobaccos, properly aged and expertly blended. So make your own camel 30-day test, the sensible test. You'll enjoy every puff, and you'll see why so many people say, once a camel smoker, always a camel smoker. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Take the camel 30-day test, and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Rick. Rick. Mm -hmm. Rick, come on, boy. Wake up. Oh. Oh. Wow. Did they say nice things about me, Walt? Who? The preacher. The one who read my funeral service. Oh. This is a hospital, and you're not dead. Oh. You mean I've got to go all through that again? Why you're not dead is something I'll never know. What happened? You tell me, Walt. Well, we got a call an hour ago to come to the apartment of a guy named Mockler. There'd been an explosion. You were stretched out on what was left of the floor. Oh, that potent face cream. Face cream? You sure you're awake, Rick? I'm awake, Al. What about Mockler? Well, he was around the apartment. I might say all around. Oh, so it was a booby trap. Booby trap? What's this all about? Walt, Walt, are those my pants on the chair? Well, what's left of them? Uh, throw them over, will you? Now, wait a minute, Rick. Aren't you going to tell me what's going on? Sure, sure. A Frenchman named Bouchon was trying to blow up a girl named Yvonne with a jar of face cream. That face cream again. Maybe you better stay here a while, huh? Look, Walt, nothing makes sense yet. That's the first sensible thing you've sensed since you woke up. Give me time to ask a few people some questions. How would it be if I asked him? You wouldn't get the same answers. All right, Rick. We'll give it a try. I'll call you as soon as I've made a visit. Don't wait too long. There's a murder rap crying for a head to fall on. I checked out of the hospital and walked a few blocks to shake the India rubber out of my legs. I knew it wouldn't do any good, but I ducked into a phone booth and called Bouchon's hotel. And as I expected, he'd pulled out a couple of hours before. The manager had no idea where he'd gone. There was only one place left for me to go... And it was a little after ten when Yvonne opened her door for me. I could tell by the quiet music on the radio that she didn't know what had happened. The way she greeted me bolstered up my deduction. Well, hello. Do come in, Mr. Diamond. Thanks. Aren't you afraid of catching cold in that thing? You mean this negligee? I wore it specially for you. I've been waiting a long time. Too long. Hmm. Well, you just missed waiting a lot longer. <laughs> that Monsieur Bouchon, so talkative. He has a few other qualities. Come sit down. 
Here on the chaise longue, next to me. Well, I, uh, I hate to make a detour, but let's get the sad news over with first. Oh? Something's gone wrong? Oh, you almost got it. Nothing's gone right. I should have known. Your clothes are... You ought to see what your face cream did to Mockler's clothes. Mockler? Did he get that sample? Uh, he had it for a few minutes, if that's what you mean. <sighs> Mr. Diamond, if I didn't like you, I'd be very angry. Well, you shouldn't be. When Mockler opened that sample, he got very dead. It was a bomb. I, I, I don't understand. The, the, the face cream Monsieur Bouchon gave you was a bomb? No, not quite, no. The bomb Monsieur gave me was a bomb. Just a minute, Mr. Diamond. Let me turn off this radio. You... You don't know how this upsets me. I know. I was upset myself this evening, violently. Oh, you poor boy. Well, no. Well, that helps. Hand me that bag, please, there on the coffee table. Well, if... If you want a handkerchief... No, I have what I'm looking for. Here, Mr. Diamond. One hundred dollars. The other half of your fee. No. Oh, does an explanation come of that? I'm sure you'll excuse me until another time. Won't you? Well, when you say it like that, I... I'm sorry. I was so looking forward to... Good night, Mr. Diamond. There were a few reasons why I'd like to have hung around. But I could tell this just wasn't my night. So I left Ivan called Walt and told him he could forward the bill for Mockler's murder to Monsieur Bouchon if he could find him. Then I crawled into a little bistro on 53rd Street to relax and count my hundred dollar bills. I was on my second cup of coffee and third Campbell's cigarette when it came to me. Like the paraphrase of an old song, Bouchon knew that I knew. If he'd been foolish enough to let me be messenger for his booby trap, it was a sense she wouldn't be foolish for very long. As long as I was walking around in one piece, Bouchon could never feel safe. I could have dodged him, maybe for a long time, but I decided it would be better to see him when he wanted to see me. I went home and made myself available. At 11.35, the walls of my room started to shudder when somebody pounded on the door. I didn't have any doubts about who it was. Oh, be careful, will you? It's just mahogany. It's only me, gentlemen, Bertha. I couldn't possibly have guessed. Please. Oh, never mind. What do you want? Monsieur Bouchon, the haven, send me. Well, it'll be a tight squeeze, but won't you come in? You come out, gentlemen. Okay, just as soon as I get my coat. You know, Ben, need your coat, gentlemen. Well, it's right over here. You, you come been... now, gentlemen. I will assist your arm. <clears throat> Please. Oh, nothing, nothing. I always thought my arm bent the other way. It's better this way. It's healthy for mm. bones. You come now, gentlemen. Please. She put a little more pressure on my arm and led me down the stairs. She was so clumsy, I could have taken her with a few artful motions, but Bouchon had sent her, and I wanted to see Bouchon. When we reached the street, Berta grabbed my other arm. We made an interesting entrance into a taxi, which took us to a shabby apartment house on Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village. Berta adjusted her half Nelson and we climbed three flights of stairs. The end of our little pilgrimage was a pair of termite-ridden rooms, which I never would have associated with a fastidious Frenchman. Bouchon was not there, and Berta didn't seem to know what to do with me. Then her eyes lighted up. She angled me across the room, pulled open a door, Looked at me brightly and said... Is bathroom, gentlemen? Well, thanks. I brushed my teeth this evening. Go in. Where's Bouchon? It's not good. You been asked questions. Go in. Well, we'll wait out here. It's more comfortable inside. If you know Ben, go inside. I've been glad to assist you. I was ready to argue the point when I looked in the bathroom and saw a table full of bottles and jars. So I let Berta shove me inside and lock the door behind me. Then I walked over to the table. Next to a bottle labeled Valley of Indecision Cologne stood a jar, exactly like the booby trap Bouchon had given me earlier in the evening. I picked it up, decided that forever was a long time to live, and opened it. This time it really was face cream. I poked my fingers around in the jar to see what made it so wonderful. 
when I pulled them out, things suddenly became a lot clearer. Because just under the top layer of face cream was buried the biggest blue sapphire I had ever seen. I wiped it off and slipped it into my pocket just about the time the outer door opened. Bertha? It was Bouchon. And he didn't waste time starting in on Bertha. Bertha, where is this diamond? You have not brought him. Eh, then bring him. But I do not see him. Eh, then bring him. Alors, where is he? Where is he? Eh, lock him in the bathroom. In the bathroom? Oh, mon dieu, mon dieu. Unlock the door. Eh, then get the key. I had to do something, and I had to do it fast. I looked around. Then in the bathtub, I saw what I wanted. One of those rubber hoses with a shower attachment that can be pointed in any direction. I turned on the hot water full blast and waited. Monsieur Damon! Monsieur Bouchon? Mon Dieu, the steam I cannot see! Here I am! Ah! Oh, I am scalded! You have burnt me! <clears throat> Give me that gun! Oh, mon Dieu! Ah, that's right! Now stand back! Gentlemen! All right, Bertha, turn off that water! Oh, I am scalded! Ah, you'll live! Oh, that was some face cream. Mon Dieu, the sapphire, you have taken it. You won't need it, Bouchon. They'd just take it away from you before they put you in the chair. I persuaded Bouchon, with the help of his gun, which I was holding, to tie a Bertha. Then I knotted some bright red French neckties around his hands and feet and surveyed the situation. There was no phone in the apartment. So I locked the two of them in and raced down to a drugstore on the corner. I caught the owner just as he was closing and put in a call to Walt. Then I doubled back to the apartment to keep Bouchon and Bertha company. I thought it was funny that the door was open when I had locked it so carefully. I stopped thinking it was funny when I walked through the door straight into the barrel of an ugly automatic. Hello, Mr. Diamond. Well, Ivan. You're just in time. We're going to start a treasure hunt. He has it. He is the one. Monsieur Bouchon seems to think you picked up a sapphire by mistake, Mr. Diamond. Probably in the excitement of the evening. It is true. All what I tell, it is true. You hear what Monsieur Bouchon says. But Monsieur Bouchon tried to kill me tonight. Maybe he also lies. No, 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 he took it. Name of a thief. Oh, do be quiet, Monsieur Bouchon. You disturb us. Well, Mr. Diamond? Oh, come on, Ivan. You're taking this thing much too seriously. Mr. Diamond, I've said repeatedly that I like you, but that won't stop me from shooting you, if I have to. Now you are intense, aren't you? I've risked a lot to get that stone. Let's not make it more difficult. Well, uh, you haven't asked Berta what she knows. Berta? Sure. Go ahead, ask her. All right. What do you know about the sapphire, Berta? Please! Oh, Mr. Diamond... I believe you're pulling my leg. Oh, please. I've got a good answer, but I'm afraid this isn't the time. Do you have the sapphire? Mm, for want of a better word, mm, yes. Give it to me. Oh, Grandma, what a greedy voice you've developed. You're wasting time. Only in a manner of speaking. Come on, Diamond, I'm right, not... Hold, <laughs> hold it where you are. <sighs> drop the gun, miss. Go ahead, drop it. Well, you certainly took your time, Fatty. I got here as fast as I could. I was just running out of words, wasn't I, Yvonne? Mm -hmm. You know something, Mr. Diamond. Tell me, dear. I'm sure I'll hate myself in the morning. But it's funny. I still like you. Well, when we got on to it, the whole thing was really pretty simple. Yvon and Bouchon were running a fancy smuggling racket under a cosmetics cover. Bouchon wanted to make it a one-man operation. So he tried to dissolve the partnership the hard way by killing Yvon. It didn't work because Mockler found out about the sapphire, got in the way, and stopped the bomb intended for Yvon. Monsieur Bouchon summed the whole thing up rather neatly on the way to the station house. He said, Mon Dieu, I should have stood in France. <laughs> Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Yes, more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. Among the millions of camel smokers are many stars whose throats are their fortunes. Stars like Reza Stevens, Patrice Munsell, Mario Lanza, 
great singers who insist on mildness in their cigarette and find it in camels. Friends, make the sensible cigarette test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and see how mild, how flavorful, how thoroughly enjoyable a cigarette can be. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've ever spent any length of time in a hospital bed, you know how a gift can cheer you up. Every week, the camel people send gift cigarettes to our hospitalized veterans and servicemen, both in this country and overseas. This week's free camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Downey, Illinois, and Indianapolis, Indiana. Army and Navy General Hospital, Hot Springs, Arkansas. U.S. Naval Hospital Ship, Consolation. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen starring in RKO's Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Charles E. Israel with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Arthur Q. Bryan, Joan Banks, James Backus, Theodore Van Elts, and Sheldon Leonard. Then, there's pleasure in every pipeful of Prince Albert, the national joy smoke. PA's choice tobacco has a rich flavor and a fine, natural fragrance. It's crimp cut for smooth, even burning, and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Get Prince Albert, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. How mild can a cigarette be? One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how mild a cigarette is, how well it agrees with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test, the thorough test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and see just how mild a cigarette can be. Here, transcribed, is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was cold out, and it had been raining. When it got a little warmer, it would probably snow. The whole city was covered with a heavy sheet of ice, and the steam heat in my office gurgled and clouded up the windows. I was feeling pretty good. I was warm. I'd had one client in the past week, and my bank account was on its way to recovery, and a good breakfast in the drugstore downstairs had made me comfortable and drowsy. I put my feet up on the desk, leaned back in my chair, and closed my eyes. Diamond? Mr. Diamond? I must have been napping and didn't know it. I hadn't heard the door open, but there he stood, framed in the door, resting his weight on the jam, and looking across the room at me with tired eyes. Mr. Diamond? Uh, oh yes, uh, what can I do for you? My name is Abel Gunther. I want to hire you. All right, Mr. Gunther, I charge a hundred a day in expenses. I don't think I can pay it. I can pay you some, but I don't think I can pay you that much. Well, that's my fee for you or Rockefeller. I got expenses. I see. Well, I'll keep looking. I need help. Perhaps you could recommend someone? Uh, you'll pardon me for saying so, but you don't look too well, Mr. Gunther. I'm 
pretty sick, Mr. Dam. Maybe you'd better sit down and tell me what your problem is. I can't afford the money. That's all right. Tell me about it anyway. I think I had better sit down. Yes, you better. What's wrong? You got the flu or something? <laughs> no, no. I'm afraid it's a little more serious. Would you really like to hear my story? I think I really would. I'm a farmer, Mr. Diamond. My home is Haiti, near Saint-Lazare. Haiti? Yes. The West Indies. I, I was born there, raised there. My parents died when I was 13. I have a wife. She's there now, and she's the main reason I have come here seeking help. My wife is dying, Mr. Diamond. I must get help quickly before it is too late. I have a farm. He kept talking, telling me about his life on Haiti. He told me about his farm, a fairly good-sized farm by his description. He told me how in the past two years things began to go wrong on his farm. And soon all the farms First, in the area fires. were also having the trouble. The cane fields would burn every year. Then it was the cattle. One by one they became sick. Then my wife and now me. And you don't know what's wrong with either of you, huh? Yes and no. My Christian religion fights it, but my life on Haiti has taught me deep respect for it. Respect for what? Voodoo, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I, I know just what you're thinking. But a doctor in Haiti has examined my wife and can find nothing wrong. Well, I don't particularly believe in anything like that, Mr. Gunther. But if you do, why have you come to me? I said I have a healthy respect for it. I don't entirely believe it, but some of the things I've seen make it difficult to disbelieve. I came to you because I suspect a possibility of something more. Immediately after my wife was taken ill, I received an offer from my farm, a very low offer from a Saint-Léger banker. I investigated, found it had been made in the interests of one Arthur Cotswold. Arthur Cotswold? Haiti's biggest planter. Oh. Well, how about the other farmers? They received offers like mine. Being the oldest farmer, the rest looked to me for guidance. I told them to wait. Then I came here to hire someone to look into the matter. Would you like some water? No. No, thank you. I'm all right. Uh, anyone else become ill besides you and your wife? Yes. Several others. I... I have $368 in my ticket home. The money is yours if you will go to Haiti and investigate. Have you been to a doctor here in New York? No. Mr. Diamond here's directions how to get to my farm. My servant, little Shiva, is there. No one knows I came. Mr. Gunther. <laughs> Mr. Gunther. Levinson Homicide. Uh, hello, Walt. Oh, Rick. Yeah. Better get up to my office. I've got a dead man for you. Are you kidding? That's what Gunther told me. Voodoo? Voodoo smoodoo. That's what the man said. Now, steady, boy. Oh, stop but... it, Walt. You know I don't believe it. But you're going down to Haiti. Well, somebody's got to tell the wife. The local authorities can do that. Hey. No, what's the matter? The local authorities in Haiti. Why didn't Gunther go to them if he thought there was something phony about the setup? You want an opinion? If you can strain one out. Well, Gunther probably didn't go to the Haiti authorities because he knew they'd think just what you're thinking. Okay, so I'm crazy. Well, Gunther died in my office. He came a long way for help, and the poor guy wanted to give me his last $368. So I'm going to Haiti. I'll send you a zombie. Walt promised to send a wire and care of the authorities in saint Leger as soon as he got an autopsy report on Mr. Gunther, and I headed to the airline's ticket office. By 8 o'clock that evening, I was in an airline's flagship at 12,000 feet heading for the West Indies and Haiti. The trip wasn't bad. We landed in Miami, where I grabbed a cup of coffee and then climbed aboard a clipper for Port au Prince. At Port au Prince, I took a bus to Saint Leger, and from there, a beaten up taxi to the Gunther Farm, about 10 miles into the country. As we neared the farm, I could see a crowd of people standing around in front of the house. And as I climbed out of the cab and approached them, they turned and their hushed conversations were suddenly stilled. I didn't know what it was. No one said a word. But something was wrong. I could feel it. I walked through the crowd to the house and stopped cold as the door opened. Who are you? I'd never seen anything like him. He was a native and he ducked his head as he stepped out of the door to face me. 
He was a good seven feet tall, or maybe more, and must have weighed close to 300. He stood on his bare feet, his long, muscled arms hanging loosely at his sides, and looked at me with dark, shining eyes. Me, little Chiva, who are you? Oh, me, very little Richard Diamond. Mr. Gunther hired me to come here. You from New York? Oh, yes. Mr. Gunther couldn't come back. He died. That's right. How did you know? Uh, you come in? Uh, sure. What are all those people doing out there? Their friends, madam. She died too. <laughs> Little Chiva led the way into the bedroom where Mrs. Gunther lay on the bed, covered with a fresh white sheet, her eyes closed in death, her face drawn and tired. Little Chiva told me she had died the day before, about three in the afternoon, and a cold chill ran up my back. I remembered her husband lying on the floor of my office about three o'clock in the afternoon, the day before. What do you do here? Uh, Mr. Gunther wanted me to find out why the cattle are getting sick, why the fields are burning, why he and his wife became ill. Bad voodoo. Well, he thought it might have something to do with a man named Cotswold. He big man. What are those drums? For madam and mister. They voodoo. Good voodoo. Give blessing for spirit for madam and mister. Oh. You, uh... You see, little chief of the mister, uh, uh... Mr. Gunther wanted me to help him... He paid me money to help him and died asking for help. I'm going to try and do what I can. The madam and Mr. Good people teach little Chiva. They take little Chiva when he's small boy and make good life. You good man, little Chiva help you. Right then I inherited little Chiva. And if there was going to be any trouble, the giant servant would certainly help to make up the difference. The first thing I wanted to do was contact the local authorities in saint Leger. And little Chiva told me my man was one Inspector Laplanche. A very fine person, Mr. Gunther. I'm sorry he's dead. Well, how'd everybody know he was dead? On Haiti, things of such nature are never a secret. The natives know. Voodoo? Being a stranger to Haiti, Mr. Diamond, I expect you to be a skeptic. But uh, you believe in voodoo? Let us say I have been in it too long not to believe. Well, Gunther thought the whole thing might have something to do with a man named Cotswold. I would suggest you forget Mr. Cotswold. Then I suggest you give me a good reason to forget him. Mr. Cotswold is a very big man on Haiti, the largest plantation owner in the West Indies, and a self-made man with a considerable temper. Well, thanks for the advice, Inspector. But supposing I come up with something incriminating? If Mr. Cotswold has breached the law, it would certainly be my duty to arrest him. But I am not considering the arrest. More, the necessary steps that would have to be taken to prove the guilt. Dangerous steps, Mr. Diamond. One might trip on those steps. And break his neck. Yes. <laughs> you like the middle of the road, huh? It is much easier to see what is ahead. It's possible to get run down from behind. I do as much as I can to prevent that possibility. Example... My suggestion, you forget, Mr. Cotswold. I left the philosophical inspector and went outside where little Chiva had been waiting. Every time I looked at Chiva, it was like a little kid spotting the Empire State for the first time. He smiled a mouthful of white teeth as he said, The inspector, he say forget Mr. Cotswold. That's right. What do you think, little Chiva? I think I do what you want. You know what I want? You want to go see Cotswold? Hmm. Think I'm crazy? You're not afraid. You're not strong like little Chiva. But little Chiva think of all the men he know. You would fight hardest. I don't like to fight little Chiva. Little Chiva know that. We go see Cotswold. Little Chiva led the way up a long, narrow road surrounded on both sides by high sugarcane fields. Somewhere from... Not too far away, I heard the drums start again. Little Chiva stopped, looked off to the north. He began moving his shoulders, slowly keeping time to the steady rhythm of the drums. He began to sing softly. Oh, hey, oh, hey, say Papa New Keep a Posse. 
What does that mean, little Jiva? It means in your language, it is our Papa who passes. Papa? Papa Dambala, the great source. Voodoo? Yes. Later I must leave you. Today is Wednesday. This is the day of Papa Dambala. Oh, hey, oh, hey. He continued his little chant until we reached the beginning of a long high fence running along next to the narrow road. Jeeva leaned down and swung a gate open. Then we walked up the path that led through the Cotswold property until we reached the house. There, sitting back between two huge trees, was the Cotswold mansion. I walked up to the front door alone. Mr. Diamond. Yes, Jeeva? Watch out for Mr. Jocelyn. He guard Cotswold. Thanks, I'll do that. What do you want? I want to see Cotswold. You do, eh? What are you doing here, little Cheever? I wait for Mr. <laughs> Found himself a new governor, what? You must be that fellow Diamond. Mm, I must be. Well, come in. Mr. Cotswold's been expecting you. He introduced himself as Jocelyn and led the way into a large panel study. And I met the big man himself, Arthur Cotswold. The drums stopped. Today is Wednesday. It belongs to the great god Dambala. Uh, so I understand. Most days of the week are significant in voodoo. Will you have a drink, Mr. Diamond? No, thank you. Jocelyn, mix me his gin and tonic. Yes, Mr. Cotswold. Thursday and Saturday belong to you, Zile Frida, the goddess of love. I'll have to remember that. I know why you are here, Mr. Diamond. I'm glad you do. For some reason, Gunther and the rest of the miserable farmers think I'm responsible for their trouble. Of course you're not. I simply tried to help them. With their cattle sick and their crops gone, I had my banker make them an offer. Have any of your cattle taken sick? None. Pretty strange. Haiti is a strange land. Now, you're not going to start talking voodoo. You're a stranger, Mr. Diamond. There are many things that you would not understand, and I would certainly not try and convert you. Well, I appreciate your interest, but I intend to find out why Gunther and his wife died. At this point, I would most certainly give you advice on. Go home, Mr. Diamond. Leave well enough alone. After I come up with an answer. Mr. Diamond, I am not a patient man. I have gone out of my way to give you some healthy advice. Heed it. For your sake, heed it. No, thanks. I'll let you know what I find out. You persist in this investigation? I always persist. In fact, I'm the persistentist. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. The things we look for most in a cigarette are mildness and flavor. You'll find both of these things in camels. Day after day and pack after pack. No other cigarette has camels rich, full flavor. The flavor of costly tobaccos, properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported... Not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own 30-day camel test. Not just a puff, not just a sniff, but normal smoking for about a month. You'll enjoy every puff, and you'll know without question how mild camels are, how well they agree with your throat. Yes, and you'll see why. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild a cigarette be. Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I left Arthur Cotswold cooling his fit with a gin and tonic, went back to Chiva and he led me back to town. On the way, I got an idea. When we arrived in town, I sent little Chiva back to the Gunther farm. Then I went in to talk to Inspector Laplanche. 
Inspector had received a wire from one Lieutenant Walt Levinson, 5th Precinct, New York Police. Well, I had no idea the New York Police were interested in this affair. They're always interested when someone drops dead. Now, here's something pretty interesting, Inspector. Hmm? Mr. Gunther died of a disease known as brucellosis, commonly known in cattle as Bang's disease. Ever heard of it? I am not a medical man, Mr. Diamond. Hmm. Well, it's undulant fever. Both Gunther and his wife probably caught it from their sick cattle. What do you intend to do? Well, I think those cattle were infected deliberately, and the cane fields burned purposely. If the cattle were infected deliberately, there must be some of the brucellosi still around, and I'm going to find it. Maybe at Mr. Cotswold's. I think you better issue a search warrant and come with me. Mr. Diamond, the middle of the road, remember? I think you'd better forget the middle of the road, Inspector. Unless you want me to get in touch with the authorities and have you held as a material witness in a murder case. I... I will issue the warrant. I kind of thought you would. I will issue it, but you certainly do not think it will be enough to get you into the Cotswold house? No, but it'll make it legal. I sent little Cheever back to collect some of his friends. They're going to help us get in that house, Inspector. I will have no part of violence. Oh, they won't even be with us. It would be easy to search the Cotswold place if Cotswold was out fighting a fire. Fire? Just a harmless fire, Inspector. But far enough away so that Cotswold will think it's his cane fields. Oh, well, then I will certainly issue the warrant, Mr. Diamond. As long as we are going to do everything open and above board, I will certainly issue it. Hmm. Welcome back to the gutter, Inspector. The view isn't much, but you can't miss where you're going. Let's go get a little Cheever. What are all those natives doing at the Gunthers? I don't know. It looks like something's wrong. We piled out of the car and pushed our way through the crowd of natives. Inside the house, we found what was wrong. Lying in the middle of the room was little Chiefa. He was almost dead when I knelt beside him. I... I... I talked to friends. They light fire for you. Thanks, Chiefa. Now... Dumbalo, where do take me? He's been stabbed. Nearly cut him in two. They got him from behind. Never would have faced him. You stay. You see, wait till I non tete your mort. See what? It is a ritual. It means taking the spirit from the head of the dead. He wants you to see it. You stay. You believe voodoo. All right, Shiva. I'll stay. Now, who did this to you? Not see. In back. Ah. <sighs> He's dead. The next few hours I'll never forget. The inspector knew what was coming and he wanted no part of it, so he waited outside. I don't know whether I can describe it, but I'll try. And even though I saw it with my own eyes, I still don't quite believe it. The natives came into the house and picked up little Cheever. They placed him on a bench and the ceremony began. Some of them had already obtained the necessary items used for weighty law and on Tati Yum Mort. They included several live pigeons, olive oil, 30 pieces of fat pine wood, a pair of chickens, some coarse cornmeal and a saddle blanket, and a large white plate. Little Cheever's body was covered by the blanket and then the pigeons were killed and cooked without seasoning. The cornmeal was roasted, then placed in the white plate. The 30 slivers of pine wood were lighted and carried by the natives like candles. Then one of the natives took the white plate with the meal in one hand and the pot with the chicken in the other and approached the fire chanting a strange dirge. I nearly ran out of the screaming Mimis. As he finished the last line of the chant, the dead body of little Chiva sat straight up with straining eyes, bowed its head, and fell back. You look a little pale, Mr. Dunn. Well, I can't understand why. Probably because my blood's hiding in my feet. What do you think of voodoo now? Well, let's forget it, shall we? I haven't got the money for a good rest home. 
Yeah. We are close to the Cotswolds. Good. Let's park it here and wait until the fire starts. The inspector and I sat in the car and waited while the moon climbed up over the clouds and the drums in the distance tangled my nerves into complete knots. After about an hour of waiting, a dull glow to the south started the expected commotion in the Cotswold household, and we climbed out of the car. Fire, Mr. Cotswold! The cane field! Fire! Hit the servants! Hit every man out there to fight that fire! It had worked. The inspector and I stayed to the shadows until the last man went running out of the house. Then we went in. We worked as fast as we could. We took the place apart. Then I must say, the timid inspector had really gotten out of the middle of the road. He tore the place apart like he'd spent most of his time on a wrecking crew. I have not found a thing. Oh, the house is clean. Uh, there's a barn. Then let's go. We went out of the house and headed for the barn about 50 yards away. The drums were louder now, and the dull glow of the fire had nearly vanished. It was obvious that the inspector and I had to work fast. He took one end of the barn and I took the other. We worked toward each other. Just about the time I was ready to give the whole thing up. Diamond! Diamond! Inspector, you find something? This, a uh, hypodermic for cattle. Oh, that's not enough. This bottle, hidden under this box? Well, it's more like it. Let's get it back to town and have it analyzed. That won't be necessary, Mr. Diamond. Cotswold. It was Cotswold. And he had three things on his side that made the situation very uncomfortable. His bodyguard, Jocelyn, and two guns. They stepped through the open door and moved up to us. I see you found my secret, Mr. Diamond. This is the stuff you've been infecting the cattle with. And this is what killed the Gunthers. That's correct. You see, you should have really taken my advice and returned to the States. You'll be held for murder, Cotswell. Who will convict me, Mr. Diamond? No evidence, no one to testify. I'm surprised at you, Inspector. I thought you had more sense. Sometimes a man finds his pride and does the best thing. You know, of course, I can't allow either of you to live. No, we had a hunch. Now, tell me something. Who killed little Cheever? He was getting to be a nuisance. I had Jocelyn here attend to the matter. Ah! What's that? Diamond. Mr. Cosby, look! Well, now, I want to tell you, I'd seen a lot that day, but that was just a little too much. The howl had come from the open door, and standing in it, framed against the yellow moon... It's him! It's the Nujima! No! No! But there he was, and he looked even bigger as he shuffled toward the two men, his arms swinging at his sides like two giant sledgehammers. He was going all the way. He hadn't just come back from the dead to sit up. He was taking a walk. Get away! Get away! You're dead! Shoot him! Shoot him! But Jocelyn was too terrified to even raise his arm. The big native reached out, grabbed him with both hands, and crushed him like an egg. For a minute, I was too stunned to move. Then when I saw Cotswold bring up his gun, I threw the bottle. It stopped him long enough for the big native to drop Jocelyn's limp body and charge in. Like an idiot, I had some stupid reason for wanting Cotswold alive, so I tried to head Cheeva off. Ever tried to stop a freight train with both hands out? He brushed me off, and I crashed into the wall just as he grabbed Cotswold. No! No! He picked him up, raised him high over his head, and threw him the length of the barn. Diamond. He's coming over here. Now, look, 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 old boy. It's, 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 it's me. It's me, Diamond. Little Cheever, please, I... Me, not little Cheever. I... What? I should have guessed. Should have guessed what? What is this? This is Big Cheever. Big Cheever? We, oui, me little Cheever's brother. Me pay back for kill little Cheever. Oh, good gosh. I never thought I... We, oui, me big Cheever. Come, I take you back to Gunther House. Little Cheever, say you good man. I be your servant. Well, if you don't mind, I just think I'll head back for the States and lie in a warm tub of mud for the next six months. I... Oh, uh, tell me something, Big Cheever. What do you want? You don't have a big brother, do you? Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette, according to a repeated nationwide survey. Doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country, have again been asked what cigarette they smoked. Again, the brand name most was Camel. 
Yes, according to this survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Friends, try camels and discover for yourself the reasons behind camels' great popularity. You'll enjoy camels' rich flavor and cool mildness pack after pack and week after week. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Friends, nothing can boost your morale like a gift, especially if you're in a hospital bed. That's why the camel people send gift cigarettes each week to hospitalized servicemen and veterans in this country and overseas. This week... Camels are on their way to Veterans Hospitals, Rutland Heights, Massachusetts, and Lyons, New Jersey, U.S. Naval Hospital, Quantico, Virginia, and to all hospitals operated by the Far East Command of the U.S. Air Force. Now until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Men, has your pipe got your tongue? Well, switch to Prince Albert, the National Joy Smoke. PA's choice tobacco is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Yes, and it's crimp cut, too, for smooth, burning, and cool smoking. Get Prince Albert, rich, flavorful, and with a delightful natural fragrance. It's America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. people smoke camels than any other cigarette. The reasons behind camels' great popularity are flavor and mildness. Smoke only camels for 30 days and see how rich and flavorful camels are pack after pack. See how mild they are, how well they get along with your throat week in and week out. Then you'll know why camels are America's most popular cigarette. Here, transcribed, is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. In my business, nearly every case I get mixed up in has some kind of an interesting angle. If it isn't some woman who spotted a neighbor floating bodies in his bathtub, or a lonely husband who got lonely because he disposed of his wife with a meat axe, then it might be a case like the one I got mixed up in last week. Mr. Richard Diamond? I agreed with him, watched him close the door and walk into my office. I looked, closed my eyes, looked again. I made up my mind I wasn't having hallucinations. He couldn't have weighed more than 140, a kindly face that supported a sad sort of a smile. He was dressed well and his actions seemed perfectly normal. But there was one little thing that bothered me. He was a good eight feet tall. You seem a little disturbed, Mr. Diamond. Oh, oh it's nothing, no, just a, just a high fever. About 110, I'd say. You've noticed something out of the ordinary? Oh, no, 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 no. I work for a carnival, Mr. Diamond. Oh? My name is Adam Rayburn. I'm billed as the thinnest man in the world. And you must come close to being the tallest. Seven feet 11 in my stocking feet. Well, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Rayburn. What can I do for you? I wish to hire you. I charge a hundred a day in expenses. Well, that's agreeable. A hundred in advance. That's just so I won't have to take time off from your trouble and sell some of my steel stock. Here's a hundred. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rayburn. You are now the proud owner of a pedigreed private detective. I suppose you'd like to know about my problem. Well, it's cheaper than letting me guess. 
There's a girl who works at the carnival. Her name is Rowena. Rowena? Professional name. You've heard of her? Oh, yeah. She's a dancer, isn't she? That's right. We've been in love for some time. Oh, she's a wonderful girl. Beautiful. All that any I watched him talk want. about her, and I swallowed a big lump in my throat. Adam Rayburn, almost eight feet tall, was reminiscing about his love with all the sincerity of a handsome Romeo. I'd seen Rowena, and I could certainly understand why the skinny guy had it bad. But being a pretty practical guy myself, Adam just didn't look like the type a girl like Rowena would go for. But I always say you never know about some things. She's in trouble, Mr. Diamond. Oh, what kind of trouble, Adam? Oh, that's why I came to you. I don't know, and, and she won't tell me. She won't let me help her. But it's obvious whatever trouble she's got in is, is more than she can handle. And you want me to find out what it is? Yes. Well, I'll do my best. Oh, thank you. It's very important to me. He told me about the carnival and where I could find Rowena. He also warned me that if Rowena found out, she would be more than mildly unhappy. He thanked me again, shook my hand, and went out of the office. I closed up, went home, and napped until six. Then I headed for the carnival. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! Step right up on the inside. It is the most amazing spectacle ever to be witnessed in this hemisphere. Lungo the Gorilla Boy captured it's in the a wild. Hi, boy. Fast, safe, sensational ride. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Ride the high, boy. Only a dime. Fast, safe, sensational ride. Carnival, colorful, gaudy, fascinating if you're five or fifty. You get initiated when you're a kid and you never forget it. The nostalgia of hot dogs and mustard, pleasant emotions kicked up when you smell the sawdust or see a little kid buy a stick full of cotton candy. And then you look up and see Rowena dancing on the small stage in front of the tent doing just enough of her bit to entice the customers and not offend the sheriff. And suddenly you realize how fast you grew up. I purchased a ticket, making sure to flash all of the hundred dollar retainer and went inside. The tent filled in a hurry, the lights went down and on came Rowena. Yeah! She did her bit, the usual routine, and got off. I waited for the tent to empty and then went back to look for the beautiful dancer. There was another small tent in the rear of the big one, and as I approached, I could hear two girls talking. Rowena, sure, I'll keep it for you. Now look, Dixie, I don't want anybody to know about it. Not anybody. He's giving you trouble, huh? Yes, he's been... What's the matter? Um. Uh, yes? Who is it? Uh, uh, Rowena. Yeah? You, um, want to see me? Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll be going. Oh, don't let me bust up anything. Uh, that's okay. I, I gotta be going anyway. This is Dixie Jones, Mr., uh... uh Diamond. How are you, Dixie? Bushed. Well, nice meeting you, Mr. Diamond. I'll talk to you later, Rowena. Mm-hmm. Cute. Mm-hmm. Now... What can I do for you, Mr. Diamond? I just saw the show. Good. I'm glad you liked it. Is that why you stopped back? Oh, I thought I'd like to meet you. It's against the rules. Whose rules? The guy who runs the carny. Not your rules? Mm, sometimes. Hmm, not this time. Well, I'll let you know as soon as I find out what's on your mind. Well, that shouldn't be too difficult. I'm the type who likes to break rules. Well, you're a little old for the usual schoolboy and too hep for a yokel. Uh, what do you do, Mr. Diamond? Well, nothing obvious, but I make a few bucks, and occasionally I use the few bucks to buy a pretty girl a drink. Just one drink, Mr. Diamond? Score for Diamond. She was interested, and I made a mental bet with myself that she'd spotted my bankroll and not my blue eyes. She excused herself and did a quick change behind the screen in the corner of the tent. She came out dressed in mink and a black number that could have snarled up traffic on any quiet intersection. She took my arm and we headed for the nearest pub, in this case, the Fallen Duck. A cozy little bistro that certainly seemed appropriately named. If a duck had wandered in, it would have 
taken a nosedive in a hurry. Man, boy, duck, or diamond, nothing could have stood for long. Mm, it's a little crowded. Oh, it's probably necessary. If all the people left at once, the walls would fall in. <laughs> Here's to, uh... To what, Mr. Diamond? Well, to you calling me Rick. I'll drink to that. Rick. <sighs> aren't, uh, aren't you a little warm? Mm-hmm. But you'll suffer a little and keep the mink on. Mm. It's a nice coat, isn't it? Mm, charming. You do all right. Diamond bracelet, the mink. I could use another drink. Oh, sure, sure. Without the water. We sat and I watched to kill a few more, and in between times she moved. The pitch was subtle and as practiced as a lion trainer with a kitten. She worked hard and I played along. It wasn't difficult. Rowena was quite a girl, and as far back as I can remember, I've liked girls, particularly the type you classify as quite a girl. About the time I was offering my fullest cooperation, we were interrupted. Hey, there's Rowena. Yeah, swell. Hmm, friends of yours? It's Dave Sylvester and his wife. He owns the carny. How are you, Rowena? Fine. Hello, Paula. Hello, Rowena. This is Mr. Diamond and Mr. and Mrs. Sylvester. Hi, how are you? Uh, can I buy you two a drink? Well, that would be... No, thanks, Dave. We were just leaving. Uh, come on, Rick. Well, nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, Mr. Diamond. Yeah. Sorry you gotta be going. Good night, Dave. Paula. Well, that answers that. Not friends. I've known Dave for a long time, way before I joined the carney. Uh, what makes you think we're not friends? Oh, just a casual observation. I got the idea when your hair stood straight up. You better take me home. And I took her home. Rowena didn't have much to say on the way. She was worried, and she dropped the pitch. We got back to the carnival about 1 a.m. and walked down the deserted boardwalk toward her trailer. Up to that point, I had made up my mind about several things concerning the lovely Rowena. First, she didn't figure to be in love with Adam Rayburn. Second, if she did have troubles, she hadn't given any indication until Dave Sylvester and his wife had shown up at the fallen duck. At her trailer, she stopped at the door and turned to face me. Oh, I could see it coming. The pitch was on again. But now, she was being cautious, too. Who are you, Rick? Me? Oh, I'm uh, just a guy. I told you, just a guy who wanted to buy you a drink. Nothing else. <laughs> what else? Worried? A little. Why pick on me? Well, honey, you go on inside and take a look at the mirror. If you're a little objective about it, you'll get the idea. Rick. Yeah? Good night. Mm, well, good night. Rick. Yeah? Will I see you again? Yeah. Why did you do it? Why did you do it? Wait a minute, Adam. Wait a minute. Let me go. Oh, take it easy. What's the matter with you? What do you want to slug me for? Uh, why did you kiss her? Why did you kiss her? Oh, for Pete's sake. I saw you. I saw you kiss her. Well, you didn't see very well then. It was the other way around. I didn't hire you to take her out and make love to her. Oh, come on, Adam. Get hold of I don't want to hear it. Oh. What's the matter? That tent. It's on fire. <laughs> I turned and looked in the direction he was pointing his skinny arm. The small tent Rowena had used for a dressing room was on fire. Fire! Fire! Some others had already noticed it, and by the time we got there, the tent was completely engulfed in the roaring flames. Every one of the troop turned out in odd stages of undress and got a bucket line going, but the tent was past saving. The fire department arrived, put out the last of it, and then one of the troop, Picking his way through the charred ruins made a grisly discovery. Hey, hey, there's a body in here. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. You know, smoking is a day-in, day-out pleasure. And it takes day-in, day-out smoking to tell you how rich-tasting and how mild a cigarette is as a steady smoke. One puff won't tell you. 
One sniff won't tell you. Smoke only camels for 30 days, and you'll see why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. You'll enjoy the first puff and every puff, for camels' costly tobaccos are properly aged and expertly blended. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor, a flavor you'll never tire of. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness, proof based on steady smoking. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own camel 30-day test and see for yourself why more people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. One thirty in the morning, standing in the middle of what was left of a gutted sideshow tent, standing with the members of the Sylvester Carnival troupe, looking down at the burned body of a girl. A case with a simple beginning, and then a fire, and a girl dying in the fire. The crowd spread out as the fire department moved in to look for a cause, and Dave Sylvester, the owner, identified the body. Ah, Dixie Jones. She slept in the tent. Poor little Dixie. Oh, hello, Mr. Diamond. Hello, Mr. Sylvester. It's a terrible thing. Yeah. Mr. Diamond? I'll beat it, Adam. I'll talk to you later. No sense in letting people know we're acquainted. All right. So all of a sudden, I smelled smoke. See, I thought that I was dreaming or something. Rick? Oh, hello, Ray. Isn't it awful? Yeah, it's pretty bad. Oh, poor Dixie. Uh, Rick? No? Uh, will you walk me back to my trailer? Sure. Cold? Yes, Act like you got a chill. You better take my coat. No, it's, it's all right. I'll, I'll be all right. Well, uh, good night, honey. Uh, Rick. Yeah? I, I don't feel much like sleeping. Why don't you come in for a while? Well, what's the matter, dear? You act as if you're scared. Of you? <laughs> well, I don't know what it is, but you're scared of it. That's ridiculous. Good night, Rick. Psst. Mr. Diamond. Well, now, don't start swinging again, Adam. I didn't even hold her hand. I just left the fire. The fire department found out it, it wasn't an accident. What? I heard the chief say the fire was started deliberately. They called the police. Well, now the simple case with a fire and what looked like an accidental death had turned into murder. I asked Adam why anyone would want to kill Dixie, the chorus girl. But he couldn't even come up with a guess. I warned him again about keeping our relationship a secret. I went out to the corner to wait for the police. In about 20 minutes, I spotted a prowl car with a familiar figure in the front seat. Rick! What are you doing here? Well, I stayed for the late show. It's a nice fire. Just got a 211 report. Some girl in the fire. Yeah. Name was Dixie Jones. Hey, Walt, look. Uh, nobody around here knows I'm a private cop. You want it kept that way? Yeah, for a while. Okay, climb on the running board. We'll drive down. We drove down to the scene of the fire, and I stayed in the car while Walt and Sylvester looked at the body of the dead chorus girl and talked to the fire chief. A couple of times, I spotted Adam standing off to one side, watching. And if he noticed me in the car, he did a good job of not showing it. Sometime later, Walt came back, and we took a drive. I told him everything up to date, how Adam had hired me to find out what was troubling his lady love, how I'd gotten the big pitch from her, her obvious dislike for the Sylvester's, and everything leading up to and after the fire. Well, that's sure not much. I know it, I know it, Walt, but there's one thing, sure. Rowena was scared stiff after the fire. Sometimes fires do that. No, it was something more, Walt. This dame lives high. Mink coats, jewelry that runs into a lot of carrots. She has a real taste for anything that smells like that green stuff. I flashed a roll when I went in to see her show. She acted like a steady date when I went back to her dressing room. Uh, Rowena doesn't make enough money at this carny to buy all those things, Walt. Well, I'm having the whole troop brought in for questioning. Maybe we'll uncover something. This client of yours... Adam Rayburn? Yeah. 
What does he know? Oh, apparently not much. He's so in love with that dame, he can't see anything else. What does he do? Well, he's advertised as the skinniest man in the world. He's nearly eight feet tall and weighs a good 140. He thinks Rowena's in love with him. Are you kidding? Rowena? A dame like that? Yeah. Poor guy. Walt dropped me off in my apartment and I got some sleep. The next morning, I went down to the precinct and listened through an open line as Walt interrogated the entire troupe of the Sylvester Carnival. It took all morning and most of the afternoon. Rowena answered her share of questions, and her voice was shaky and cautious. Adam answered his, admitting his association with me only after Walt informed him the fact was known. The last two questions were Dave and Paula Sylvester. I have no idea why anyone would want to start a fire. How about wanting to kill Dixie? I can't imagine. How about you, Mrs. Sylvester? No, Dixie was just a nice kid, slept in the tent. I don't know why anyone would want to kill her. Mr. Sylvester, how long have you known Rowena? Just since she's been with the Carney, About uh, five years, I guess. First break. First hint of a cover-up. Dave Sylvester had said he'd only known Rowena since she'd been with the carnival. I left the precinct thinking about the time I'd spent with Rowena and the fallen duck. She'd said she'd known Sylvester for a long time before she joined the carnival. I grabbed a cab and went back to the carnival grounds where I hung around until my client showed up. We found a quiet spot and talked. I know she's never said much about Dave or Paula. Oh. Well, how about the girl who was killed, uh, Dixie? Well, they were friends, that's all. Why, have you found out something? How much money have you given her, Adam? Oh, no, no, wait a minute. How much? Well, not much. Well, how much does she make? Oh, about 200 a week. Then who's buying those minks? Well, she is. And the jewelry? What do you mean? She told me she bought those things with money she'd saved. Out of 200 a week? Well, yes. And then why ask you for more? Because she needed it. I, I didn't ask her why. She, she likes nice things. We're in love, Mr. Diamond. A, a man doesn't ask... Okay, me. Adam, okay. I lost myself for the rest of the afternoon in the newspaper files, looking up past history on David Sylvester, his wife, and Rowena. There was a story about David and Paula the day they got married, and enough about Rowena to give me a pretty fair background. She'd been in show business for a long time, from parents in the business. Never done much until she joined the carnival, and then her fame spread far and wide. There were some publicity pictures that certainly showed why she had become a headliner. She'd been married once to a man named Black, who had disappeared ten years ago, a small-time agent who had left her stranded in a hotel somewhere in Ohio. And according to the article, he was wanted by the police for a forgery rap and left her holding the sack. I looked some more, but I couldn't find anything about a divorce or that Black had ever been caught. At 7 o'clock, I let myself into Rowena's trailer. I sat down and waited for her. Hello, Rowena. Rick. I'm glad to see you, Rick. Oh? Well, I'm a private cop, honey. Still glad? You're a... Private cop. Yeah. I don't understand. Well, I think I do. Whatever happened to your husband, Rowena? Oh, Rick... Whatever happened to him? Name was Black. Left you stranded in Ohio with a forger wrap pinned on him. What happened to him? Well, I don't know. He, he disappeared. I, I... How do you manage to buy minks and diamond bracelets? Rick, what is all this? Why How you... come Sylvester hired you and shoved you right to the top when you didn't even have a reputation? I don't like this, Rick. I don't think it's I any... I don't like it either. Now, tell me about Dixie. Why was she killed? I don't know. Rick, you don't think I... It's I'm... the one thing I've got to tie up. Whoever set fire to that tent, did they think it was you in there? Don't be ridiculous. Well, see how ridiculous this sounds, honey. Dave Sylvester is your missing husband. No, no. He's paying you to keep your mouth shut. Get out of here. You don't care who you pick on, do you? If you can't blackmail a guy, you work him, like Adam Raymond. Poor guy thinks you're in love with him. Get out! Get out! How much did you get? A couple of lousy dollars? Anything for a buck, huh? If you don't get out of here, I'll have you thrown out. I want to know why Dixie was killed. And, baby, you're going to tell me. <laughs> Rick, please. Oh, it won't work, honey. Now, what was the connection? Please, please. 
Baby, if you know why she was killed, that makes you an accessory before the fact. I'm not very happy about you, honey, and I'd be more than willing to do my bit to see you get a few years. Rick. <laughs> now, you better tell me all about it. It'd be a lot easier. All right. Dave, Dave Sylvester is my husband. His real name is Martin Black. You're right, I, I was blackmailing him. Somebody fired two shots through the open window and nailed her twice. I caught her, she dropped, and I lowered her to the sawdust floor. I kept my arm around her because she couldn't do much more than look up and smile a tired smile. Thanks. Thanks for the lift. Honey. It's all right. Dixie was keeping the marriage license for me, so... So Dave wouldn't find it. I guess he did anyway. He must have killed her and set fire to the tent. I'll get a doctor. No, I, I, I gotta say something, Rick. No excuses. I, I took Adam. I took everybody. Mixed up. I was, I was going to take you and something happened, I guess. Maybe... Maybe I thought you might be the boy on the white horse. Baby, look. I'm telling the truth, Rick. A lady wouldn't lie at a time like this. No, I guess she wouldn't. I put a pillow under her head and went out. The carnival had suddenly turned into a bad dream, a lot of noise and confusion. There was a killer loose, and I wanted to get him. Look out, Diamond! It was Adam Rayburn again, standing near a tent. David Sylvester had been waiting for me to come out. Sylvester jumped as Adam yelled and turned his gun on Adam. He caught Adam with the first one, and the big, thin guy toppled like an anemic sapling. I got my gun out, but Sylvester had disappeared in the darkness. Go get him. I'm all right. I circled the tent and spotted Sylvester running up the main drag. He turned and tried a quick shot. People started running when they got the idea, and I kept low, trying to stay in the clear. The place emptied faster than a ballpark in a thunderstorm, and Sylvester was caught on the empty walk. He turned for another shot, but I beat him to it. The slug knocked him sideways, and he staggered into a building, and I went in after him. It turned into the weirdest chase I'd ever gotten mixed up in. I found myself looking at a dozen Richard Diamonds and an equal number of Dave Sylvester's. I was faced by a room full of mirrors, and to top it off, a recorded laugh was playing over and over. A gimmick to show the public how much fun they could have inside. Oh, some fun. The dozen Sylvesters had all turned and taken a shot at the dozen diamonds, and the dozen diamonds suddenly became one less. It was a process of elimination. Sooner or later, one of us would stop hitting mirrors and get the real thing. I picked one of the Sylvesters, and we both went to work. Lousy mirrors. Yeah, you shot every diamond but the right one. Turn me over, will you? Get my face out of this stuff. Sure. I don't mind dying. I hate to watch myself doing it. <laughs> Dick Powell will return in just a minute. Again, doctors in all branches of medicine have been asked this question. What cigarette do you smoke, Doctor? Again, the brand name most was Camel. Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke Camels than any other cigarette. Baseball is getting underway, and it's interesting to note that Camels are the favorite cigarette of many baseball players. Bob Lemon, Vic Rashi, Howard Paulette, Dick Sisler are a few of the stars who choose Camels for their rich flavor, cool, cool mildness. Try Camels yourself. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Take the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of camels are sending gift cigarettes to our wounded and disabled servicemen. 
These cigarettes are forwarded to and distributed by the Military Air Transport Service, the United States Air Force, which evacuates virtually all overseas wounded personnel. Gift camels are also on the way to Veterans Hospitals, Fort Meade, South Dakota, and Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Campbell, Kentucky. U.S. Naval Hospital, Beaufort, South Carolina. Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen starring in RKO's Cry Danger. Tonight's adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director is Helen Mack. Featured in the cast were Arthur Q. Bryan, Michael Ann Barrett, Sandra Gould, Sheldon Leonard, Paul Duboff, and Bob Bruce. Then, for pipe pleasure, get the National Joy Smoke, Prince Albert. P.A. has a rich flavor and wonderful natural fragrance. It's crimp cut for cool, smooth smoking and specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. You'll enjoy Prince Albert, America's largest selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. to this convincing proof of camel mildness. Hundreds of men and women from coast to coast smoked only camels for 30 days. Every week, leading throat specialists made thorough examinations of their throats. The throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Start your own 30-day camel mildness test. Let your throat tell you how mild camels are day after day. Then you'll know why Camel is by far America's most popular cigarette. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Busy day for the Humane Society. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a... Hmm, music critic. Diamond Detective Agency, we solve all crimes, we frown on sin, but the weather is awful and we'd rather stay in. Who wouldn't? Oh, hi, Helen. Hi. Did you like that slogan? Yeah. It gives me an idea. I want to report a crime. Well, hide the body till tomorrow, dear. It's raining. You can lose your license with an attitude like that. Oh, baby, you certainly know where I'm ticklish. Where's the crime? You're still single. So am I. Well, in your case, that is a crime. In mine, it's just a misdemeanor. Anyway, I can't discuss an assignment I'm still working on. I'll help you solve it. I want to give myself up. Sorry, no case. Why not? I've seen you in an evening dress. Nobody could pin anything on you. Would it interest you to know the piano tuner is here and very good-looking? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, pulling wires will get you nowhere. Is my picture still on the piano? The one where I look like a tough detective? No, I threw it in the fireplace. Mm. I love to sit by the fire and dream of you. Besides... Oh, did it thunder down there? Yeah. Small world, isn't it? I've got to hang up, dear. I've got work to do. Well, come over tonight. You can try the piano and my patience. What work have you got to do? I have to fill my lighter and dry my shoes. What are you talking about? Well, I smashed my car up in a collision and had to walk to work. <laughs> work, he said, smiling through his tears. Where's your car now? In Larson's garage. You need a rich wife who can give you a chauffeur. 
Hang up, doll. You're getting too near my prize. Bye. Bye. I looked at the door, hoping a wealthy client with an easy case would walk in. When that Connecticut car with a lemon-headed driver folded my fenders an hour before, I knew I was in for a repair job that would spring my bill clip. So I called the garage to see whether I should start saving up for it or just jump out of the window. Larson's Garage. Larson? Diamond speaking. How does it look? Ah, it looks like you're going to be a pedestrian for about three weeks, Mr. Diamond. But it ain't all bad. The frame's out of line only a couple inches. Save the silver lining for the brake drums, Junior. You never call me Mr. Diamond unless there's going to be more than $100. How much, roughly? Oh, oh, I'd say 250 I said roughly, not brutally. Anyway, why are you calling me up, Diamond? Didn't your guy tell you? My guy? Yeah, the big boy you sent over to get your stuff out of the car. Wait a minute. Did he say I sent him... Hang up, Diamond. Stop talking and hang up. Uh, Have a chair, friend. Be with you in a moment. Larson, was this guy of mine a thick-set, moronic-looking oaf with a greasy hat and a broken nose? The next one is through your ears, Diamond. Hang up! I'll talk to you later, Larson. I mean, Larson. I just heard a report that requires my attention. Do you realize, friend, that you made a big hole in my wastebasket? I suppose I wanted to fill it with water to wash my hair. How could Stop. I... Stop! Where is it? I said, where is it? Talk! You told me to shut up. You can't have it both ways. Friend, I've had a bad morning. My car is smashed up, and my feet are wet, and things look bad in Egypt. As the old song says, I love a charade, but not this much. Don't play cozy. The stuff in your car. Oh. Well, now, let me think. There was a box of cleansing tissues in the glove compartment. Some golf clubs in the trunk. Probably some hairpins down behind the seat. I've told that girl a hundred times. After the wreck. After the wreck. Everybody was throwing stuff back in the car. We want the brown envelope. Brown envelope? Friend, I never saw it. No. Scout's honor. See, I'll cross my hive Keep your hands down. Sorry, Lieutenant Levinson speaking. Rick Walt, get over here right away. I'm busy. You better get over here. I've done it again. There's a dead man in my office. What? Just get over here and bring me a new wastebasket. Yeah, I know him. Paul Scannell, hoodlum, third class. Car stripper, nightclub bouncer, Central Park mugger, and manic depressive about town. Last arrest two years ago. They didn't want him for anything right now. You could have had him for assaulting wastebaskets. Who was he with? I don't know. He's been out of circulation. What makes you think he was with anybody? Plural, personal pronoun. He said, we want the envelope. You and your education. Hmm. You hadn't been a little faster than he was. You'd be getting your doctor's degree right now. Incidentally, uh, were you expecting something? Only the usual things, death and taxes. Two men with whiskers, why? Wearing your clavicle gun in the office on a character. Comfort-loving type. A shrewd observation, Walter. And it was. Normally, I'd have shucked the gun the minute I got in the office. When my car got hit, the pistol was knocked out of the clip under the dash, so I stuck at my shoulder holster. There were six police officers and 1,300 helpful citizens on the scene, and I didn't want to linger for extra questions. I told Walt about Scannell going through my car at Larson's garage. He looked thoughtful, and when Walt looks thoughtful, he's thinking. The police force could use a lot of Levinson's. Brown envelope with murder in it. Rick, there's more of this than a traffic brawl. What did you bring here from the scene? Just my wet feet and my briefcase. The one I always carry to make me look businesslike. You couldn't look businesslike if you carried a cash register. Look, let's let's reconstruct a little. Take it from the crash. Okay, okay. Slippery streets. A gray coupe with Connecticut plates came barreling through the stoplight. I tried to get over, but there was a curbstone in a 30-story office building in the way. Remind me to write my congressman about the real estate lobby. You mention my name, you'll get a nasty answer. Go on, will you? Well, uh, we smacked. You mean you didn't hear it? 
Only 24 blocks away? Oh, sure, but I thought it was just another atom bomb. Hmm. Well, four doors flew open, two on my car, two on the gray coupe, stuff all over the street. Papers, spare parts, broken glass, my bridge work, the usual debris. While the other driver and I were exchanging information on insults, a few warm-hearted bystanders, seeing there's nothing worth stealing, threw the stuff back into the cars. Mine was all the way to the garage. How about the other fellows? The other fellow was a girl. Mm -hmm. Well, you may say so, officer. Platter of goodies. Friendly, too, in a nervous sort of way. You, uh, get a name and address? Certainly. You think I'm an idiot? I, um, can't answer that without breaking up a beautiful friendship. Uh, where's the data? Uh, uh, where, where the is stuff it? is in my briefcase. Where's the briefcase? In my desk. And don't ask me where the desk is. You're sitting on it. Here. Give me. Take. What a mess. Reminds me of my wife's handbag. I wouldn't know. I've never been in your wife's handbag. Mr. Diamond, this is business. Shall we examine the contents of the briefcase? Pray do. Thank you. Item. Paperback book. A weekend painter. Planning on painting a weekend? Man's entitled to a hobby if he ever gets time for it, which he doesn't. Item. Notebook. Black. Keep out of that. Killjoy. Item. Book of matches. No printing. Item. Clip of cartridges. Item. Card notifying a dental point this morning. You couldn't make it. I have to cross that bridge work when I find it. Uh, yeah. Well, that's all there is. No brown envelope. No, I wouldn't have a brown envelope. I'd use that color. It makes me look sallow. You're yeah, not much help. Well, do something, Fatty. Something. Why don't you just send all my envelopes to the lab and get the glue analyzed? I had a horse last week to drop dead in the far turn, and I... Diamond Detective Agency, detecting done by day or night, and holidays, if the fee is right. Diamond, this is Sergeant Fraser. Lieutenant Levinson there? Uh, yeah, he's here in the briefcase for you all. Thanks. Levinson. Fraser here. No, oh, hi. That express company robbery that happened this morning, we picked up the getaway car. Thought you'd want to know right away. Yeah, thanks, Sergeant. Car abandoned? Yeah, seemed to be pretty smashed up, too. Front end all banged in. Gray coupe with Connecticut plates. Okay, hold it for a route. Wait a minute. Gray coupe could... Rick. That car you banged into this morning, Great Coop, Connecticut Plates? That's right. Why? I'll tell you in a minute. Sergeant. Yeah? Get with the traffic bureau. I want everything on a collision at Madison and 43rd. Everything, including a weather report. Rain, followed by Saturday and Sunday. And Fraser. Yes, sir. The driver of the car. Get out a warrant for Rick. What did the driver give her name as? Uh, Markham. Dora Markham, housewife. Dora Markham, Sergeant. Probably phony, but make it out anyway. I'll be back at the office soon. Rick, this accident of yours is something big. You should see my repair bill. Well, shut up and listen, will you? This is serious. Early this morning, the Huxley Express Company was robbed of $600,000. Wow. Yeah, now get this. The car you smashed into was the getaway car. Whoever this dame is who was driving, she's tied in somehow with a gang who pulled the job. Mm-hmm. Well, Fatty, this is all very enlightening, but go a little farther. Why did this Scannell guy come here looking for a brown envelope? I don't know. But I'm going back to the precinct. This is the first break we've had in this case. And you better keep your eyes open and that gun in your shoulder holster. Can't. Crushes my camels every time I stoop over. Oh, Rick, for the last time, this is no joking matter. For some reason, that gang thinks you have a brown envelope. That envelope means enough to them to kill for it. Ricky, my boy, up to now, you've been shot with luck. Don't crowd it. <laughs> Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. Here's the one sensible test of cigarette mildness. Smoke only camels for 30 days. Pack after pack, you'll enjoy the full, rich flavor that's found only in camels. And through steady smoking, the only sensible way to judge a cigarette. You'll see for yourself how mild camels are. How well camels agree with your throat. In a test supervised by noted throat specialists, hundreds of men and women from coast to coast smoked only camels for 30 days. The throat specialist made more than 2,000 careful weekly examinations of the throats of these smokers, and they reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. That's conclusive proof of camels' mildness. Start tonight to make your own camel 30-day mildness test. Make camels your steady smoke, and you'll discover just why Camel is America's most popular cigarette by billions. 
Diamond Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Up until now, as the man said, I had been shot and shot at with luck. I was in the middle of something, but didn't know what. After Levinson left, I sat and stared out the window. It didn't work any harder than that until the phone rang. Diamond Detective Agency, we try to please... Hello? Hello? Hello. Oh, well, maybe it was the wrong number. Or maybe it was somebody wanting to be sure I was here. I felt like a new clay pipe in the shooting gallery waiting for the sailors on Saturday night. It was a nice little office, but I suddenly didn't like it. I thought I'd go ask Helen about the piano sooner. I liked that idea. So I got up, packed my briefcase, shoved my stuff back in it, and as I zipped it shut, my hand felt a piece of paper stuck underneath it. It was the brown envelope. I got to work on it, and inside was a baggage check, and written on the back of it were two words. Blue duck. I was just getting... Don't bother this, darling. Just give it to me. Well, hello, Dora Markham, housewife. I'm not as stupid as Paul Spinell, Mr. Diamond. Also, I'm a better shot. Well, he wasn't too bad. Got my wastebasket right between you the... You talk too much. Get up, turn around, and take off your coat. Oh, do I have to? It's so pretty. My shirt's wrinkled on account of the rain, and take I... Take it off, or the coroner will cut it off. Oh, they should have sent you in the first place, Dora. You're much more convincing. Huh? Okay, it's off. Look, you're a, you're a housewife. There's a button loose on the left sleeve, and I... The, uh, trousers... Off. Oh, now, Dora. The door is closed, and there's a silencer on this gun. I love to silence the noisy detective who tried to move in on the off diamond. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. Gypsy Rose Diamond. A pretty girl is like a melody. How have you ever lived this long? Fresh air, hard work, and green vegetables. Let me show you my diet list. I have it right Stay now. Stay away from that desk. Now, hand me your coat and trousers. Thank you. Turn around. Walk to the wall with your hands up. Up high. Hmm. At uh, the next tone signal, Diamond, your phone is being disconnected. Oh, Dora, you're wonderful. I could go for a strong girl like you, and I would, too, if you didn't have that... Well, you could have said goodbye. Richard Diamond, detective, with no pants, a private eye welcoming his privacy. I looked for the brown envelope, gone with my wardrobe. I looked at the telephone. Alexander Graham Bell couldn't have fixed it with Don Amici handing in the pliers. I peered out into the corridor, no one in sight, not even an insurance agent or a typewriter salesman. This alone was making history. I wondered if I could trot through the streets to the 5th Precinct pretending to be a cross-country runner. Uh, no, not in blue silk shorts. I sat down and waited. And waited. And waited. I tried telepathy. Helen, I thought. Come and get me and bring me a pair of trousers. Helen, I concentrated. It's Rick. The rain must have done something to Helen's antenna, so I concentrated on Walt. Walt, I thought. And Walt walked in. Well, you're a more sensitive type than I thought, Walt. Did you bring me some trousers? Some trousers? What's coming off here? <laughs> The straight line was too easy, so I passed it up. I told Walt about Dora the housewife and the brown envelope and the baggage check inside it. Anything else? Yeah, two words written on the back of the check. said, uh, Blue Duck. About that time, Dora interrupted me with her old clothes campaign. Blue Duck? Never heard that before. Blue Duck. Well, there used to be a Blue Duck nightclub in the West 20s, a real hog wallop. 
Closed up a year ago for selling the miners. Keep talking. All right, all right. But I'll be at living in a minute. The only thing I know about it is that it was run by Sis Madsen and her husband. There's quite a joint there. Hey. Yeah? Sis Madsen. That's Dora Markham, housewife with a lemon rent and a new name. This begins to add up. That guy you killed in your office used to work for Sis Madsen. There were three people spotted in that Huxley Express robbery. Dave and two guys. Oh, could have been Sis Madsen, her husband, and Skinnell. This is very interesting. I'll tell you something else very interesting. What? I'm freezing. Or is that only interesting to me? Wait a minute. Fraser. Yes, sir. There's a cleaning and plastering shop halfway up the block. Go see if Mr. Diamond's coat and pants are there. Gray Tweed, name in the inside pocket. Get with it, son. Fitting shop, Diamond's coat and pants. Yes, sir. How did you know, Fatty? Oh, sheer genius. Besides, it's logical. I don't think she'd want to haul them all over town or be seen stuffing them into a garbage can. Why not? That's where I got them. Blue duck. Well, if you're sure, that's what you read on the back of that check. I'm sure, but it's been closed for years. Well, we're going down there and open it up. No. No what? No pants. Don't be so modest. I'm not modest. I'm cold. I'm... Stand over there. That's it. Come in. Hey, watch it, Lieutenant. It's just me. Okay, Fraser. Got Mr. Diamond's clothes? Yes, sir. I'll press nice, too. Another ten minutes, the guy would have brought him up here himself. Really? Yeah, the lady said her father was waiting for him. Her father? Walt, give me a gun. This gang will stoop to anything. Ten minutes later, we were on our way to an exit nightclub, the Blue Duck. I sat in front of Levinson's car, trying not to wrinkle my well-pressed trousers. We pulled up half a block from the one-time nightclub. Where are all the cars? I thought this would be a bigger party. Place isn't a blue duck, it's a dead duck. Uh, maybe it's a bigger party than it looks. Where are you looking? For a bright cop, Fatty, you're a little dull. But everything points to this little bistro, so we'll just. I know. Take a gander at the duck. <laughs> gander at the duck. <laughs> I heard it the first time. Yeah. Tell me, Walt, this 600000 is there a reward? A reward? Why, you. Keep your voice down, officer, while you tell me who put you on at the blue duck and Sis Matson. Who got shot at, stripped, humiliated, wrecked? Who split 50-50 with the police pension fund? Uh, you should have brought your briefcase. You are a businessman. Come on. It's duck. I don't think this joint was ever alive. Maybe they went to a movie. After all, a housewife is entitled to a little recreation, and I don't... No way. This place has been closed for years. Nobody here. We want to look around a little. There ain't nobody here, I told you. I... We'll come in anyway. Walt, get the old guy to turn on some lights. Ain't no lights. I... Must be some lights, Pop. How do you get your reading done? I spend my time minding my own business, Sonny. Not a bad idea for you either. You don't mean you think I'm Snoopy? Nothing to see here. Now get out. We're police officers, Pop. Now find the lights and stop talking so much. What do you want anyway? Lights. Didn't you hear what the man said? All right. There's the swing. Hmm. Place looks like it was never open. What'd you expect, dancing girl? You're pretty fresh, you know it. I got half a mind to run you in. Now hold it, Walt. You don't want him. You said it. Uh, who pays you, Pop? I don't know. They mail it to me. Yeah, sure. What's under those stairs? Tables and chairs. What's on the second floor? Nothing. Used to be the office. Uh, I'd like to take a look at it. Come on, Walt. Okay. Come on, Pop. I'll stay here. You'll come with us. It's bad for my heart climbing up and downstairs. You don't think maybe there's somebody in the office, do you, Pop? The place is empty, I tell you. Uh, come on. Keep up with us, Pop. Are you scared of your heart? I know. Scared of anything else? No. Well, I am. Hold it. What, Walt? I heard something. Rat. Maybe. Walt, get out. Rats, huh? Yeah, I guess that fits. Who's upstairs, Pop? I don't know. I told you. They're going to get him, whoever it is. You might as well start talking. I don't want no trouble. Now, look, you... Walt, Walt, start firing up toward that landing. Keep him busy. I'll try to get beside the staircase. Yeah. For Pete's sake, shoot high. You figure it's Sis Matson and the husband? Yeah. Now, start firing. High toward the landing. I started crawling under Walt's fire toward the stairs. I was getting so... 
First, a Sif Matson steals my pants, and now she makes me muss them up. Fifteen snail crawls later, I was beside the staircase and had a good view of the landing. I could see the man who must be Sif's husband crouch down and firing toward Walt. I raised up. Matson, drop it. Okay, pal. Good shot, Rick. Yeah, but not good enough. All right, Matson, stop shooting. Drop the gun. You've had it. And come on down here. That's a good boy. Now, where's your wife, Matson? Who? Sis. Sis Matson. I don't know who you're talking about. Your wife, Matson. Come on, don't stall. Look, you hit me. Get me to a hospital. I'm hurt bad. Did you hear him say anything, Walt? Yeah, but I can't make it out. Look, you guys, this ain't legal. You've got to get me to a doc. Might be able to understand him if he talked about sis, though. Yeah, what about it, Matson? Look, I don't know. Get me to a doc. I'll talk later. You'll talk now. you lay right there until you do. All right. Like... Car pulled up outside. See the lights through the window? Yeah. I'm quiet. Sis, get out! What? Hold it, honey. Cover, Walt. What is it? Diamond's the name, sis. So maybe you don't recognize me with my pants on. Rico. What have you done to him? Only a flesh wound, but he thinks he's bleeding to death. Ah, nice suitcase you got there, sis. And it was. When I opened it, I half expected to find a collection of men's trousers. But instead, I found stacks of my favorite color, green. You know, most ducks have only one bill. But lying on the floor of the blue duck in a suitcase were 600,000 of them. It had been a colorful day. Gray weather, brown envelopes, blue ducks, and green money. Yes? Yes, Ellen? There wasn't any piano tuning here. Oh, that's too bad. Too bad? Mm-hmm. Listen to middle C. Off a full 30 seconds. I'll call a tuner tomorrow. Well, I'll call one. I know a dandy. 73 years old. Tune pianos for Caruso. Caruso. Who? Now, easy. You'll hurt Lanza's feelings. When you are in love... It's the loveliest night of the year. Tonight? Hmm. Stars twinkle above, and you almost can touch them from here. Yeah, long arms. You're reaching. Words fall into rhyme. Anytime you are holding me near, when you are in love, it's the loveliest night of the year. Let's dance. Waltzing along in a blue, like a breeze drifting over the sand. Thrilled by the wonder of you and the wonderful touch of your hand. And my heart starts to beat like a child when a birthday is near. Oh, kiss me, my sweet. Is that an invitation? Oh, it's the loveliest night of the year. Hmm. Like it? Yeah. What are you staring at? You? Flattering to me when you show up with your clothes for welfare. I think I'll kiss you. Do you need a woman like me, Rick? There is no woman like you, Helen. I know it. But you better grab me while I'm available. Dick Powell will return in just a minute. Here's a wonderful Christmas shopping tip. Give cartons of camels as Christmas gifts. Camel makes it easy for you with a special Christmas gift carton. It's beautifully designed in holiday colors and has a built-in greeting card right on top of the carton. Be sure to give plenty of camels this Christmas. It's America's most popular cigarette by billions. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Smoke camels and see. 
Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, every week the makers of Camel cigarettes send thousands of packs of camels to military hospitals and veterans. That's to help show hospitalized men and women of the armed forces that folks at home haven't forgotten them. This week, the free packs of camels go to Veterans Hospital, Marion, Indiana, and Sheridan, Wyoming, U.S. Army Station Hospital, Camp Gordon, Georgia, and U.S. Naval Hospital Ship, Repose. Now until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen starring in the Universal International film, You Never Can Tell. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Dick Quinton, with music by Frank Worth. Our director was Nat Wolf. Virginia Gregg played the part of Helen Asher, and Alan Reed was Lieutenant Levinson. Others in the cast were Kay Stewart, Herb Butterfield, Herb Ellis, and Bob O'Connor. The fight is out and the pleasure's in when you smoke Prince Albert. It's specially treated not to bite your tongue. The fight is out and the pleasure's in. That's why pipe smokers will be delighted with Prince Albert for Christmas. The big one-pound tin of Prince Albert comes in a gaily designed holiday package that needs no wrapping. Just write your greeting on the built-in card and present Prince Albert to delighted pipe smokers. Listen next week for another exciting adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. What's America's most popular cigarette? Camel. Buy billions of cigarettes per year. Two of the important reasons why Camel is so popular are flavor and mildness. Camel's choice tobaccos are properly aged and skillfully blended to give you a smoke that's rich in flavor. And mildness? Here's conclusive proof. In a coast-to-coast test... Hundreds of men and women smoked only camels for 30 days. Leading throat specialists made careful weekly examinations of the throats of those smokers and reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Here's a suggestion. Make your own camel 30-day test. Smoke only camels for the next 30 days. You'll enjoy camels' rich, full flavor. And your throat will tell you how mild camels are. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. Here transcribed is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we deal in crime, but we're closed now. It's Christmas time. Hello there, this is Diamond. Every year about this time, my business takes a big nosedive. People usually pack up their troubles and start unpacking colored lights and Christmas tree ornaments. So tonight, I'm going to tell you my favorite Christmas story. One I always like to tell. A Christmas Carol by Mr. Charles Dickens. Now, I'd better explain something first. This version isn't exactly the way you've always heard it. Because of the particular type of characters I usually get mixed up with, this story is written to fit their talents and characteristics. Different from the Dickens' original, certainly, but we feel that this story could easily happen today, anywhere. Like right here in New York, on a little side street just off the Bowery. So now I'd like to introduce our characters. Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge, will be played by my good friend and guiding hand of the 5th Precinct Homicide Division. Lieutenant Walter Levinson. Walter? 
Otis. Hmm. The character of Jacob Marley will be played by one of Lieutenant Levinson's most trusted henchmen. Otis, that's you. Huh? Oh, uh, uh, Sergeant Otis Loveloon. Loveloon. Oh. What? <laughs> oh, <clears throat> sorry, Alan. Tiny Tim will be played by our corner newsboy. Hi, I'm Johnny Rollins. Tiny Tim's mother will be played by my red-headed gal friend. Helen Asher. The rest of the characters will be played by members of the 5th Precinct Police Station. Officer O'Reilly. Officer Leskowitz. Sergeant Miller. The music will be furnished by the 5th Precinct Police Band, directed by Patrolman Worth. Hi. And now, our version of the Christmas classic, Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a nasty old guy named Ebenezer Scrooge. He was nasty, all right. He didn't like anything, except maybe all the dough he could get his hands on. Scrooge had a little business that he started with his partner, Jacob Marley. The outfit was known as Scrooge and Marley Loan Company. But one day, poor old Marley just up and keeled over. So the boys along the big street gave him a nice funeral, and old man Scrooge took over the business. Well, Marley had been dead for seven years, and Scrooge lived alone in his little room over the office, and for a hobby, he hated everybody. He had a young guy working for him named Bob Cratchit. Bob had a wife and four kids and made just enough to make ends meet. Scrooge used to ride him all the time. When he got so cold, the polar bears complained. Cratchit would turn on the little heater, and Scrooge would say, Cratchit! What do you think you're doing? Turning on the heat, that's what I'm doing. My fingers look like popsicles. I don't care if they come in six delicious flavors. Every time you turn on that heater, it costs me money. Business is not good, so get back to your work and turn off the heat. Oh, now look, Mr. Scrooge, I'm freezing. This pan ain't guaranteed to write under ice. I'm telling you once more, get back to your work. Okay, but I don't know why you worry about business. Why not just put up a sign and turn the joint into a skating rink? Merry Christmas, Mr. Scrooge. <laughs> Oh, swell. Merry Christmas. Ah, humbug. Humbug? Yes, humbug. My old man didn't like Christmas, and that's what he used to say. Humbug. Okay, humbug. It's still Christmas, and I don't see where you get off not liking it. This is supposed to be the time everybody gets with it. Everything stops. It ain't much good, and you put your arm around the next guy, and you tell him Merry Christmas. I'm going to put my arm around you with a hammer on the end of it if you don't lay off this goodwill stuff. Look, what's with you? What have you got against Christmas? You show me a way to make a hundred bucks every Christmas, and I'll fall in love with it. You want me to be merry? Well, sure. Then go get some of those joyous clients of mine to pay off their loans. Merry Christmas. Humbug! Okay, then. Humbug. But it's still cold in here. Have some icicles, but give them back after the holidays. They're my fingers. Late that evening, Scrooge went upstairs for his room. The room where Jacob Marley used to stay. It was dark in the little hall, and when Scrooge reached for the door, he looked up at the big brass knocker and saw... Uh, holy cow. Could have sworn that was old Jake's face in the knocker. They must be working too hard. So, and he went. A little shaky after seeing Jake Marley's face, but he just passed it off his nerves. He closed the door and locked it, then got a fire going and started to relax. But every tile around the fireplace started looking like Jake Marley's face. Oh, now come on, ass old boy. You gotta get hold of yourself. This is ridiculous. I haven't touched a drop in weeks. He got up and walked around the room a few times, then went back and sat on again. He stretched, rested his head on the back of the chair. From somewhere a bell started chiming. And Scrooge sat straight up in his chair. He heard something else, too, something from downstairs. What the? Oh, now, what is that? What's going on here? Who's that? Come on, who's out there? And all of a sudden, it came right out through the wall. All right. Sit still, Scrooge. Marley. Jake Marley. Oh, no, no. I gotta stop eating lobster. Ooh, it couldn't be. What's with you? Who are you? Jake Marley. Who else? You're dead. The deadest. But nevertheless, 
Jake Marley. His ghost. Oh, you are very sharp today, Scrooge, old boy. I don't believe it. You got eyes, ain't you? Yeah, and I got a bad stomach, too. That's who you are. Nothing but a bad case of indigestion. You don't think I'm a ghost, huh? <laughs> okay. Maybe a good scare will change your mind. No! No, 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 Stay away from me. All right, all right. I, I believe you. You sold on the idea? Yeah, yeah. But, but, but why did you come to see me? Regulations. Every man's supposed to live his life and help his buddies. If he don't do it while he's alive, then he got to do it after he kicks off. Oh, cut it out! Why come to me? Because you're going to end up just like me, unless we do something in a hurry. Now, I haven't got much time, so you better listen. Oh, oh I don't want to be like you. I'll, I'll listen. Okay. You are going to have three visitors. You are going to be haunted by three spirits. Oh, no. It is the only way you can keep from being like me. When you hear the bell strike one, the first one will be here. Well, I got to be going. You won't see me again, but you remember what I told you. So long, Scrooge, old boy. Your goosebumps can relax now. Cut it out! After the ghost took off, Scrooge just refused to believe it. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Humbug. Then he climbed into the sack and was soon snoring up a storm. When Scrooge awoke, it was still dark, and the bell from the church on 53rd Street was striking 12. He lay awake listening and thinking to himself. Ah, just a dream. Ghosts. <laughs> Finally, he dropped off again and slept for about an hour. Then the bell struck one. One o'clock. I don't see no ghost. I knew it was something I ate. <sighs> All of a sudden, a big light flashed in the room, and the first of the spirits stood before him. Hi, Scrooge. Oh, Jake was right. Are you the first spirit that Jake said had come to haunt me? Yeah, you know it. Well, who are you? Me? I'm the ghost of Christmas past. Yeah? How long past? Your past. Come on, we're gonna take a little ride. Well, where are we going? Just relax. I'm running this tour. Well, let me get my pants. You got them. Oh, they're on me. With that, the ghost of Christmas past grabbed Scrooge by the hand and they both flew out of the window. Scrooge nearly lost his upper plate, but before he could yell for help, he was standing in front of a dirty, ramshackle old tenement building. You know where you are? Sure I know where I am. This is where I was brought up. Even the garbage cans are the same. You had a pretty tough time when you were a kid, didn't you? The toughest? I wasn't very big. The rest of the kids in the neighborhood were. I had more black eyes than a crow. You want to go in? What for? To see your folks. My folks died a long, long time ago. They're there now. Come on. Well, the ghost took old Scrooge into the building and showed him a Christmas. Years passed when he was a child with his family. Sure, it was tough living in two little rooms like that, but Scrooge remembered how wonderful it really was. <laughs> What's the matter, Scrooge? Huh? Oh, I've got something in my eye. You were pretty lonely when your folks... when they, uh... Yeah. You know, 
There was a young kid that came around earlier this evening and sang some carols. Gee, I wish... Yeah? What do you wish? Oh, I don't, nothing. Come on. I want to show you another Christmas. The spirit showed him another Christmas and still another. And you know, no matter how tough Scrooge remembered his childhood had been, it always seemed that Christmas was wonderful. And then before he knew it, Scrooge was back in his little room and the spirit was gone. Scrooge was pretty beat. And he climbed into bed and dropped into a heavy sleep. What's that? It's two o'clock. Hey, that light in the other room. I got burglars. Hey, Scrooge, come on in. Who's that? What are you doing in the other room? Come on in and take a look. It's pretty nifty. Hey, what is this? What have you done to the room? Looks like Macy's window. Where'd you get all the holly and the mistletoe? And how did you get in here? Do you like it? Oh, for Pete's sake, a Christmas tree. Who are you? The ghost of Christmas present. Now, don't tell me you don't like the way I fix things up. I work pretty hard. Oh, second ghost. Okay, take me wherever you want to go, but believe me, next time I try the train. Let's go. Now what do you see? I see bright colored lights, people having a lot of fun, kids on sleighs. See that building over there? The one with the big reef on the front door? Yeah, that's where Bob Cratchit lives. He works for me. Hey, look, there's Bob now. Yeah, going into the house. Up all those stairs to the fifth floor. He's got his little boy on his back. Tiny Tim. Yeah. He got polio last summer. Pretty sick with a boy. I know. Bob said he'd need a lot of care if he was ever, ever going to walk again. Come on, let's take a peek. Hi. Hello, honey. You and Tim have a good time? The best. Didn't we, Tim? Yeah, Dad. We watched all the kids in the block on their sleds. Mom, will I ever be able to ride a sled? <laughs> of course, Tim. Won't he, dear? A well, sure thing, Roughneck. Next Christmas, you'll be out there doing belly whoppers with the rest of them. Dad, what's the matter? Your eyes are all wet. Uh, nothing, Tim. I just got some snow on them. You want some chicken, Tim? No turkey? No, but lots of cranberries. Okay. Can I sit next to you, Dad? You just bet. Bob, will you say grace, dear? Can I say something first, Mom? Of course, Tim. What would you like to say? God bless us, everyone. What's the matter, school, Joe boy? Got some snow in your eyes, too? T t tell me something. Sure, if I can. What about Tiny Tim? Well, can't say for sure. If his old man makes enough money next year to get the white doctor, little Tim will get along just fine. But times are tough, aren't they, Scrooge? Yeah. Now the spirit of Christmas present took Scrooge to many places and showed him a lot of happiness and a lot of misery. And finally back to his little room, and the spirit was gone. Oh, I don't know whether I can take much more of this. Then a new ghost drifted in. This was the worst yet. He was really done up for haunting. He was all dressed in black with one arm sticking out and pointing right at poor old Scrooge. This was the last one of the spirits. Scrooge's knees sounded like castanets on a reducing machine. Okay. Okay, you don't have to tell me. You're the ghost of the Christmas that hasn't come yet. You I'm really scared of.
The ghost took off with Scrooge right after him. The city disappeared and Scrooge found himself on the outskirts of town standing in the graveyard. The night was howling like it was mad. And as Scrooge looked down, he saw... Hey, what's this? What's this stone? The black spirit stood still and pointed, so Scrooge leaned down, pulled away the bushes, and saw it was a tombstone. There's a name here. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, no. No. Look at this. Believe me, I don't want this. I, I know I've done wrong, but... I'm not kidding. I, I really know what Christmas means. It, it doesn't mean just today or tomorrow. It's every day. Every day of your life. I swear I'll do better. Oh, only take me away from this. Let me try. Let me try to make Christmas right for me and, and for everybody else. Please. Please, don't let this happen. Give me another chance. Well, don't just stand there. Put your arm back in. You'll catch cold. Well, say something. <laughs> Suddenly, Scrooge dropped to his knees and reached out for the spirit. But something happened. The spirit started to shrink. Then it collapsed. And when Scrooge looked up... What the... My bedpost. My own bedpost. I'm home. Oh, thank goodness. I lived the past, the present, and the future, and now I'm home. Hallelujah! Spirit! Wherever you are, believe me, from now on, things are going to be different. Oh, yeah. And thanks. Paper, get your morning paper, paper. Hey, boy, boy. Yeah? What day is this? It's Christmas. What's with you? Christmas. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. I haven't missed it. The spooks did it all in one night. Boy. Oh, it's you, Mr. Scrooge. How many papers you got? I don't know. Well, here's what? five bucks. Five bucks. Throw them away and then go have yourself a Merry Christmas. Gee, thanks, Mr. Scrooge. And a Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> oh, boy, say that again. Thanks. No, no, the other. Oh, you mean Merry Christmas? Yeah, that's it. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm coming. What's the matter with you? Can't you see the store's closed? Look, mister, the store's... Eb... Ebenezer Scrooge. Merry Christmas, Barney. You've been drinking? Not a drop. Well, what's the matter? Aren't you going to wish me a Merry Christmas? Oh, sure, Merry... Sure. Come on in. The wife's upstairs with her mother, but I got a bottle in the back. <laughs> Look, Barney, I know your grocery store is closed, but you could still sell me a turkey, couldn't you? What do you want a turkey for? You've been eating at the automat every Christmas for the last seven years. <laughs> it's not for me. Well, then who's the boy for? Bobby Cratchit. You know, the young guy that works for me. Oh, yeah? How much you gonna charge him? Yeah, here's 20 bucks, huh? Here's the address, and listen, don't tell Cratchit who sent the thing, okay? Yeah, okay. Merry Christmas, Marty. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Well, old Scrooge went back to his rooms and took an old blue suit out of the mothballs. He shook it out, put a few creases in it, and went out of the street. The old boy was really with it. Everybody he passed, he greeted them with... Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. He went to church and gave a large donation and Father McCarthy nearly forgot his sermon. Yes, for the first time in his life, Scrooge was having a Merry Christmas and arrived early at his office. If he could just catch Cratchit coming in late, and he did... Bob was a good 21 minutes late. Cratchit! Oh, no. You're 21 minutes late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Scrooge. I uh, had a big evening. Oh, last you night. did, huh? You know what I told you if I caught you fancy footing it in here late again. Okay, so I'm canned. You think you got it coming? Well, I'm too tired to argue. Jobs are tough enough, and I hate to lose this one, but I'm just too tired. A raise would help, huh? Well, that's the silliest question of the year. Then you got it. It's in the envelope. What? Uh huh. Maybe. After we see how the funds are, we we might be able to do something about Tiny Tim. Well, yeah. I don't get it. A raise? You want to do something about Tim? I don't get it. Sure you do, Bob. Haven't you heard? It's Christmas. Now go on home. Take the day off. Take the week off. Come back when you feel like it. Merry Christmas. Mr. Scrooge? Yeah? 
Merry Christmas. And Scrooge really did it. He was as good as his word, better even. He made it the merriest Christmas ever. And later things got better and he took care of Tiny Tim. And sure enough, Tim was out on his sled the next Christmas doing belly whoppers with the best of them. Every Christmas thereafter, all along the big street, it was said, if anyone knew how to make Christmas merry, old Ebenezer Scrooge was that one. And I hope that can really be said about all of us. Just like Tiny Tim said. God bless us. Everyone. That's it, Tim. God bless us. Everyone. Oh, Rick, that was a wonderful story. Not quite the way Dickens wrote it, but it meant the same thing. Well, thanks, Helen, dear. I thought you were good as Tiny Tim's mother, too, didn't you, Walt? I sure did, and that's no humbug. <laughs> what in the world was that? It's Sergeant Otis. Oh. He's still playing Marley. Otis! Yeah, Ebenezer? Oh, cut it out, Otis. The play's over. Go on, call officers Riley, Lund, and Miller, all of them. Tell them to leave the punch bowl and come over here. We're going to sing. Oh, boy, I'll lead off. Jingle bells, no, jingle no, bells. No, 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 Otis Rick will lead. We can join in later. Oh, Lieutenant. Come on, Rick. Otis, stop breathing down my neck. Well, I'm just waiting to come in. Otis. Oh, for heaven's sake. Snow falling down from heaven. Making a mantle of white. Sleigh bells are ringing. Wonderful Christmas night. Jingle bells, no, jingle bells. No, no, not, not yet, Otis. Oh. Voices that sing Hosanna. Bathed in a heavenly light. Everyone happy. Wonderful Christmas night. <laughs> Otis. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. Otis, stop crying. Life on earth begins again. Joy in the hearts of children. There in the trees, candlelight. All making merry. Wonderful Christmas night. Now, Lieutenant? No, Otis. Oh, let not... him sing, Walt. Come on, everybody. Oh, boy. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Right here is where all the men and women who make the camels you smoke would like to wish each and every one of you the happiest of holiday seasons. And right now might also be a good time to remind you that there's still plenty of time to add camels to your Christmas shopping list. Camels by the carton are so easy to give. Camels come in a beautifully decorated holiday package, so handsomely designed that you don't even have to wrap it. Just write your personal greetings on the card that's on the top of every special camel Christmas carton. And camels are such a pleasure to receive. It's the cigarette enjoyed most in America. The cigarette that leads all other brands in popularity by billions of cigarettes per year. So you can't go wrong by giving mild, flavorful camels. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Smoke camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with another special message. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, every week the makers of camels send thousands of packs of camels to service hospitals. That's to help show hospitalized men and women of the armed forces that those at home haven't forgotten them. This week's free camels go to Veterans Hospitals, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, and Amarillo, Texas. Nellis Air Force Hospital, Las Vegas, Nevada. U.S. Naval Hospital, Naval Medical Center, Guam, Marianas Islands. 
Now, until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Dick Powell can now be seen starring in the Universal International film You Never Can Tell. Tonight's transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Our director was Nat Wolf. Virginia Gregg played the part of Helen Asher and Alan Reed was Lieutenant Levinson. Others in the cast were Barney Phillips, Arthur Q. Bryan, Jack Crucian, Joel Samuels, and Jeffrey Silver. Are there pipe smokers on your Christmas list? There's still time to make them a present of pipeful after pipeful of the National Joy Smoke, Prince Albert. The Prince Albert one-pound tin comes in a special Christmas box ready to give. There's a space right on it for your personal greeting. Give Prince Albert. The bite is out and the pleasure's in when you smoke Prince Albert. It's specially treated not to bite your tongue. The bite is out and the pleasure's in. Listen next week for another exciting adventure of Richard Diamond, starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the FBI follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company.